kids are not cupcakes. They're not 24 done at the same time. Some people would say that kids are cupcakes. EDP. I'm not saying not any middle schooler could ever see this, but I'm saying it would be out of the scope of my educational job. I think it would be a lot more productive if we send the pamphlets home for the parents so that they can at least get an idea of like why something is being taught. And if anything, this person here is a supporter for why we need comprehensive LGBTQ teachings in schools. If we don't have it in schools, this is where your kids are going to get education from. The severing of the, uh, the family unit in terms of don't tell your parents. Don't tell your parents is like if the kid comes out as gay. It's just the idea that they might have an oppressive home life. I've never heard somebody that says you can't be racist to white people that wasn't using that as a justifier to be prejudiced towards white people. All right, yeah, let's do this Tim Pool conversation. Uh, Desmond Fabrini is somebody I used to know on TikTok, uh, and they were pretty cool. We had that conversation before, and apparently they were on a podcast. That's not that person, was it? <laughs> With Tim Pool uh, and someone else, and it looks like they're talking about LGBTQ issues. Desmond's a teacher, seems is a pretty cool person. Uh, let's see what we got. Cool. Do Today on The Culture War, we're going to be discussing education or indoctrination in schools. Okay. Are we going to, uh, is what's happening right now the appropriate degree of information being given to children, or is it inappropriate subject matter that parents should have more control of? This has been a big topic that's been happening for quite a bit. And actually, as of right now, as we're producing this show, gender studies is trending because there's news out of Florida where a university has removed the gender studies program. Now, Why? a lot of people on the left. Isn't a university like a college? Like, who cares if they want to like, let people learn what they want to learn in that case? You know? Left would say it's not indoctrination. It's appropriate education. People on the right would call it indoctrination. But I think it's fair to point out that even on our shows, we've mentioned that Whatever ideology you're bringing to your children is some form of uh, indoctrination. You, and you either want them to have your values or... Sure, but like, you know that they're, um... You know that they're using the word indoctrination to mean bad... Like, they're, like the indoctrination fundamentally is the process of teaching a person or a group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. So, like, it's not just... We don't try to... Like, ideally, we don't try to just indoctrinate people. We try to educate them properly. Um, so, like in a way where they make an informed decision on the topic, which we might be uh, having an issue with overall. But, like, they're trying to use the word indoctrination as, as a bad word in the same way. You wouldn't say, like, I'm indoctrinating my kid to be religious. No, of course not. Because uh, that would be, that would have a negative connotation that, attached to it. So, like, people mean it in a disrespectful way. Or you don't want them to have someone else's value. So this is what we're going to be talking about today and probably a whole lot more. And we got a couple of really great guests. Uh, would you like to start, Desmond? Hi, I'm Desmond Bambrini. So nice to meet everyone. I'm a learning specialist based in the Bay Area. Well, thanks for joining us. Of course. Hi, I'm Kelly Shane uh, Husky. I'm a mom. I'm an education researcher at this point, and I'm. So <laughs> what is that? I mean, not, not, I'm just curious. What is an education researcher? Does that mean that this person is just a mom that Google's? <laughs> because I'm saying that an education researcher at this point implies a very casual uh a very casual meaning to what that means so uh okay cool so glad to be here thank you for having me yeah uh thank you both for for, for joining this should be very I interesting think tim pool would have me on probably not not that i'm like super interested um but also like i'm not relevant anymore so why would they at least desmond has like a million followers on tiktok so you know that makes sense we were having a fairly decent conversation before but we, just, we wanted to hold off hold off on it on a lot of the questions right. but uh i think we could we could we'll start light and you actually had a question for me about homeschooling yeah and uh, you had mentioned kelly homeschooling so mm -hmm. let's we'll, we'll start light right guy. there and uh yeah. i don't know did you want to so ask? i gotta say so i i kind of i like to do my background research and i'm like oh tim Pool. like i understand homeschooling i thought about it you know especially if my wife and i were like oh if we moved to florida we'd want to homeschool because it's just a disaster over there like i know i keep saying it but like this idea that um it's just crazy over there it's too crazy, you know. Once, once teachers get got a, uh, they got uh, what was it called? <sighs> Investigated for um, playing a Disney movie. Now they're trying to teach the benefits of slavery, and like I understand that you know maybe there were some skills people learned, sure, but it's not to teach about strength. It's a way to downplay like slavery is really what it comes down to, and that's all it is. Um, you, because you could also learn these skills through not being a slave. I don't know if you guys really knew that. Um, and it just feels like a repackaging of like how bad slavery used to be in this political climate. You know, I don't think that there's anything productive out of the conversation. Like, oh, well, slaves built, they learned some stuff from being slaves. Like, that's a, why, like, what's the productive conversation we feel like we're having here? It just seems like a, a justifier to be a silly goose. <clears throat> 
homeschool. There's a little bit of homeschooling here. I heard that word. And it may surprise people that I actually was homeschooled from sixth grade oh, to eighth grade. Great. And definitely a tribute. There was six other kids that were kind of in that homeschool program. The only bad thing, well, the really bad thing about homeschooling is that you don't get as much social interaction as you would going to an actual school. And then you become kind of like a... I don't know. It's just I feel like you're a little socially uh, it, you've struggled socializing. So if I ever did do the homeschool, they have like homeschool um, where like a whole a whole bunch of people get together and homeschool their kids with like one with like one. Um, what is it called <laughs> with one parent? So and I think I attribute I'd say most of my academic success because I was able to get that small, intensive kind of environment. Um, but it doesn't seem to work for absolutely everyone. And then on the other hand, it works for a lot of people. So I want to know your experience and your experience and what the benefits are and then also what the drawbacks are. And if you ever worry about things like socialization and things like that, I would love to get your perspective. Well, so let me let me start by asking both of you just one simple question. Where are you from? Bay Area, California. So I always say like, oh, you know, like the Golden Gate Bridge and how it goes into San Francisco. Ever wonder what's on the other side? Me. And that's where I'm from. <laughs> and Kelly, where are you from? I'm not far. The central coast of California. Yeah. Oh, OK. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Because I was the first thing I was thinking, I was like, I wonder if region has something to do with perspectives on education. But yeah. you guys are actually fairly close. Fairly to close to one another. Yeah. So, uh, I have a rather strange and unique educational background. My mom started homeschooling me and my siblings the moment, like, I don't even know if it's fair to say from one, I think zero is probably, to a certain degree, every parent is teaching their kids something, but yeah. my mom actually started having us do math and reading, and I was playing chess when I was like three. That doesn't mean a whole lot for a three-year-old, but it means they were showing me the chessboard, explaining the moves, and having me try and telling me what was, right, what was wrong. Sure. By the time I started kindergarten. I mean, they were, they were engaging your mind in a critical way. Yeah, my mom did like similar shit too. Um, Garden, I already knew multiplication and division and a bunch of basic math stuff, negatives. Uh, always understood the concept of negatives and, you know, you know, very simple, you know, grade school stuff. But for, for you know, five-year-old entering kindergarten, leaps and bounds above the kids around me. And, and they used to, we used to play this game in first grade called Around the World. Okay. They, you, you get it from your desk. You stand behind the person next okay. to you. And then the teacher pulls up a flashcard. And whoever says the answer first advances. If the person standing... It loses. They take that seat and that person stands up. And if you make it all the way around the world, you get a ticket. You get 10 tickets. You win a prize or whatever. Me and my brother never lost. Crushed. Love that. <laughs> ne never, ne just never lost. And eventually got to the point where they asked us to stop playing. Stop. Damn. So uh, I went to Catholic school Sounds racist. from kindergarten until fifth grade. Went to public school from sixth grade to eighth grade. Spent, I think, three months in public high school. And that's where my grades went from very good to complete and total failure, straight F's, except for music class, which didn't really have a grading curve anyway. And then that's when I stopped and did a correspondence school. And that was, that was the end of it. So it's, it's a So was he just not good at formal, like maybe he just wasn't, uh, I guess maybe just the way that he needed to learn wasn't really congruent with the way that they were teaching. I, I guess, I guess that's what we're here and there. Okay. Interesting. Mix of homeschooling and public schooling. And there's a big, uh, one, one of the big issues that everyone's talking about right now. And, and one thing we advocate for is more homeschooling and pod schooling. Because I think the public schools are failing in a million different ways. I mean, I don't think that they're failing. <laughs> uh, why, why are they failing? I think that everything could be better, of course. But say that they're failing. And then wouldn't that be a tax thing? Wouldn't you want to have a more robust taxes? I guess people would be worried that it goes to the right spot. But. Very interesting. So just a little bit about me is that actually, so one thing that I do is actually somewhat of a pod program. So I, I you know, went to Dartmouth, was a double major in gender studies and government, um, but went on to get my master's of science from Johns Hopkins and then moved on to start kind of my own education clinic. And one of our services is that we have like a pod. So as in we take students that have learning differences, learning disabilities, whatever you would want to call it, but it's a small pod, um, you know, two other learning specialists and we kind of rotate those kids. There's like three or four of them. And you'd be amazed at like what these kids that were three or four years behind could be caught up fairly quickly if they're given yeah, the right sure. environment and the right kind of focus on academic achievement. Sure, I'd say like overcrowding in schools can be one way that can like negatively impact uh, a kid, you know, not getting enough attention because different people have le different learning protocols. You know, some people need more hands on training or more visible vis uh, visual training. You know, I'd say that the schools in general, at least like high schools and middle schools and stuff, teach, so part of the teaching isn't just to teach you the curriculum. It feels like part of it is to also teach you how to be a good worker. You know, do this the way that we tell you to do it and, you know, um, not necessarily stimulate your, your mind in, in a particularly robust way um, <clears throat> seems like part of it. Oh, fuck my balls. It's really insane what can be accomplished. Was your, was your educational experience traditional or how would you describe it? I grew up in public school. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in English. And oh, for me, so I, was, <laughs> I was happy and content with the public school system. And it was personal experience that led us to homeschool, really. And uh, it was something, you know, my perspective of homeschooling was very narrow growing up. And from this experience, I've learned that homeschooling can actually be quite incredible. Sure. Yeah. It has brought uh, a lot of joy to our family and particularly cool. an incredible love of learning. Me personally, I don't know if I'm going to want to be around my kid that much, you know. 
you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to love my kid, but, like, I mean, damn, imagine just always being around that motherfucker. Oh, Jesus. Sometimes you need a goddamn break. I'm just saying, man. Plus, you don't want your kids to get too clingy. I feel like there's that social aspect, too. Because, like, if you, you know, let's say I was a mama's boy, bro. And so, like, I, I imagine if I was homeschooled by my mom, too, I mean, I would have just been my mom 24-7. Like, I, I feel like there would be, you might develop, like, a particular dependency almost. Um, so, I feel like there's a couple, there's different social aspects that are, I would personally be uh, hesitant of, you know. And also, again, you can use a break from your kids sometimes. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with saying that. It's fine. We're all going to, you know, we're all going to live. So, you know, whatever. Learning, which... It's been What's great on, to see. I think I think pod learning is, is probably the way to go. And I'll just give you my opinion right away. I despise the education system in this country. Why? I'm not sure Why? if that means anything. Like it's probably the same in most learning. countries, but I, it's 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 industrialized. It's mechanized. The bell ringing. It, it doesn't it doesn't help the oh, average it's just kid. A small group of kids. I, I I grew up witnessing yeah. kids of tremendous talent. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Pod learning does it seems makes sense. Be left behind. Kids of uh, of who who needed that extra push, not getting it. Yeah, I, the problem is, is that I remember this was years ago, but when there was a big push to do a Head Start program, um, conservatives turned it down. Head Start program was basically like so, basically a form of like universal preschool and conservatives turned it down because it cost too much money, even though it was showing that there were less people going to jail, more people going to college, kids doing better in general in life. Um, and they they still they shut it down because, you know, of course, I think it was like a billion dollars and we don't have that. You know, we don't have it unless it's 800 of that to um do war so. and i just said this one size fits all mechanization in schools is is, is is a failure doesn't work i only could stay there for two years because literally on the first day right they're talking about doing reading intervention and i go okay so you got different levels you got some kids that come in knowing addition subtraction multiplication you got some kids that have never seen letters before yeah and they go okay well you you know you assess the kids and i'm like okay that makes sense you see who's the low group got it you see who the high group is and you see the medium group and i'm like okay that makes sense and they go okay so the low group gets seen like you know five times a week medium group gets seen three times high group gets seen twice and i'm like wait that doesn't but then the high group isn't gonna get better right. and they're like but that but they're like but it's about making everyone the same and i'm like well i mean really what it comes down to is it's about we have a certain number of resources available and we're trying to get people caught up into a particular spot it makes sense when you think about it from like a limited resource perspective but then it all like it could have the negative impact of not continuously engaging those young minds that are doing really well um, so that they could be like the best that they can be, be you know, uh, so that would be the problem with that. But that is extremely counterintuitive. This was the, communism. the first day, the <laughs> first day communism. of being a kindergarten teacher. And I have nothing to say it's, poorly against my, it's like literally capitalism. It's resource <gasps> management. I don't know what you're talking about at all, but okay. First school that I taught at love you very much, even though they don't even exist anymore. But there was something inherently wrong, which is why I couldn't stay in the public system because I'm like, I, I, you're telling me to do something that is designed to make everyone average. And I guarantee you, even the low kids, there's something not average. Yeah, it's really not designed to make people average. It's, I, I just, it's, it's because they only have so many resources going to different places. Like that's all it comes down to. Or the school's being greedy and wants to keep as many resources as possible. But that's really all it is. Average about them. But you're literally giving me a reading instruction schedule that says by the end of the year you want. Also, you could argue that kids that are doing well can also don't need extra help, and so you can give them like this like the same curriculum, and they won't necessarily you know need as much. Um, well, help or, or as much hands-on training. What the fuck? But everyone at a level D. Some kids are wow. a level D already, and some kids aren't even a level double A, and you want everyone to be the same. That's, yeah. That seems counterintuitive to me. When, when I was in grade school, I think it was eighth grade, they did this new program where they uh, half the class was eighth grade, half the class was seventh grade. The teacher taught the seventh graders, and the eighth graders were left to their own devices. Interesting. And they said it was a good thing for oh, us. Oh, wow. And, you what? know, I got to admit, to a certain degree, fine. Get the yeah. Is that real? That doesn't even make sense to me. I'm, I feel like that's not real. But like, it's off our back. They'd right. say, here's your assignment. Have a nice day. Interesting. But, I mean, we're, we're 12 year, years yeah. old. We may be smarter on average or whatever. We're like, you know, the 20 kids who are higher, you know, achieving. Right. But that doesn't mean you don't give guidance yeah. to these kids as adults. So, yeah, I find that, I find that uh, really interesting. Uh, oh, okay. I, my experience with public schools was nasty teachers who didn't care. Tenured or whatever you call it, they couldn't be fired. They'd been there for decades. <laughs> they were nasty. They were mean. The kids hated school. And it's it's a it's a damn shame that there is such a phrase, school sucks, Thank that you. kids are saying. Okay, right. There's an inherent issue with that, right? There is an inherent issue with that idea of school being inherently thought of as bad as opposed to something that could be thought of as good, right? Now, the question, of course, remains is that does homeschooling really fix the problem or is that simply like... A band -aid. It could fix the problem in the context of like less people in the school, which would potentially, if enough people homeschool, would be uh, 
less uh, fewer people in the classroom, so there'd be more attention per student, I guess. But no, I don't necessarily think it fixes the problem on the situation, right? Because it's simply, or it's not even, band-aid would be the wrong word, right? It's simply not partaking in the system that yeah. we know to be broken, right? Because, you know, I was talking to different people. <laughs> the only hands-on training I needed was health class. Oh, yeah, I feel that. I feel that. I need my favorite teacher to help me out. But whether it be even on your team, right? And it's the idea of, oh, well, you know, my kid is like having trouble in like math. And da, da, da. Kids are not cupcakes. They're not 24 done at the same time. They're not. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Some people would say that kids are cupcakes. Some people like EDP. I don't know. That's all I'm saying. So... <laughs> right? Like, I always say that, right? Also, I like to make cupcakes. But it's like, but it's just simply pulling them out of the oven and kind of doing it, you know, easy bake oven status, doing it single one-on-one. -on -one. Is that really, like, do you worry about socialization at all? I'm curious. Because we got to well, find something to disagree with. Because otherwise, we can't, we can't <laughs> well, disagree with them. I, no. I got these books in it. Oh, God, here we go. I think that kids talk about school because they're lazy and don't want to go. Maybe. But also, school is, like, literally meant to babysit you. It's, like, eight hours for what? Um, it's kind of like obnoxious. I feel like there probably could be a better school experience. And then there is, though, there is probably an aspect where people, kids are going to be rebellious regardless. Like, that's definitely true, though. Be when I when I first started this journey, I was starting to see serious concerns with the public school system our children were in that I'd grown up in. And after that, I was also seeing more homeschooling families flourishing mm -hmm. and doing really, really well. Our kids were noticing that, and I was noticing these homeschool groups were getting to go on more field trips, be exposed to more experiences, and our kids were actually asking me to homeschool, and I was the resistant one in the family. Interesting. Because yeah. my perspective before was a very narrow perspective of what homeschooling was. <laughs> in elementary school, there was a teach old teacher who would always say that they hated you all and wanted to die. That's wild. And I've learned, you know, it's there's, I think, there's a great way to do homeschooling. And I think the perspective out there in society is one and it's narrow. And so for our experience, you know, we started homeschooling the fall of 2019, then COVID came. Mm -hmm. And so that impacted a lot of, back, you know, not back. just public school, but homeschoolers. We were socializing so much before that. And I think afterwards, um, we watched some people move out of state, a lot of people actually. And then hmm. we eventually what I did is I started a community group with a friend and we worked to build this group of kind of a non-co-op co-op so that we would have all those additional social experiences added in. So we've planned all kinds of field trips and activities and, and working on lectures um, with various leaders talking to the kids. And so anyways, I think like anything, it's an investment. It's what you make of it. And that goes for whether, you know, any type of education with our kids. Well, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Right. With COVID, mm -hmm. you ended up seeing this Zoom schooling, which resulted in many circumstances where parents started hearing what teachers were telling their kids, which sparked a lot of controversy. Absolutely. In some circumstances, okay. you actually had teachers saying, we can't let parents find out what we're telling their kids. Please don't tell them. What? <laughs> I feel like this is not something that's happening in any robust way. I mean, I'm sure that it has happened, but I feel like that's not something that's always happening. It's the first I'm hearing of it, but okay, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I, I, you don't have to say we. I mean, like, do, well, as a teacher, I'd like to identify, but oh, I right, think right, we're right. better than that. But oh, there, gosh. There, there, oh, there, were, there were a few circumstances, yeah. and this had a lot yeah, to do with it's probably not something that's widespread. It's probably something that's isolated. Um, and sensationalized from the conservative perspective around like LGBTQ shit too. Critical race theory yep. and gender theory, gender ideology and gender right. theory. Okay. This was a component in what we saw happen in Loudoun County, which that's I, I think right. you guys are familiar. That's, that's yeah. actually just across just the street. We heard, yeah. yeah 20, you get in the car, you drive for 30 seconds, you're in Loudoun County. Right. Uh, you drive to the school, that's like 20 minutes. But this resulted in parents getting really, really angry. Now the Loudoun County situation was actually an assault, which sparked a huge bit of controversy. Mm -hmm. The parents saying, what's going on in our schools? Mm -hmm. What are our kids being an taught? Assault. And then you end up with these teachers showing up to these school board meetings saying, what is this book that is teaching kids to separate based on race or to to uh, adopt these racial ideologies oh, or, or gender-based ideologies. And they got labeled terrorists mm. by the FBI. So this is what... I feel like we're missing a lot of context on that. I also feel like he talked with Destiny about this and Destiny like shut him down. I'm pretty sure the book was like accidentally in the library or something. But okay. It was a large catalyst for what we saw in Florida with uh, the parental <laughs> rights and education bill, as it was formally named, and what we see now with the major push for pod learning and homeschooling. Mm -hmm. This is just so vague. Like, I, what is he referring to? What do I look up? Um, <clears throat> McCarthy's false claim that Garland called parents terrorists. Okay, so apparently it's not even true that they were called terrorists. <laughs> um, their tests, people are calling them terrorists. Okay, apparently nobody called them terrorists. Uh, <laughs> like, some McCarthy misquoted something. Okay, so that's not true. Um... Okay. 
Uh, <clears throat> this all started September 9th. Letter from the National School Board Association that asked Biden for federal resources to help monitor threats of violence and acts of intimidation against public school members and other school officials. As these acts of uh, malice, violence, and threats against public school officials have increased, the classification of these heinous actions could be equivalent to the form of domestic terrorism and hate crimes. Uh, so it's not calling anybody a terrorist. Uh, it's just saying that we need to make protection. I mean, I don't know why I would expect anything particularly um, honest from Tim Pool. It's very sensationalized. Oh my God, this is happening kind of shit. Like, but okay. <clears throat> that there is something going on in these schools that is presenting children with inappropriate material like what? or outright what uh, like i know that there were instances where like some like a one book got through it was a book that was supposed to be for 18 year olds and it was like an independent issue it wasn't something that was like widespread um so i get that but it, this wasn't something that's been like happening in any robust scenario like it's not something that's been like happening in any like particularly like crazy way. It's part of like trans panic. I'm not like we should definitely make sure that there's no inappropriate material in schools. Like of course, but it's not. It's not really happening in any robust capacity. You know, the one or two schools where this might be happening is not indicative of every single situation. Did I win or kill? Oh come on. Indoctrination into uh, uh, non-traditional ideologies. I'll, I'll be very light with it. Now, the position I typically take, to, okay. you know, a lot of people say no indoctrination in schools, and I say no, no, no. We want indoctrination in schools. We just want American indoctrination. You don't want indoctrination in schools. Indoctrination is like non-critical thought. You you want people to be critically thinking. You want to give people the tools that they need to think critically. So, what you're saying, I would argue, is not right. We want the Constitution. We want traditional uh, values. Not overtly, I'm saying more like they're innocent until proven guilty, free speech, these things. And now we have this clash of two different moral frameworks, two different worldviews, where you end up with books like we have a couple books in front of us. This book is gay as well as genderqueer. And uh, these end up, these find their ways into uh, middle schools. Recently, there was a teacher who was giving this book is gay to 10 and 12 year olds, which resulted in the police being called. OK, so first of all, that finding its way into a school because a potential individual bad actor is not the same as it going into school as part of the curriculum, right? It's just like one teacher, like one annoying teacher. And I don't even know what's in the book. I don't know if it is or isn't appropriate for kids. But just like, it's just the, the language. It makes it seem like there's this like threat, like, oh my God, we have this huge thing where there's so many people inviting these, these wild books into schools. Like, okay, a book got into a school because of a teacher, because of an individual actor. And teacher, I don't know why the police got called, but like, okay, it sounds like it was dealt with. So uh, I'll, I'll kick it off there, and I, I don't know if one of you wants to start with your views on what's happening with the with bo these books being brought in these schools, okay, and the ideologies being presented to children. I'll start out. So first of all, I have one question for you to maybe like address after, right? Which is the idea of do you ever get worried about a lack of diversity for your students, and uh, like in a kind of pod, right? The idea of you have a pod, you're doing the field trips, that's amazing. You have a parent group, but that's if you fair. get into Monterey or if you get into, for example, Marin County, I was the only black kid in my friggin' entire middle school, right? Mm -hmm. Do you get uh, is there a kind of drawback to not having people that look, sound, and act different? That's fair. I went to a very diverse school. It was like 30% white. So, you know, I, was, I think it had a benefit, a positive like benefit. You know, like I, I really didn't, I mean, honestly, I didn't really see or think about race until maybe like 2016 when like racial shit started to, to come up and we started talking about systemic racism and stuff and, you know, uh, it's good and bad aspects to that. You know, but I, I would say mostly good, really. I don't know why I say good and bad. You know, some people take it too far, but like it's a good thing to acknowledge that. But I was like, comf I'm comfortable around like, you know, people like whatever, BIPOC individuals, black people, you know, that black people love me. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know why I'm, I'm a fucking idiot. But yeah, like I, there's definitely a, a positive aspect of that. Right. And how do you weigh that? Right. And then we got this book. I don't even know if I can grab it past the microphone. Let's see. Oh, there we go. <laughs> right. This one. Okay, I have read this book. I like this book. It was actually sent to me. I didn't. What's interesting is it says this book is gay. It has the gay pride flag and like the Black Lives Matter. Like there's representative colors in there and stuff. What's weird is there is a school by me um, that like a teacher left because they were basically they're trying to stop people from being able to put the flag up. They're like, you can't put the one up with the Black Lives Matter part on it. You can only put the one up with the other. It was just weird. People care caring too much about shit. Buy it. Which is actually very interesting because here's the whole indoctrination, the idea of like, oh, you know, like LGBT, we're going to come for the kids and we're going to make them gay. I never bought this. A company, which I can't say which company, saw my TikToks and are like, we love what you're doing. We want to send you some books that your students would love. And they sent me this one. And I read this. 
my students, most of them cannot read this yet. <laughs> they cannot, absolutely not. I think the book is great. I think it's absolutely spectacular that we get okay. a queer perspective um, that we usually don't get, especially in kind of the mandated sex education, what do we call it, life skills now. But there is some graphic content in here that I I would I could not as a teacher give to a student. How how old are your students? Uh, real talk, actually, my students go from kindergarten all the way to twelve because I have my master's in education, uh, special education focus, so I can actually teach kind of anywhere on that spectrum. Most of them kind of fall into late middle school or middle school. Well, if, if they go from K to twelve, then some of the older kids could probably read it. I wonder what it is. Like, I wonder what the graphic aspect is to it because there was one like LGBTQ book. And like it was basically like just having a conversation about like uh, sex, sex, like in a in a educational way, but it was like too graphic. Like it, it was, I was like, why? Like it was so unnecessarily graphic, you know. And so I think part of this too is that people, some people are just not sensitive enough to like with the material that maybe younger people should be consuming, even if it's not meant to be bad. But you know, you have a book and it's like, oh, here's some visual depictions of somebody, you know, doing a thing. And it's like, it's purely for educational resources, but it's like, okay, maybe, you know, you don't need to see that thing. <laughs> maybe it doesn't need to be that intense. And then it's like, okay, is that supposed to be like, it's not them being like um, bad in some capacity. It's just them not being sensitive enough to what people should be seeing. And part of that might be because like kids are looking at porn. Like, let's be honest. I was looking at porn like 12. We all were. And so maybe some people are just like, oh, it's not a big deal. I still think that it's not, you know, good to be super visual, <laughs> you know? Um, but <laughs> that's, that's probably part of it too, more than anything else. Um, it's just that people are, like uh, will instantly operate with like like a, a predatory narrative for everybody else. So, like all oh, these people are so bad, blah blah blah. You know. And I I, I can't give this. I'm not. And uh, side note, I'm not saying not any middle schooler could ever see this, but I'm saying it would be out of the scope of my educational job to hand this to a student without consulting parents and kind of taking into consideration That's individuality fair. and where the student is. Now, do I think that? A police officer needs to be called. Is the teacher committing malpractice? Not for me to decide. I'm not the judicial branch of government, right? I'm saying I wouldn't partake in it, but I would love to hear your thoughts and how maybe one of your students may never actually run into a book like this ever. And if you're okay with that, I would say, um, so just background, like 2015 is when the Cal Desmond definitely has like a positive impact on the conversation because they're very bubbly. And I think it ends up helping him. He's a very, like, very likable person. So California Healthy Youth Act was proposed in California. That was to, you know, basically bring in comprehensive sexuality education to the state would be required once in middle school, once in high school, with each district being able to add on grades K through 12 to their decision. Um, and so for me, I I started learning about this actually December 2018. Uh, this this oh, had wow. already been implemented. Books like this or? Well, comprehensive sexuality education itself has, has a, a framework to this. But then in addition to that, there's supplemental curricula that they were using first to abide by in 2018, the California Healthy Youth Act law, which it became law in 2016. And, and the content does, in a way, relate to the literature just because of the fact that it brought in an update to the, the health framework in California. And okay. so through the health framework, there was a variety of books being introduced to align with CSE. And some of those books are are what I started looking into. And I'm, I'm going through and parents are sharing things on social media. And I had never seen some of these books. So looking through them, then I had to go for myself to the library to see these books for myself, read through the health framework. But one of the most, I would say, explicit books that I saw was called SEX, The All You Need to Know Guide to Get You Through Your Teens and Twenties by Heather Karina. And so... Oh, I mean, on his face, it sounds fun. Teens and twenties kind of makes me think like probably like 18 where he's 16 and up. Like, I think that's fun. Okay. I remember a parent posting about this and thinking this can't be real Why? <laughs> because it was recommended originally in the health framework draft as a, a school wide read for grades nine through 12. Now the health framework, it's important that is not required. So like 14 and up. Okay. I mean, maybe I would say 16 and up, but like, what's this, uh, what does she say? Sex. Um, but teachers can you know, use that material to their discretion, usually with accordance to their curriculum director at school. So at any rate, that book started discussing topics like uh, like blood play or. Um, uh, oh, well, that's not that's that's if that is actually true, like that's way too much. You don't have to talk about kinks to kids or even if they're like young adults, like there doesn't need to be a kink book um, as a teen or emerging adult. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely too much. OK or deeper manual sex and these various topics. And then it said, what is it? 
And then how do I do it? And there was a long description. Like I understand conversations around like masturbation and like safe sex practices and different things like that. Um, you know, I get that, but I mean, fucking kinks is just weird that you would, you would go that far. Um, but okay. And sometimes it referenced the slang terms of the sex act. And okay. then at the very bottom, there was this small section that said the risks, but it was so small. Yeah. And this is in grade school. This was or originally recommended as a school wide read for grades nine through 12. So high school. And they did take it out of the health framework. And as I was learning, I initially What's thought, okay, this is not going to be allowed in schools because Bro, they took the it out of the health framework, but it, it has been used in some schools. And, and the thing for me was that book. I mean, there was stuff in there I hadn't heard of. <laughs> and I, I'm not kidding. Valid. Um, and I just feel like there, there's Bro, such a window sucks. of time of childhood um, where, I mean, I just didn't, some of these these books and the graphic visuals. I just well, personally I, don't think it's necessary. My view on all this, sure, I, I pulled it I up, SEX, second education. It says on Amazon, reading age 12 years and up, grade level seven and up. And the fir first component to this is whether or not parents have the right to decide what their children are being exposed to and when. And there's been an, an interesting amount of pushback from traditional mm -hmm. liberals and more left ideological individuals saying, mm -hmm. no, they're our children and we're the experts, so we decide. Mm -hmm. And w one of the uh, principal components of the parental rights- Fundamentally, like, yes, I agree. Like. It's it depends like I I think that there are some aspects that have to be taken out of the parents hands specifically teaching about safe sex and um, that's and like consent and things around that that matrix and, and whatnot and like proper education on sexual like diseases and stuff like that in schools like yes a parent shouldn't be able to say you can't tell my my 13 year old about safe sex practices because like I think it's silly you should teach young people comprehensive sexual health education part of that education is telling them that they can say no part of that education is teaching them to wear condoms because of whether you like it or not they're probably gonna have sex anyway because kids Kids are going to do weird shit. Like, they're going to, you know, they, um, that's when, like, puberty's hitting. When I was 12, I was fucking crazy, you know? Um, and so it's good to teach them that they can, like, different things about consent, saying no. It's good to teach people about uh, honoring those consensual boundaries. It's good to teach people about, about masturbation so that they can relieve themselves when they need to. Those are things. When it, when it comes to kinks and shit, like, that's obviously fucking weird, you know? And it's all just in an educational perspective. So, education bill in Florida was specifically yeah, that parents better. must be informed about what's going on with their kid, what their what their children are learning. And then the uh, political debate turned into don't say gay. Well, that's not what was actually happening, though, right? Like what the bill in Florida wasn't really just about, oh, tell your, the parents what you're talking about. It was more than that. It was the parents can sue the school if they don't like something. And what ends up happening there is if you can just sue unconditionally, it's a massive tax resource because now they have the school has to defend themselves and they have to waste resources defending themselves on everything that the teacher parent wants to sue. On to the point where schools are going to gravitate away from teaching things that probably need to be taught just because a conservative parent might have a meltdown about something getting taught. That's really what what it really centralizes around. Um, and I know, like, it's just it's not it's not accurately representative of the actual problem. The way that Tim Pool is, is is saying it, like, I have no problem. But I think that the parents should know what their their kids are getting taught. But that doesn't mean that the parents should be able to like actually file for litigation against the school, which would be a massive stressor on the school's resources. And you're already complaining that school size, like classroom sizes, are too big, uh, and that kids aren't getting enough attention. And it's like, well, one of those that's not going to make it any better. When they have to have an entire aspect of their budget devoted to like you know frivolous bullshit lawsuits from somebody who's crying. I mean, again, in Florida, there was a, a teacher who played a Disney movie with a gay character in it, and she had to get fucking investigated. That is a waste of our our time, energy, effort, money, and those resources could be going to the kids. So when he represents it, he makes it seem like there nobody had like a actual real like legitimate issue with it, but there was like legitimate issues to have with it. So he's just being a silly goose. <clears throat> Despite the fact that Bill Barr is people from talking about straight and heterosexual couples as well. Which is fascinating. So sorry to interrupt, by the way. But it's fascinating, though. So let's like, we might as well like really dive into it, though. Then why, why is like LGBTQIA simply the target of like the accusations of indoctrination? That's what I want to know, right? Because real talk, if you're like an OG queer, right? No one wants, we're not trying to make kids gay. We don't need more kids to be trans. Like, one thing that I always try to do is I try to reframe, right? Like reframe sure. means that idea of like looking at somebody else's perspective, right? So I look at the other side's perspective. 
parent worried explicit sexual content you may be wanting to alter my child's sexuality you may be trying to make them kind of go through uh you know a kind of hormone replacement therapy that may not be safe or not entirely proven I i'm worried about it therefore i'm gonna pull my kid i see i see that perspective sure, I, I don't necessarily that. agree with it but i see it i want to know what the opposing perspective is like what would lgbtqia the trans community gay individuals what do we get out of getting kids I actually, to be gay or this material yeah. like i don't know like i, I get the accusation i i've i've he i've heard people are like oh well gay people can't procreate so they're trying to make more kids gay that's the conspiracy theory and my thing is then where the fuck did all the gay kids come from in the first place why do we have all these gay adults if it if it if there was it, it used to used to get like hurt if you would talk about gay shit there used to be like anti-homosexual or anti-gay uh, propaganda saying that they're all pedophiles like so if your argument is that like oh like well, they that's they have to indoctrinate the kids or where are they gonna get them from like well then where did all the other ones come from Okay, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, it's just silly, you know? It's just silly. It's just really trying to be, like, generally inclusive. Like, teach you should be teaching kids that, like, gay people exist and they're fine. They're not, nobody's going to get hurt. It, it makes people feel comfortable. You don't have to go on and on about fucking the 8,000 genders or anything. But, like, it's not bad to be like, yeah, some gay people exist. Be sensitive to it. Like, okay. I get LGBTQIA, they're after, they're indo we're indoctrinating. You know, Desmond, you wear makeup in front of kids and you're going to try to, like, make them all wear makeup. Why? Like, why would that benefit me in any way, shape, or form? Like, that's why I don't understand that accusation. So I, th I and I would love to hear your perspective and your yeah, perspective. Yeah, I mean, like, if your teacher's wearing, if you have, a, like, a male person or whatever, they were wearing makeup and as a teacher, and your kid's like, what? Like, this is the conversation. Oh, this person wears makeup. Oh, okay. Like, that's fine. That they, 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 is what they do. Like, it doesn't matter. And if, that's it. And if, you know what? And if you don't want your boy wearing makeup, just say, like, they do that, but you can't. <laughs> there you go. I think it's really comes down to nobody wants to have that hard conversation with their kid. Like they're lazy. They just want, they don't want, they don't feel like explaining everything. Uh, and I think that that has a lot to do with like a lack of empathy through teaching and uh, the way that we teach kids, you know, a lot of it's just like, do as I say, or you'll be punished or I will uh, give you a, 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 you know, power ranger megazord rather than sitting down and explaining to people why something is wrong. Yep. On like what, like, I get it. I get it. I don't, again, not saying it's a bad book, right? But I'm just as protective. That was an overreach. I am extremely protective. I love watching coming home early and eating and all of coming home, eating and watching your streams makes my shitty work day a little better. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Of kids almost as much as the parents, right? Well, and I uh, I think to that, for, for my part, it never was about LGBTQ. Okay. It, it, it was just about the explicit um, content right. because, and I actually think that a lot of people um, whatever their, you know, belief is, I think they do agree that there's pornographic content kids shouldn't be exposed should to that. Be exposed. Oh, sure. but, but why is it? So, so for me, not about LGBT at all. Right. However, mm -hmm. it's these books typically that are wading into overt graphic content. Right. They're being given to grade schoolers right. and these teachers are saying, don't tell the parents. Right. Mm -hmm. saying well, so first of all, we aren't seeing these teachers saying, don't tell the parents. I... Like there might be a singular teacher that is saying, don't tell the parents. That is not reflective of an entire narrative. I mean, how many teachers are there in the United States? Like that teacher should be punished proportionately. But um, like there are 4 million teachers in the United States and that's K through 12, public, private, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> 4 million. You're telling me one of them did something wrong. Okay, by your logic, all priests are, you know, predator pedophiles from, you know what I mean? Like, you, if you want to play the disproportionate game, like, that's what you're inviting. It's not happening in a widespread way. There are books that are being written that are more expressive and open. Absolutely. It's not even close to all of them. It's some of them have some uh, inappropriate material in there. And then those are hyper focused on and like, and, and everybody has a fucking meltdown about that, you know? Um, it's, I think it's good to call it out, but they're calling it out as if this is a reflection. It's not about LGBTQ, but how come it's always all the LGBTQ books are, are grooming kids and why are all the, it's like, dude, it's like one teacher that like might've acted inappropriately that you haven't even referenced. Like you're not being accurate. You're just engaging in like a trans panic, criticize the book and say, that's too far and move on. You know? You're trying to assign it to gay people to try to like you're trying to put it on them be like, oh, look, see all gay people that like, that's all it is. That's why people are saying like, dude, this is homophobic. Saying we should resist these bills that give parents access to knowledge about the curriculum. Right. And then when Ron DeSantis does a press conference where he shows sexually graphic content, they say he's banning books that he's. And, and, then, and then what they do is they put on these shows where they'll have catcher in the rye and act like that's what's being banned. And no, uh, the, the issue I see with, for instance, this book is gay. That is not sex education. 
Gender queer is not, okay. se not sex education. This is kink that's education. Children, I well, it's probably sex education with kink in it, right? But like, yeah, that's one of the bad books. I'm sure there's plenty that are fine. I think it's it's fair to say to a parent, "Hey, your kids are entering this age, and we'd like to discuss the birds and the bees, general reproduction, mm -hmm. and you know how this stuff happens." When I was in fifth grade at a Catholic school, they gave us permission forms. We went to our parents. Our parents said yes or no. Some kids were pulled out. Most of us, there was a, there was male sex ed. Then the boys would go to the computer room. The girls would come in and do female sex ed. The yeah, I don't think that you need to separate male and female sex ed. It just seems kind of stupid to do that. Um, you want to know the biggest reason why? Uh, mostly because you're going to have, you're probably going to have kids. And if you're a boy, you might have a girl kid. And if you're a girl, you might have a boy kid. And it's probably a good thing to learn about more than just that. So it's silly to even separate that. I don't think that you need a permission. I don't. I mean, I just don't think it's productive to be like you have to have a permission slip to learn about comprehensive sexual health education. I don't think they should be teaching kink, but like we don't need to go that far. Anything with that was the boys got like two hours of game time and the girls got like twenty minutes. Right. But what we're seeing with these books is this book is gay describes scat. It teaches how to use grinder, right. and this is being provided to middle schoolers. Right. And then really what happens that? is when this when this okay. teacher comes out, I feel like I'd have to read and she it. gives it. <laughs> Him just lies about shit all the time, but he might be right. I don't know. For middle schoolers, the parents call the police, right? Because you cannot, it's, it's illegal you to give children. Yeah, absolutely. That's not well, protected under free speech. We have the Supreme Court case that. What happens then is NBC News shows a picture of her holding a different book, which is about more ideological issues, and then says that she was trying to support gay rights when the reality was parents were concerned that she was teaching 10 year olds how to use Grinder. Right. There's no reason for that. But, well, and I, okay. uh, oh, sorry. No, please go. Oh, okay. Um, I feel like I'd have to read this book to understand the context more. But yeah, again, that you would just, that's one bad teacher. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, don't do bad teachers, you know? I think personally that, I mean, with this, we've, sh we've seen a shift from sex ed to comprehensive sexuality education. So for me, it took me time to understand, well, what is CSE, comprehensive sexuality education? Where did it come from? What's the belief system behind it? What's driving these ideas? I, mean, I don't see an issue with teaching kids about sexuality because sexuality isn't like inherently linked to sex. Sexuality is just like, oh, gay people exist. I'm sure it could go too far, I guess. I just don't think, oh, gay people exist. Like, that's would be, to me, comprehend. I don't know how far it goes, but fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with teaching kids that gay and bi people and shit exists. Like, that's not a bad thing. And for me, being able to see where it was implemented in other countries prior to the U.S., being able to look into the original framework um, was helpful to understand where it's coming from because, for example, uh, in in the document. That's actually interesting. I think it would be a lot more productive as we shift uh, the different things that we teach uh, kids about if we send like pamphlets home for the parents um, so that they can at least get an idea of like why something is being taught. Because that's something that my understanding isn't happening. It's like, okay, we're gonna teach your kids something that you never got taught when you were younger um suck it up instead of being like oh we're gonna teach something new here's what it is and here's why this way if you and like we're gonna address your questions i mean that seems much more productive because teaching uh, kids really is partially about teaching parents too because parents usually will help their kids learn so i can understand that as an argument it meant it references sexual citizenship which was new to me and and pleasure was a focus and okay the goal is to teach this to grades K through 12. Even some of the groups aligned for the national sexuality. Uh, I doubt that they're teaching all that K through 12. The acknowledgement of one's right to sexual self-determination and recognition of that. Okay. Sexual citizenship is just basically consent. Um, yeah, it's the acknowledgement of one's own right to sexual self-determination. I, I, they're being very broad here. Like this stuff doesn't seem that like that big of a deal. Um, you know, I wonder what the context is that they're bringing up pleasure. Like they might be talking about different like acts and just for context, but like, oh, these can be pleasurable acts. Uh, a lot of times, like when I've heard that terminology, it's in the context of like, oh, you know, you could do other things other than sex. That's also pleasurable that have a lower risk of like STD transfer or a lower risk of like pregnancy transfer. That's the, the context that I, I mean, I imagine it's in. I could be wrong. I'm just bringing that up for context education standards um, did a presentation where they were talking about this this concept of you know sexuality education and they really want to reach kids in the early elementary grades um, yeah I don't it depends on what they're getting taught like fundamentally I don't disagree with reaching young kids with comprehensive covers like especially about like consent like sexual citizenship again as long as it's age appropriate but I feel like some of these conversations are like oh they're young so it's bad and it's like okay well I mean I need to know a little more than like oh they're just young to get like a better feel on that, um, so. And so I think it's it's an important analysis that we 
pause. And for me, it was, how do I learn everything I can about this, which I'm still continuing That's to research fair. and figure it out. But those frameworks, um, particularly whether it's from, you know, Planned Parenthood or the World Health Organization with their definitions of terms, um, the idea that it has gone from more of a biological safety prevention, it's different from what I had in okay. California, and then into um, a completely separate thing. For me, schools don't exist to teach sexual technique. And yeah, that's, I, I, I agree. And okay, if that's what's happening, that is too far. But the way that you vaguely described it didn't really elude sexual technique. Um, I mean, it might have been sexual alternative. Again, kink never going to be appropriate to me in schools ever. But sexual alternatives, like you can do other things instead of sex, like that's a that's a measure to prevent people from engaging in sex like too young, and talking about alternatives. So, like, I understand where that's coming from, right? So that would be the argument there. Ori hole in in this book in, in its glossary of terms. It refers to Grindr as a social network app for gay and bi men. And so, you know, the interesting thing is there seems to be uh, dildo, a tribal left or right division. Where sure. Yeah, that seems like that book might not be appropriate for young people. You know, I get I agree. You end up with people seeing this book and saying, yo, that should not be given to 10 year olds and 12 year olds. Right. The parents call the police on this one. Absolutely. Then we have a guest come on this show, a okay. prominent left personality who says the book is good and should not be banned. I say, oh, oh, oh. Right. It's, I believe the only reason they're saying it is because they want to appear to be on the left publicly. Which is tricky, right? Because then you also have the other side of the situation, <clears throat> right? Where that idea of if I ask like pronouns or it's like, oh, like what are your pronouns? You're then automatically associated with supporting, like like giving this to a, a seven-year-old, which is not necessarily the case, right? right. So it's that idea sure, of, like yeah. you said, there's tribalism. But that to me is an issue. And I feel like there's also this kind of false comparison that's happening because we see an uptick of LGBTQIA awareness. And we also see an uptick of literature sure. like this, right? So it's like, oh gosh, are we equating the two when really it's just we need to kind of redraw the boundaries on what is kind of permitted? Sure, like some people might get like too locked into defending stuff that shouldn't be defended. Like the book seems to go too far. Like, yeah, I agree with that. That's like, a, you got to be careful that as like a progressive, I know a conservative, but as a progressive in my case, of just defending everything at the expense of it. You know what I mean? Um, because you get like stun locked into it because you're like, oh no, you know, because part of it too is that like there are dishonest comparisons from conservatives. I'm not saying progressives don't do that either, but, and so like all of a sudden you're like, you know what, I'm going to assume that what they're saying is disingenuous because there, there's a lot of, you know, and people, the people on the right have a similar issue with people on the left as well. Um, and so I think some of it comes from that also, um, you know, but you have to be careful to try to like verify information to you by yourself and whatnot, but it's good to remain skeptical for teachers to teach what is not permitted, what our job is, where it falls outside of the bounds, because I see it and I understand the concern, right? I mean, like, don't get it twisted. Like I, I watched the show. I saw like, there was like the graph and oh, like, like left-handedness and, and like right. that. It was a really interesting point, right? Oh, Desmond's referring to, I think that, uh, surfs was on there. And basically, they're talking about how, like, why does it seem like there's so many different gay people now? And, uh, you know, the surfs brought up, like, back in the day, it used to not be okay to be left-handed. And then people were able to identify as left hand or be able to express that they were left-handed. And then you saw, like, a huge spike. And then it went away because it was just that there were more left-handed people than uh, was socially allowed to be. Uh, and now that it's, like, not an issue, and oh, my God, now that it's not an issue anymore, like, you're, you're seeing, you know, people like, oh, yeah, I'm left-handed, right? So that was the idea behind it, which is partially probably true. You know, I think that there's also young people experimenting with their gender and stuff, and there's a lot of others, or their sexuality, which is, like, very normal for people to do. You know, I thought I was gay once. Now I know I am. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, with that said, is it entirely, would I make entirely the same argument? Probably not, right? Because it's trending a little bit. Yeah, I said it, right? Well, but people but, people pointed out that uh, the left-handedness argument yeah. omits the previous centuries. Right. Where left-handedness is very high, there's a dip and then a recovery. Right. So if you just take one metric that shows it going up, it, uh -huh. you can change the Well, I'll give context. you like a completely... Well, that doesn't... The point was is that when society said that was a bad thing, people wouldn't... They would hide it from people, and that's similar to LGBTQ. It doesn't really neglect anything. Uh, that's just like a weird talking point that you like you need to hold on to to make it seem like you weren't wrong. <laughs> like that wasn't a good point. But okay. A different argument, which you may have not heard, which actually gets everyone to hate me. And being someone who's somewhat, I, people call me centralist, and I don't know if that's actually a thing. If I am, I just try to think of each thing individually. But here's kind of how I see it, is that there is kind of an inherent LGBTQIA population. That population will never go away, no matter what, in my True. opinion. Um, and yeah, I do think that kind of, you look at the research, the gender studies research, that scientifically we could delineate things like, yeah, there may be a, a little bit more of a bisexual population than people care to admit. Possibly. Possibly. Right, Kinsey? Probably. Like the way that I look at it uh, is that people in general, I think that everybody's born 
a, like uh, with a rough spec like on somewhere on a rough spectrum and based on how they're socialized like they might be able to be more accepting or a little more gay. like for me if I, I grew up in a relatively conservative household that was like not against gay people at all um but it wasn't necessarily like comfortable it was like oh if you're gay it's fine but it wasn't like necessarily like comfortable i'm probably i could probably be a little gayer you know what i mean um you know i but i'm fine with not being gayer right you know there's just people who fall on the spectrum where it's like they're gay regardless <laughs> you know what i mean so um i think that there can be a little bit of a fluid a fluidity to people's sexualities depending on like the, the level of shame associated with it you know, I've had family, like, you know, not my mother ever, but I've had family say things along the lines of, like, oh, bisexuality doesn't exist and, like, that, and you know what I mean? And and then I, I remember, you know, when I was younger having a slight attraction to guys a little bit and I was confused and I was like, oh, my God, if bisexuality doesn't exist, I'm gay. And then that made me, like, a little upset because, you know, I don't want to be gay. Like, that was the thought back then. Um, so, you know, it gets confusing. I think that there is a level of, like, a spectrum to it, though. <clears throat> so. You scale. It may, people may be a little bit more bi than we think. Now people are coming out, and then more people are coming out because they're more comfortable, and then it Especially trended a little bit. And it, yeah, it trended a little bit. Now, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, straight was trending, and people were lying about being straight for a very long time. Is it that bad that in the past two decades, a couple people may not be lying, but experimenting with different titles, different sexualities, even before they understand it? I'm kind of like playing the how big is your problem game with my kids. I don't know if it's a huge issue that some kid is like, okay. oh, I'm, you know, genderqueer at the age of like 11. It's like, do you even know what that means? And if you do, great. And if not... Yeah, like they might just be like, oh, this is a thing and I want to experiment with it, but that doesn't mean that it's going to take hold in any capacity. Like, it's just like, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Like, I don't think it's big. Like, if my kid was like five and was like, I'm a boy and they were born a girl, I'd be like, okay, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't care. And if this was something that like was persistent as some, things got, like time went on, I'd be like, okay, and we would, you know, deal with it accordingly if I needed to get some kind of service or whatever. Uh, but like, for the most part, kids are just experimenting, you know? I used to want to be my di dinosaur. And uh, I lost that. I lost my dinosaur once. And I, I, I tell, I'm going to tell my kids, don't lose your dinosaur, Dale. You know, that's how I'm going to be. Not. Okay. But I, you're not hurting anyone. You're not hurting yourself. Like, what would you, what do you think? I, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, they are hurting themselves. Tell, yeah, Ooh. tell them. So Who? one of the bigger issues with uh, uh, pronouns and stuff and all yeah. these things is, for one, there's no logical consistency to teach. You end up with these viral videos of. Well, there is logical consistency. It's just that you're looking at TikTok as like the educational foundation like pronouns relate to your gender in some capacity which is male female or somewhere in between maybe neither i mean those all the the problem is is that um there are people on tiktok or one person who's like let me teach you how to use lorax pronouns like obviously that doesn't mean that there's not logical consistency just because that person's an idiot uh it just means that like you know what it really means is you're pointing to that person going see this person's fucking ridiculous so all of it must be ridiculous right so Vote this young woman on TikTok with you know hundreds of thousands of views saying I'm frog and frog cell. Yep, I I, I know I, I just called it like I called that was the person she's referring to, like I told you like this is the um this is what happens. Is this is the person that they're talking about? Like Today this, I'm show I you. called it immediately. Like this is the problem. This is one of the problems with a lot of different people in general. But like what's happening with Tim Pool is he looked at libs of TikTok, highlight somebody that's crazy. Like that's a little silly when he's like, oh, Lorax pronouns, which is like obviously, like come on, and goes, that's all gender conversation. It's like, <laughs> okay, is it or is it just like TikTok? And and if anything, this person here is a is a is a supporter for why we need comprehensive LGBTQ uh, teachings in schools. Because if we don't have it in schools that teach people effectively and correctly about LGBTQ, this is where your kids are going to get their edu their education from on the topic. So if anything, this proves we need to have these comprehensive conversations about it in school. You know, but he's susceptible to like the t the TikTok LGBTQ and TikTok feminism, which is just some people online looking for attention. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this person isn't trans or something, but like the, the entire page is devoted to using gem pearl pronouns, Barbie pronouns. Like it's obviously just ridiculous for views. So, elf, and it seems just to be. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 the people on the left will argue that well it's people exploring their self expression and it's just like well there's there's no logic there's a flag for everything you're, all you're basically telling kids is nothing you're, right. you're you're telling them chaos static noise no definitive understanding of what's going on perhaps an adult could understand enough about reality to explore various ideas around how do you categorize but to go to a child and say 
an infinite number of categories. Every day they're learning something that was just made up yesterday. They're going to have no framework for what's going on. Well, but, yeah, sorry, just please, no. to address the, the harming themselves. With the laws being passed in California, Washington, and a bunch of these other states that protect third parties who would bring a child for gender reassignment or, or, or me medical intervention. Okay. We're now entering the territory where a 10 year old kid who <clears throat> has no understanding of what's going on is told by an adult, and this has happened to personal friends of mine twice. You're friends with 10 year olds? What? And, and that seems like a heck of a lot for, for me. Two, two people that I know had their daughters come home with the teachers telling them that they were trans or lesbian and they were not. They were 10. And when the parents explained to them, okay, let me ask you, you're, you think you're this, do you know what this means? And the kids go, what? No, no, no. Now, what happens if you're in California? And nothing. Because like if those kids, like nothing. First of all, I, I mean, listen, let's say that I just don't, I, I personally, it's convenient that your friends are the ones experiencing this, but you're not going to get a diagnosis based off of your teacher saying a thing. Like, it's just not going to happen, right? Like, uh, you know, we should be good. We shouldn't be te telling people that they are something, if that is even true. But they're not going to go and, like, go to a therapist and instantly get diagnosed and be like, oh, wow, you're trans, I guess, blah, blah, blah. Like, no. Especially since the kids were pushed and prompted and they're like, no, I'm not actually this thing. So, okay. And the parents are more susceptible to whatever you say, honey. Next thing you know, these kids who have no idea what Lupron is or what it means to get uh, uh, puberty blockers <laughs> okay. is on a fast track for this, which has resulted in 50,000 people on Reddit joining the D-Trans community. And that's not that's nothing. See, this is what I'm talking about. The D-Trans community on Reddit is mostly people that want to bully people in, that are D-Trans, that, that are like trans people. Most of the D -trans, people in the D-Trans Reddit are just there to be transphobic. They're not there because they detransitioned. Like detransition is like one percent of people with gender dysphoria detransition, but based on our current metrics, that's like the fact that like it's just such a dishonest argument that you think that that's representative of anything. It's it's a fucking Reddit full of people that just want to be transphobic. Um, <laughs> like you're acting like it's all real. Like that's a confirmed study. That's all it is. Like it, 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 that'd be like if uh, fifty thousand people joined like a like I was I was groomed by a priest Reddit. And you're like, see, fifty thousand people were molested by a priest. And like if I use that as a factual foundation, you would go, no, 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 it's just a Reddit. But when it like but when it comes to this, like everything is, it's just so narrative driven. And an endless loop of posts of people threatening suicide. What what I see in the data. Okay. And uh, that's not data. Uh, so if you look at the desistance rates, what is the, the number I believe is like sixty eight to ninety five percent of children who identify as transgender will desist. That doesn't. That too. That, that that strengthens my argument. I mean, detransition, it means that if left to go through their natural puberty, they end up no. uh, uh, identifying with their biological sex. No, that doesn't. That, OK, so for <laughs> this is like one of the first of all, I don't know what statistic he's operating off of, but this doesn't prove his point. People identifying as trans isn't the same as getting a gender dysphoria diagnosis. If your five year olds like I'm a boy and they're not and you don't do anything, they'll probably just, quote unquote, grow out of it. That's not a gender dysphoria diagnosis. That's just a kid saying a thing. That's why they might grow out of it because they're just experimenting with their gender. They don't have a diagnosis. The diagnosis statistics are like 1% of people who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria detransition. That's it. And then there's various reasons. Sometimes it's like lack of financial support, lack of support in like a community around you. Um, sometimes it's just to have a kid. You know, sometimes it is because it was the wrong choice. But like he's trying to conflate this. It's just a dishonest perspective that he's pushing. And he knows it. Typically, they end up being either autistic or gay. What happens <laughs> okay. now is they will just affirm whatever no. it is the kid is saying, despite the fact the majority that's, of these kids would self-identify uh, if they're allowed to go through puberty. My concern here is <laughs> you so bring in young kids who don't understand what they're hearing. You layer on books and ideas and things that are more confusing to a child than anything. You layer on the, the social factor of Instagram likes, views, etc. And you end up with all of these stories of these prominent, now famous detransitioners saying, I didn't understand. More horrifyingly, you end up with these stories on detransitioners. Yeah, but like a lot of these detransitioners are paid a lot of money by conservatives to sensationalize their perspective. Like that's a real thing. I covered it in another video um, that'll probably come out before this one. It was a conversation with a 17 year old detransitioner or detransitioner that detransitioned at 17 years old. And they're like, yeah, they offer us a lot of money to say horrible, nasty, terrible things about trans people. And it's like, I don't doubt it. You know, like that's what it comes down to. We're talking about 1% of 1% of people. You know what I mean? And it's like, dude, it's so, this is why people call it homophobic and transphobic because like you're not operating honestly. 
you're just trying to be as like toxic as possible because you don't like trans people or gay people and makes you uncomfortable. That's all it comes down to. You're like, I, it's not because they're gay. And then you just go on and you use any statistic that you can that is like just dishonest. You're literally using Reddit, a Reddit as a proof. <laughs> So, Reddit, okay. where we read one last night, where a 17-year-old was threatening suicide because oh, right. she felt manipulated into getting a double mastectomy, testosterone, and it ruined her life, and now she feels like she, she can't lead a normal life. Yeah, you're talking about the video that I watched. I know what he's talking about. To getting a double mastectomy, where we read one last night, where a 17-year-old was threatening suicide because she felt manipulated into getting a double mastectomy, <laughs> testosterone, and it ruined her life. And I know what, she's, what he's talking now about. Now she feels like... She, she can't lead a normal life. I'm pretty sure that's the inspiration for like, that's the person that was interviewed in the video I watched and they were the ones who exposed that like conservatives are paying big money to get people, trans people to like watch detransitioners to lie about like how bad the transition or trans people are. So like, okay, like, talk to the person tim instead of sit here and go i read something on a reddit go find the person go pay him a lot of money and bring him on here and be like another you know <laughs> dishonest person well you, you have these laws being passed that would protect a third party a third party can take someone's child to the state dramatically alter their life cause irreversible changes and or harm and be legally protected because these kids are not equipped to understand what they're well yeah you would protect the third party you'd protect the doctor this is more about like the therapist um, you're right. It could cause harm if they're not actually trans or that's not the right way, or it could cause a lot of good for them. You know, and that's just about making sure that we properly diagnose people and treat them. So that's pretty much it. Not really a hot take. Um, what, what they're signing up for. My last point on this is if desistance rates truly are between 60 and 95%, they're not. And suicide rates are around 40 to 50%. The smartest and most logical thing we can do, considering uh, the majority of these kids will uh, ident identify with their biological sex not be trans and thus experience lower rates of suicide is not to intervene at all in any medical way for a child who's experiencing gender dysphoria until after puberty. If, the, if, if we're looking at it from a simple prob probabilistic standpoint, you guys, let's just say it's the lowest number, 60%. You have a greater than chance probability your child will just self-identify with their biological sex. And th but that's just, okay. Thus, not experience. And he's conflating people just identifying with people that have gender dysphoria. These are two very different things. It's a 50-50 suicide rate. It seems like the math is fairly obvious. You transition your kid, you are boosting their suicide rate to 47%. No. Well, and I was going to say, I mean, for my part, I mean, I have... <laughs> Another part of that, too, is he's like, if you make your kid trans, you're making them more suicidal. No. Like, the suicidality comes from not being able to transition, typically, right? So it's not like making someone trans makes them suicidal. It's that somebody struggling with gender dysphoria that has suicidal thoughts... So now he's trying to make it seem like you can make your kid trans, but it's all like he has no concern for like trans. Like I understand being skeptical, but at this point, he's just basically pushing the idea that you make your kid trans by telling them, like saying that they are trans. Um, I don't think that this is something that's like happening in a robust capacity. We should definitely make sure that we get right to the right doctor, you know, access. But Jesus Christ, two friends who they okay. had CPS called on them. If, if you didn't seem like you were immediately uh, affirming. celebrating, <laughs> affirming, I don't I just don't I can't believe it. Everything is I have two friends who I have this experience. Like, who are they? Tell me who they are. Interview them. I want to hear the specific story because at this point, I'm just skeptical about anything that you're saying. I just two friends. They just had really everybody has two friends that had CPS called on them. I don't believe you. I just don't. I just I mean, what, uh, how? What are their names? The first name, please. Um, yeah. CPS was called on them. And then oh, yeah. this is what I'm noticing. Uh, Maybe just it was unrelated. <laughs> to overall, the gender. is that the, the I just when you say two friends and then you kind of just roll forward. I just don't. I, I mean, what credibility do you have at that point? Uh, but, California okay. legislature and other places, in my opinion, are chipping away at parental responsibilities. Traditional parental responsibilities. And this this area is like one. Which ones? But I mean, in the midst of this, we do have a growing number little by little here of young people who are detransitioning. But the thing oh, I ha sure, I, I'm yeah. concerned about is that there is this messaging of celebrate, celebrate, celebrate towards those who are making these decisions. But the detransitioners are often humiliated, silenced, and shamed. And yeah, and I agree that that's a problem. The problem is, is the reason that happens is because conservatives pay detransitioners to sensationalize the story and say uh, transphobic things. And so, like, now, now progressives are, like, anything that sounds like uh, detransitioner is, like, uh, some kind of, like, bait to be transphobic. And they're partially right. They get tons of money to go onto these shows and everything. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, that's where the skepticism comes from there. I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, it's you talk about it in the correct way. You guys are, I, I don't know what to tell you. To me, that is indicative of, of part, and I don't think everybody believes that. I think there's a lot of people that, that don't, but I think the way in which I've seen detransitioners... 
um, treated. It's 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 so sad. See, I don't I don't actually see, I don't actually agree with this. However, I do 100% understand where you're coming from, and I see that logic, and I understand your mathematical model, and that statistically, I understand your point of view, and I get that. However, I'm gonna make a comparison and again because I just love getting people to hate me. That's just like my job, right? It's like, do you remember um, kind of like po like pre 2020 where like the classic news was black individuals are targeted by the police and it never makes it on the news. And that was the news story. Like the news story itself was black people are never on the news. That to me is the same situation where it's like the, the current news story is detransitioners are never on the news, which inherently puts them on the news, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like I understand your perspective, but I've heard it so- Interesting angle. I would have went with uh, speaking out against the false narrative that 90% of people detransition, but- So many times by the same groups of people. Like, well, we never pay attention to detransitioners because that amount is like infinitesimally small. And actually we do hear about it all the freaking time. You just yeah, it is 1% of 1%. <laughs> It's the same thing as how the majority of conservative conversation centralizes around like trans and gay people, even though that's like one percent of the population, rather than like actual you know other economic you know things that would be helpful to society, um, like you know Head Start programs or healthcare or you know um, bolstering the middle class or any of that shit. So oh, it's always in the context of oh we never hear about detransitioners. Yes we do. It's literally on the it's like on every YouTube channel on podcast. Right. I hear it consistently. And then like that other side note though of that idea of like well it's always like celebrate celebrate celebrate. Just an idea. Just just an idea. That idea of yes parents you guys you know you know your kids and you know them extremely well right. However however if you don't celebrate a kid's exploration into different topics they sometimes start pushing back without even knowing what they're pushing back against. And that's actually what I'm more worried about. That idea of and of I course guess, I, can't. I guess it's how you define like ex like a celebration. Like if somebody's like oh I come out as gay and you're like oh that's cool good for you like that's celebration. You know, I think that's fine. Like, whatever. You know, you don't like specific clients, right? But like, I can say I've had multiple instances where a parent has, you know, come to me and being like, "Oh, well, you know, she wants to be called he now. What do I do?" And I gotta say, I say the exact opposite thing of kind of what you're going for. Is I say like, go with it, because when you start pushing against it, they start pushing back on the parent without even knowing what they're pushing back on. And I've had plenty of students, plenty of students, and this is nothing, nothing against the trans community, because I'm such like obviously right. But I've had plenty of students. I mean, at that point, I just call my kid their name. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna call you by your name. <laughs> Um, and if they're like, I want to change my name, I'll be like, all right, well, I'm picking, I'm picking your new name. You know what I mean? I picked, the, I, I get to pick. If I have a trans kid. I'm picking your new name. This isn't debatable. I, that's my, I still get that job. So if you want to transition, I'm picking your name. Keep that in mind. Students who, yeah, they are genderqueer and whatever, and their pronouns say whatever. And I've also had plenty of students where they said, oh yeah, I'm definitely trans. And we were like, oh cool. Okay. They, them, he, him, she, her, whatever. And you went with it for a couple months. And then they realized after just leaving it, with, just going with it, they're like, actually, that wasn't, that's not a thing. This is why parents don't want it in schools. But, but like, okay, okay. Well, no, but like Desmond literally is countering what you're saying by like, you're saying that like, oh, there's this detransitioning rate, which is not true. It's just like, let kids do it. Like kids used to say that they're like a bunch of crazy, the kids say just weird shit sometimes. And they're just explore, exploring what the world means to them. So that's why like, you're seeing kids like, oh, I'm non-binary. And then they get, they get older and they're, they, it turns out they're not. They were just exploring. There's nothing wrong with that. Like who cares? <laughs> but Again, like how big is the problem? It's just, I, I don't see it as a fundamental issue, right? I see, of course, any teacher going outside of their realm. Of it's the same thing. Like when I was, in, I was like a hardcore, like I was really into metal and I hated new metal. I was like a gatekeeper for metal. It's like the same thing. Now I'm older. I'm like, okay, that was kind of cringe. You know what I mean? Like it's similar to that. You know, you're just kind of, you're a kid and you're experimenting with your identity. And that was part of your identity was being, I was, I was super metal. That was part of my identity, you know? And, um, you know, this is my part. Like, same thing with JROTC kids that are like, you're speaking to a future military officer. And it's like, okay, relax. You know, but you just let them live in their, they do their thing. And then eventually they, 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 either they are that thing or they grow up and like they change a little bit. Like, people change all the time. It's not that big of a deal. You know? Expertise as an issue, right? I'm a learning specialist with a master of science in education with a focus in language processing disorders. I'm not an endocrinologist. I can't say you should take this hormone. That's out of my that's out of my scope. I can't say that. That's not allowed or it shouldn't be, right? But also that that idea of like, is it really that bad of like, oh, okay, you go by she, they, and then I call my student they and everyone on TikTok, I can't believe you call students they them, you're indoctrinating. No, like they literally asked me to call them they them. Like it's just I don't know if this indoctrination thing is real. I do understand the statistical analysis that you gave though. I'd well, love to hear more about that. I'd say it is. Okay. With books like Gender Queer and this book is gay being in, in schools and there's a substantially it's, it's not in schools. It's in like a school. Like you keep saying in schools. There like there's four million teachers and you've you showed us one bad teacher. Like or you've alluded to it. You haven't really showed us anything to be honest with you. But like it's not in school. Like there are some schools with it in it. And that, you know, let's have the conversation, but you're not having a proportionate conversation. You're not saying, hey, let's teach it, but like kind of let's not teach this. You're going on a fucking tangent about how all of it's so disproportionate.
it's more than just these two books have in front of us. And then, of course, critical race theory was the big debate a couple years ago because Whatever. it seems like critical theory in general was being brought into schools in, in a variety of ways. So it is indoctrination. Okay. Uh, my Sassy response thing, to right. most people is like, we want indoctrination. We just don't want that indoctrination. We want to teach the, the positive values say. of our moral frameworks, innocent children, et cetera. Those are, those are big opponents, the rights of the individual meritocracy. And now we have children being taught an inversion of this. And we have, okay. in many circumstances... I mean, listen, I don't know exactly what CRT is. Here's all I know. You shouldn't teach anybody that like they are bad for the virtue of their existence. Like just because you're white doesn't make you bad. Just because you're black doesn't make you bad. But we should also teach history and like the aspects of like white supremacy and tribalism that existed. Like I think that that's something to learn. That's it. You know, if that's what CRT is, great. If it's not, then like there you go. But I imagine that most. I don't know how open conservatives are to the first part I said because some of them just seem to want to roll past slavery sometimes. They said systemic racism. You know. So if that's all it is, though, then I'm fine with critical race theory. I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know exactly how they're defining it, you know? But as long as that's how it's being defined, like, whatever. It's fine. The severing of the uh, the family unit in terms of don't tell your parents. The response from just, liberals is... Where? The, Who's saying that? Like, what are you talking about? They're trying to force schools to out the children to their parents. Well, Which it's is, not your... You have no right. If, 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 a, if a child is experiencing anything, be it bulimia or uh, some kind of gender confusion. Oh, you're talking. Oh, oh, dude, he's so dishonest. He's talking about don't tell your parents is like if the kid comes out as gay. Like, yeah, it, I don't think you have to tell the parents that your kid said that they're gay in school. That's not bulimia. That's not like a mental health issue. Like, that's just fucking they're gay. Like, that's not a big deal. Like, who cares? It's just the idea that they might have an oppressive home life, so you don't want to tell them that because that's like that's for the kid to decide when to say shit like that. You're making it seem like they're like don't tell kids about these books. It's like no, you're just saying don't tell. Like that's fine if you're not you don't have to tell the the students or the parents that your kids their kids said that they were gay. It's not that big of a deal. Like that makes sense to protect the kid in case they come from a very homophobic background where their parent might hurt them for like thinking something like that or for expressing something like that. That's not that big of a deal. Like it's. <laughs> Like, it's not like you're, you're the dude. The way that he talks about these topics is so weird. Like, he's just so weird. Holy fuck. Mm -hmm. It is not the state's obligation nor right okay, to, to uh, intervene in that regard. But that is what's happening. Well, and I want to say something to that because um, for for a couple things with regards to schools, I mean, um, we had a situation where like, what if the kid decided that they were they didn't want to be like Muslim anymore and they wanted to be Christian? Would you would you be OK with them saying don't you don't have to tell the parent? Like I would be like the like because maybe their maybe their 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 parents will be rude to their kid or be like abusive to their kid. Like these are some of these are just like uh, like what what is the issue? I don't understand the issue behind. There's some things that like you don't have to tell the parents. Not everything, but like that's fine. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, my kid said the kids said they're gay. You don't need to tell the parent about that. Or a, a volunteer at a school had threatened our oldest when he was young and. I, I noticed some change in him after school and it wasn't, I was never told about this. So I, I actually approached the school staff and then that's when I learned of the situation. Um, there was another situation with our youngest in school where there were threats from other students. And so I actually, one of the times I went to the school board meeting is our, our, our youngest had had multiple threats um, from a student, really okay. descriptive graphic threats. Okay. And what happened was I, I, I had been getting those notices about, you know, your child's been exposed to lice, your child's been exposed to strep throat. But I was oh, never notified good. when our, our littlest had these very scary experiences at school. Liability it, issues. Yeah, it's, it's very concerning. But, so okay, so that's there's a difference between your kid saying they're gay versus your kid getting bullied. Obviously, you should tell the parent if your kid's getting bullied. That's just the school failing. That's nothing to do. That's nothing to do with like what's covered in the bill. Like, what, like, OK. Like it's one that's does just two different things. No, oh, nonetheless, a false, uh, but a false, a quote, like they're not, they're not the same thing, right? Like that idea of like this is what I'm like constantly trying to get on, which is that idea of like they're not the same thing. Like your child being threatened, you need to tell the parent. Your child is injured, you need to fill out an accident report. That actually is usually mandated, but it's like different if it's like oh so and so said they want to go by they them. Would I tell the parent a thousand percent, right? But is it like like is it mandated? Like is it? Oh, hear me out. Okay, and this is like yeah, under the idea that like they're just experimenting with their gender, I don't think it's a big deal if a teacher doesn't tell their kid the tell the parents that the kids said that they were they them now. That's not a diagnosis. That's just an experimentation with your gender. It's really not that big of a deal. Like it's fine. Um, like whatever. Very tricky. If a student ever comes to me and they're like, I go by they them, but my mom doesn't know or my dad doesn't know, my first thought is. 
there's something that needs to be repaired within family communication. It's sure. not, I got to hide this kid's gender identity from the parent. It's the idea of we need to create some type of environment where this conversation needs to happen. Because if I immediately, and I'm not saying this is even the case, right? But if a teacher immediately, like you said, like outs a kid, right? That could create a problematic situation. In fact, it could be creating nope. a situation where it's indoctrination to be straight and cisgendered, right? Which is actually much more indoctrinating. It's usually that way, right? Like on average, True. most Disney movies, despite like new recent developments, most Disney movies kind of perpetuate that kind of what we consider the, the fancy word is like heteronormative, right? Heteronormative cisgendered ideologies. And and we need to kind of perpetuate that as the norm. I love that idea of like, you know, we want to indoctrinate innocent until proven guilty. But does that translate to straight until proven gay? Like those are two very different things in my opinion. Well, that's actually interesting. <laughs> but, yeah, and I so, think, yeah, uh, sorry. No, I was going to say, I think for my part, it is a fair comparison, only in the sense of parents are being notified less and less. He says he doesn't agree with it, but he obviously does. Of all kinds of things. Okay, fair. And, and I think, too, I just want to, to, to the point. Wait, what was that? Of parents are being notified less and less of all kinds of things. Okay, okay so pr first of all, prove that. Second of all, like, nobody's arguing that parents should get told less about their kid getting bullied. Nobody, not a single progressive. So that's just a failure in school infrastructure. But like when it comes down to, and also you're just saying a thing like that you feel. I don't know what to tell you. I let me tell you something. I when I was in school, like we're acting like this is new. When I was in school, I was a piece of shit. I threatened two kids that sat at my lunch table because that was the lunch table I usually sat at, and they got really afraid. And then they went and they told the guidance counselor, and the guidance counselor did and nothing about it. He said, "You didn't mean that, right?" And I was like, "No," because I didn't. But they don't know that the kids are. I should got suspended. My mother was never told. I doubt that those kids' parents were ever told. So when you say it's always happening more and more, no, it's not. It's it's always been happening. It, there's been ineffective school structure that's not properly reporting bullying all the time. But this nobody's trying to make that expand that. They're just saying, hey, if your kid says that they're gay, you don't have to tell the parent because it could be a threat to the kid. Because like that, the parent might be the parents might be abusive and like homophobic. It's not like the same thing. You're pretending it is, but it's not. Fair. And and I think too, I just want to to, to the point earlier with regards to um, you know the the stories in the news. It's not so much the news stories; it's the organizations that promote certain things. I don't see like any what? of those organizations supporting detransitioners, and I think that to me starts to make me question. What do you mean? Like what what I, what? Okay, when you say these sorts of things, what do you mean? The only thing that you could be talking about is like, hey, we should have financial supports for detransitioners so that they can get surgeries to detransition if that's what and i agree with that and that's happening more and more <clears throat> what are you talking about nobody like conservatives aren't trying to help detransitioners they're not trying to like what are you talking about what's going on what why why is it they they only celebrate but those who experience regret feel like they're oftentimes alone and i feel like everyone should be able to get behind those people because i think they okay, they need sure. love and support yeah, you know no, well no, I, no, I, 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 I agree on yeah. that I, well yeah go ahead so i i can <laughs> Give us, we have an example here from the Daily Mail. This is from February. New York teacher manipulated fifth grade student into changing gender without parents' consent, which drove her to consider suicide lawsuit claims. Okay, that's a bad teacher, if this is true. I don't know if it's sensationalized or not, but yeah, that's bad. Um, don't do that. I don't think that there's anything protecting that from happening more. Um, let me look New York teacher manipulated fifth grader response you typically get from uh, people on the left is it's an anecdote it's one story to That's, which my, yeah. my response is then why not just when ben shapiro comes out and says this is bad you go you are so right ben shapiro i'm so sorry this happened instead they just did they by saying that this is a one-off but the problem is, is ben shapiro is trying to make us and you as well trying to make it seem like this is most of the scenarios uh let's see deborah whatever a fifth grade teacher at terry road elementary school started calling the nine-year-old leo and using opposite gender pronouns towards the beginning of 2021-22 according to the lawsuit uh, these parents say that they were uh, only clued in about what was happening in January when the school principal called them, telling their their child referred to court papers as AV had drawn a picture of a girl writing, "I want to take my own life and I feel sad a lot." Okay, yeah, if this is true, like this is bad. There's obviously a lot of going on here. Uh, bad teacher, if the story is accurate. Okay, but this is in, this isn't like representative of what's going on most of the time. So like, yeah, I mean, okay. The response you get is dismissal. Saying, no, you're wrong. No, this doesn't matter. We no, but no, but it's not that. It's that you're trying to make it seem like this is most of what's going on. And it's just not. Like, that's the issue more than anything else. Which then you, you basically have overt support from the political left in this country of things like this when they dismiss or defend it. Okay, what? okay. It's two about? questions. And I'm not even saying that I'm right on this. I want to know if the teacher was gay. <laughs> like, no. They weren't. The New York teacher that supported it wasn't gay, right? The teacher was, according to the lawsuit and yes, photographs. they're not gay, I bet. Reading LGBT bo books to children and encouraging them to try being gay even if they were not. Okay, yeah, is the teacher gay? I don't believe the teacher's I gay. I don't think so either because no one actually gay would ever say that. 
point. Like, no well, one. Well, to be fair, we don't know. We don't actually. No, it's a complete kind of. She does have blue hair. That, that I know, right? I'm so sick. Of, like, oh my god, if you have colored hair, you guys, like, I'm so well, sick. Of the argument now is that like this person is just like a fucking blue-haired liberal that's like poorly representing the LGBTQ community. Is I guess the argument. Which not makes right. Sense. Um, but like the idea of like I don't think actually LGBTQ is trying to indoctrinate anyone. I know that word gets tossed around, but like we're not coming for your kids. Like drag queens aren't coming for your kids. Drag queens aren't eat, trying to make your kids trans. Drag queens and trans people aren't even in the same freaking category. One's a performance and the other is a gender identity. Well, like that, no, not actually, no, no, right? Well, not anymore. Yeah, because there's an availability to be trans. So like, yeah, there are more people that were like gay uh, back in the day that didn't have the access to being trans, whether it was because of so lack of social availability or lack of like, um, <clears throat> like, I guess you'd say hormonal availability or like, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, getting th the treatment for a particular thing, a doctor will say. <laughs> But you, oh, sorry. You are correct. But yeah. Now but like, you're seeing the, the, the blur and the blend where we actually had a debate between two drag queens and one of the drag queens says that they are trans. Which is okay. so interesting to me. There's no rules. Like, there's no rules, right? No, this isn't there's no rules. There is a fucking rule. What are you talking about? <laughs> there's no rule. Because you're confused about something. doesn't make it no rules. I don't know who you're referring to. Back in the day, like usually, like back in the day, people weren't able to be trans because we didn't have like hormones and mental health resources and all these other things. So it was harder to identify as trans. Now there's a little bit more. So like back in the day, you might see like a young gay boy that's very feminine. Now they, they they grew up today, they might actually just be a trans woman because they have that availability. It's not that there's no rules. Like if you see a drag queen and one of them is trans and one of them is not, it was probably somebody who was into drag when they were younger and then realized they were actually a girl gender wise. And they're still a drag queen because they appreciate the culture. There's no rules. It's not complicated. It's I mean, maybe but like you're saying there's no rules. It's just you boomering out and going, I don't understand something. You know, it's like it's like when a four year old like like gets upset because they don't know how to color inside the lines. It's For me, out, there are there is some logic that we can stick to. Right. There's some logic that we can stick to logic that I've been canceled for before and I will be canceled again. Right. Uh, blue, blue self, alligator, alligator self. I will call you whatever the hell you want. I don't care. Right. Pronouns. What if a white kid says they want to be called black? OK, great question. Fantastic question. I, I mean, I think that's a little bit different than um, a gender, gender and, and like race are fundamentally very different things but okay sure i'll do it well that's the first point and then we'll get to that point and i love that question Th that idea of, i will call you whatever the heck you want but a pronoun replaces a noun right cat cat self is not a pronoun it doesn't replace a noun it is a noun right so that's not a pronoun your pronouns are not cat cat self you may want to be called cat cat self and that's fine with me i'll call you whatever the heck you want but that's not a pronoun so that's where i draw the line as an educator right pronouns are he him they them it, it's like all of that stuff right and those should be valued but i don't think we should also be like well i'm not gonna call you cat it's like okay what if they want to be called cat now to that idea of like Race. What? Race, right? Such a good question. I would love to hear your thoughts on this, right? Now, here is where I different. I mean, the, yeah, it's the biggest thing is that there is just no. I mean, transracialism doesn't exist nearly the same way as gen gender is like something that's very fluid that people can like experiment with. Race isn't really very fluid. <laughs> like, that's really what it comes down to. Um, like, there's no really such thing as feeling black. There's nothing inherent to black people that is different from a white person or anybody else, except the way that we treat somebody systemically. Whereas when it comes to gender, like there are like they're very there are much larger differences in the way that we treat people, and some people identify with those or identify away from those. You know, when we watched uh, the seventeen-year-old detransitioner, they had talked about how like when they were younger, like one of the reasons that they feel like they I, they wanted to distance themselves from their femininity was because they were assaulted multiple times, and like they associated that assault with like the fact that they were um, they grew up faster, they had like more you know. They had went through puberty faster, and so they associated their breasts with like that being abused, and that's what like they didn't want their breasts anymore, and so that was like a very kind of complicated uh, conversation around that, right? Like that's it's it's a bit different. Um, I would say that it's just fundamentally a different thing. Jesus fucking Christ, with this fucking she's pissing me off. Sorry. And she ate the tail. Being a gender studies major, right, which people have different ideas. Girlfriend, just work up with you and you want to ask for advice, sure. Is one of my up? biggest fascinations, both having my master's of science and bachelor's in gender studies, is where is the line between a biological difference and a social difference between men and women on a biological level, right? Where is where's the line, right? Where do we go, boys will be boys, and where do we go, oh, that actually is just societally okay and it, it has nothing to do with biology. So here's the thing. There are biological differences between men and women, right? I was featured in, like, what is a woman? <laughs> And I was like called out in that movie and I never even got credit for it. But like someone could ask me like, what is a woman? It depends on the context you're asking me. Are you asking me in a scientific context? XX chromosome. Are you asking me in a social context? Self-identifying. Like saying, um, oh, what is an athlete? Self-identifying. But here's where it gets tricky. We know that there are biological differences between men and women. For example, women, oxytocin, better at communicating, better at kind of at empathy. We have, the, we have the chemicals to prove it. I have always identified with that ability, right? With that ability, I think it comes naturally to me. Hence the title non-binary, right? I identify with a biological trait that is usually kind of seen in women. Therefore, I call myself non-binary to help some people make that connection. Jeez. Now, if you say, well, a white kid wants to be called black, what exactly are you identifying with that is black? Because by definition, if you think that black people act a certain way or do things in a certain way, that's racism. There's nothing different between white and black other than skin tone. There are biological differences between men and women. There are not biological differences between white and black other than melanin, right? I mean, that's actually a really good, uh, that was actually a very, that's actually pretty good. That was pretty solid. That's why if a white kid said, I want to be black, I'd be like, 
what's your black experience that you're experiencing? If you, well, yeah, so. well, I'll push back a little bit. Okay, there, I want to hear this. There are obvious biological, biological differences between white and black beyond just melanin. Okay, we got mm, Nothing really significant and not even close to the degree as a man and a woman. Like, not even close. A black and a white dude are, are absolutely a thousand times more similar um, than a, a man and a woman. The muscle height differences, I got you, that's fair. Well, yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't think the color of the skin or the race it matters that much, but obviously sickle cell affects the black population more so. Absolutely. But then the, the issue, uh, we've talked about this quite a bit, one of the arguments being made by uh, gender ideologues is that we used to have racial segregation in this country. Mm -hmm. And what okay. was the argument for having black bathrooms and white bathrooms? There was a bit of a just moralistic... I went non scientific view of what was supposed to be. Right. But then there were also arguments presented by people who were trying to justify why we racial segregation, saying things like the danger, you know, black people are different in this way and there's risk. But the reality is, you get a black man from Somalia and a black man from Haiti, and they're very, very, very different. And then the only discernible characteristic is the color of their skin, which doesn't seem to actually help identify anything. Thank you. Okay, so then you're just agreeing with Desmond in a disagreeable tone? Exactly, right? Like my black experience being kind of 51% Italian, but still identifying as black is very different than somebody else's black experience. So yeah. a thousand percent. I have nothing to push back against when it comes but to that. Because gender, yeah. gender segregation, Yeah. everywhere you go in the world, you yeah. find almost the exact same biological differences between men and women. Okay. Yeah, you're, I don't understand. Tim Pool like literally just agreed with, with, with De Desmond in a disagreeable tone. I don't understand. That's that's the point that they're making. That there's no significant difference between a race. There's a much more significant difference between like a between like a sex. Right, and that which is why which is gender. why in, inherently if you find biological differences between men and women, but on the circumstances where you have somebody that is assigned male at birth that identifies more with female traits, or a female assigned at birth individual that kind of identifies more with male traits, we have a biological category, not utter chaos, that we can kind of make a distinction from. Oh, you are biologically this, but tend to have these characteristics. Therefore, trans. Therefore, non-binary. We don't have that with the black population. But, but if, if, when it comes to gender stuff, why why then surgery? If if gender is social, why do you need to medically or surgically affirm it? Do you want to take? Well, it's because people have like a particular view of themselves and. Uh, you know, in relation to the world that they would like to operate with. Like, that's what it comes down to. Just because something is more social doesn't mean that it's not going to have, like, practical impacts. Like, it's the same thing as, like, why do some women want to get breast enhancements or breast reductions? Or why do some men want to go on testosterone? Or why... You know, it's just, like, it's, uh, it, it's really more just about being happy with yourself, right? Why do some men do fucking Bosley hair growth? You know, not everybody needs it. I'm bald. I don't, I don't want to go on anything. I don't need to... You know, I like wearing hats sometimes, but I don't need to cover my my hair. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, short. I'm you know, so I don't need to get a surgery that makes me fucking taller, at the detriment of myself. You know, but if you want to do that, do you, man? Like, if you want to fucking do, you do whatever you want. It's just about appearing like it's feeling good about yourself. I don't know, and I feel like that's a that's a reasonable priority. Um, they got one because that's such a good question. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, and I was going to I was going to ask, actually, with regards to like sports and stuff, if, if there's this known biological difference, which I believe there is, mm -hmm. you know, having having sports competitions be changed or, you yeah, know, the prison system and all of these different things. Well, that's like, but again, oh, gosh, where do I even want to go with that? But like the idea of like the trans athlete in sport, I got to say, like, I'm so like, sick of that one, right? Because it's like such a niche issue that like no one should really care about. And yet everyone cares about it. So much. Like, I understand why people care about it, but it is a very niche issue because now we're talking about like like a less than one percent of one percent. But like, yes, I don't think that like trans women. Uh, that went through a male puberty should be in sports. Like, we should be in sports with cisgender women, of course. But it is, like, again, it's one of those things where we talk about it a lot. Um, where, like, you know, it probably doesn't necessarily need to be talked about because girls' sports are lame anyway. Nobody cares. No, I'm just kidding. But, like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's brought to the forefront of the conversation where it's, like, that is really not a forefront of the conversation. Like, are being I, that's valid that's yeah. valid but it's such like a specific it's so specific to the point where it's like oh it's so constantly being blended proportion where i feel like there are larger issues but that idea of like why surgery right and it's very interesting to kind of look at the different kind of lgbtqi perspectives that idea of to be trans you don't need affirming surgery but that i same idea of it should be accessible and it should be but what are the processes that we need to go through to make sure gender affirming care is beneficial what guardrails do we need to put in play i don't think banning it outright is a good situation i don't think declaring oh and again this kind of goes into uh, kind of There's reverse no of your opinion the idea of like wait for them to go through puberty entirely that could be really really kind of mentally draining for um somebody who's yeah and it could increase suicidality in like a young person so like that's why you wouldn't wait i mean ideally you would but like for some people you know that puberty you go through could end up having an impact on you that would like you know not make you able to be as passable as you may want to be in the future it's trans right that needs there's, to go through a puberty. Yeah, there's me. no argument against i, I do not yeah. believe that there's any any logical argument against what i said if, if the assistance rates are studied yeah. studied found to be between 60 and 95 they're, they're they're not like he's so dumb holy fuck. percent yeah. then all you are doing by transitioning a minor is right. risking their suicide <sighs> okay no you're not because it's there's a difference between a dissidence rate of these are he's referring oh. he's inflating people with gender dysphoria with some kids that said that they were a girl these are not the same thing he's like I, he's just wrong i i don't understand like there's no like he's just wrong about what he's saying and he has to know. Um, 
But you're just wrong. <laughs> you're conflating two things that aren't the same. And so hear me out. Desistance rates. First of all, those studies are. Have you seen those? Have you seen those studies? They're a mess. Like those. Those are like the smallest sample sizes with the most isolated geographic locations that I've ever seen. Instead, like those are ridiculously biased. I'm not saying you're wrong because I can't. I can't prove otherwise, right? I, I, my response is yeah. the left and the right both point to each other's studies and so say they're, saying wrong. they're wrong. Absolutely, and a thousand percent, I could say like the left and the right. And I don't even. I know it sounds crazy because like the way I look and the way I talk. But like I don't even say if I'm on the left or right technically because I'm a teacher. And I don't think I should bring a political opinion to the classroom since I'm a media figure. I don't think I should disseminate that information. But with that said, right, like that idea of like. Okay, well, it's tricky. Okay, personal example. But, but, but yeah. if, if, if the only data we have shows distance rates to be this high, okay. there is that's not the only data we have. We have plenty of data that talks about how the actual detransition rates are 1%. You're referring to some people that were experimenting with their gender, and then they decided that it wasn't for them, conflating that with people that are actually on track to getting some kind of hormone therapy, which is not true. You're objectively wrong about the way that you're, you're, you're displaying this information. So There is no medical or scientific argument for transitioning minors. Okay, hear me out. Yes, there is. You're just wrong about your ability to interpret data. Hear me out. Okay, here's here's a question, and I'll ask both of you this, right? Because as you know, right outside of San Francisco, very uh, progressive family, despite, of course, having the social pressures of society, I did not start dance until the fourth grade because I thought dancing was for girls, and I didn't want to do something that was for girls. I did every single sport. I tried to be a boy so hard, right? And I, and, you know, I had two moms, and I got my nails painted, and I went to preschool, and oh, you're not allowed to wear pink nails, and I got them taken off, right? I can't wear nail polish anymore, mom. But here's the deal. I did have progressive parents. I did start growing facial hair when I was like 12, right? And that did not work for me. It did not work. I don't identify as trans. I identify as non-binary. Facial hair, you look great, by the way. Facial hair did not work for me. It did not work to the point where I could not shave. Like, and I know that sounds weird, but that idea of not only was facial hair wrong, but needing to deal with facial hair was inherently problematic. My mom had to shave for me. Yes, I just said that on a live podcast. You said you had two moms? I did. They were separated, right? And that's actually, and yeah, really good question that we can go into there because then a lot of people are like, well, I can't wait for Tim Pool to make it seem like that Desmond was indoctrinated because they had two moms. They indoctrinated you. No, they didn't. Um, but like, here's the deal. That idea of hear me out. One actually had to shave for me because I was so against, I was so against shaving. And did I get laser hair removal on my face at the age of like 15, 16, a thousand percent. And did that make high school and college a lot easier for me? A thousand percent. And that's a medical intervention that I did at a very young age, but it worked for me. And I actually, and in a way it supports both of our arguments. Well, right? I don't think removing, yeah. removing hair is comparable to sterilization. It, well, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're not talking about people that are sterilized. You're making things up. So. Absolutely. Right. Um, but in a way, it's part of it is, but at the same time, not to the extremity. And I will respect that actual analysis that you just gave, right? But that idea of like, but it's crazy, right? It's crazy to me, like to kind of go back off that, like, oh, we well, had two moms, right? That idea of like, oh, people think that I was somehow indoctrinated by LGBTQ, that I was indoctrinated by, you know, my moms, but I was indoctrinated by the Bay Area. It's not the case. If anything, if you talk to any queer or trans person other than the people that desist, you gotta remember those. This is the problem that like uh, Tim is so vague in like some of the studies that he promotes and he just says them confidently, even though he's wrong. And then like people like Desmond that are like good natured are like, oh, you must be telling some kind of truth. It's like, no, he's not, you know, um, you should push back against people. That. But a, the, a majority of us, we fought against feeling this way and acting this way for a very long time. Like we didn't just go like, oh, you know, it'd be kind of fun to wear pink eyeshadow every day. That seems like a good idea. But that's, yeah. that's a social choice. That is a social choice. Yeah. I mean, you don't but have to a, wear makeup. Right. But right. But it's a social choice that I had the right to make. Right. And and do we take that right away from kids? If if your son comes to you one day after, you know, getting one of these books being like, oh, mom, I want to try out eyeshadow. I think it'd be kind of interesting to experiment with that. My guess is you'd get, would, would there be a little bit of pushback from you there? And if so, why? I think, I mean, I, I think, I mean, for me. Could you wear the eyeshadow? No, I'm like, <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I really think with regards to these topics, with regards to all of this, um, we, have a, we have a situation where I do think there's um, a variety of conflicting worldviews, mm -hmm. but I don't think that comparing, I mean, for my part, I don't think there's any comparison of, uh, you know, facial hair removal to, I mean, I had only learned really probably a, maybe not even a year ago that the medications that are referred to as puberty blockers are oftentimes prostate cancer drugs. I didn't know that. Or used to chemically castrate sex offenders. Right. Okay. I mean, that's because it it has an impact on your hormones. That doesn't matter. The drugs don't like there's no morality behind the drugs. They serve a particular purpose. So like, yeah, that drug might be used for somebody so that they chemically castrate the sex offender. OK, or stop your puberty like metformin is a drug that can be used to treat diabetes or help fertility like for women. Does that mean I'm a woman now for being on metformin? <laughs> Does that make my wife diabetic because she's because uh, she like, no. It's, there's multiple treatments to different things. Um, it's, not, it's like it's just such a stupid argument. It's a it's a purely emotional argument. Oh, this drug can be used for multiple things. Okay, so what? Well, I don't like one of the people that would use it, so it must be bad. Why? I don't I don't understand. I mean, I understand why you don't like uh, sex offenders, but like that, it doesn't mean the drug isn't effective. Like apparently Viagra 
can is obviously used for you know your wiener, but it can also be used to like increase blood flow in your heart. My understanding is something along those lines. I remember talking to my mother about it. How like they're they had a, they're, there was a newborn baby in like that she knew. She didn't know the baby. She knew the pre- and they needed like a low dose of Viagra or something because it would help the heart in some capacity. And it was hard for them to get. And it's like that doesn't mean that you're trying to get your baby fucking like an erection. They just need to have like increased blood flow. Like it's none of these these things are these are these don't matter what you're saying. I didn't know that. And not only like, that, but the surgeries. So the surgeries. Wait, my Advil will help my headache and and it'll help my 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 arm stop hurting as much. Oh fuck. Like okay. Like a, like a double mastectomy or some of these various surgeries have serious, serious consequences. Sure. Um, and, and I think that, you know, obviously the drugs do as well. These it are could. things that sure. are, are highly, highly concerning in regards to uh, all of the side sure. effects. And, you know, I, I think medicine. Um, yeah, that's why, like, when you go for it, you need to make sure that you, the people who get these different they, uh, treatments are well informed. That's what I'd say. It really makes me wonder why. Why would they be doing it? But also, you know, just the overall. Because overall, because statistically doing it is the right way to go you owe every single treatment method that you're ever going to do is going to have a pro and con to it it's just about it's just about like figuring out if the pro like if the the pro is worth the con that's it like it's not like this huge hot take um Okay. We're all health factor. You know, there was a whole movement that probably still exists where where people were saying that people shouldn't have the right to um, have their child, uh, their male child circumcised. And and that was because, again, it was a medical intervention. And and now today we're in this other place where, you know, a double mastectomy could be given to. A yeah, but we still have those things done. So if anything, that supports the trans argument, because I'm fine. A 15 year old or a young child. How often does that happen, though? Right. And then to conflate. Right. And again, nothing against because I actually am adoring this conversation. But to conflate the idea of like there being this like assault on parental rights with that like couple mastectomies that have happened right like it just doesn't let's take a look also it's not like the, it's not like the, they're against like you the problem is is that there's conserved like in states you can get like a breast imp uh breast implants at like 16 years old and so it's like are you what are you really complaining about why are you only complaining when it comes to trans people but you're not going to complain when it comes to cisgender people also getting a similar treatment like i don't like i don't understand either and they'll say no no we don't support that either but then if I said, well, what if one of the girls had like a proportionally small breast, one was like a, a, B, uh, like a C cup and the other one was an A cup and they had like a massive amount of distress associated with it. And, and then you might you'd be like, oh, well, that makes sense. Like, that, OK, so like there's clearly more room for exploration here. Like I would love to see because I just I think we're we're thinking there's like an assault on children that just isn't real. Right. Like, let's see. Top surgeries. We got that. That's, these are really, these, that's <laughs> it. I mean, come on. That's. Uh, what is this? Top surgery. U.S. patients 37 undergo a mastectomy with a prior gender dysphoria diagnosis. Okay. Uh, how many of those people didn't like it? I mean, like 13 to 17 is, is wide. I think 13 is too young. How many were 13? I need to know a little bit more context. Like, I could see 16 or 17 being fine. 13 seems a bit young for me. Um, but okay. Like, we're not even at a thousand. That's but, not a lot of people. But you, under, you understand yeah. the issue is when right. so, someone sees one photo of a teenage girl getting yeah. a double mastectomy right. and we say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that. Yeah. The immediate response to the left is, oh, it doesn't matter at all. Okay. Well, so, so I, you want me to go? That's not really the response. The response, the people, so like, it's interesting how reasonable conservatives are to him, especially considering he's been mispresenting mispre uh, almost every piece of data ever. Um, it's like, that's not what's happening. They're pointing and going, oh my God, this is everything like you're doing right now. Um, that's what it's coming down to. Like, yeah, of course, there are some people on both sides, of course, that are going to go like insane, like insane defense wise for their just because they're, they're the tribalism. But it's happening on both sides. I, I want to say something yeah. to that, because I think there's often this and, and, and this was mentioned right. with the sports. It's just so small. It's just so small. But often it is those things that are small that are just simply a beginning. And I also think that, that for slope. those however many people yeah. for, for those people, I, I can't just look at that and go, that's just small. I. Well, it is, but like my question is, is did it work? Ten years down the line, are they still happy with their surgery? That's what I care more about, right? Because we're gonna have to, we have to wait, unfortunately, to get to that point before we would be able to know. But if they're fine, like I don't think, like, okay, I guess it worked. They got it right. They properly diagnosed their gender dysphoria. I, I I value each and every one of them, and I I think it's worth noting and looking at. This is why you know when somebody detransitions, I think those people need to be supported. I want a percentage of those two hundred eighty-two people that re regret it. I want I will come. We will be back in ten years to look at that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, twenty-one, and see what percent kind of 
right? Now, hormone therapy, that's a whole other story because there's a lot of medical interventions there. But with the, like, double mastectomy idea, like, do you, thousands, right? I'll go out and say it, which, of course, gets a whole bunch of people, like, totally pissed at me. Should you wait for a double mastectomy until you're an adult, in my opinion? Yeah, you should. Yeah, I said it, and I'm gay. Oh, my God. Right? But, right? There Sorry, are circumstances where it seems to have a positive outlook. I don't think hormone blockers are as terrible as people make it out to be. I think that we need to leave it to the endocrinologist. I just, I don't yeah, think we should I mean, I generally I have doctors have come out and said that it is a positive intervention. I wouldn't be supporting it if doctors have not been like consistently. We have seen positive results. I just want to get a little. uh... Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Like, it's uncomfortable. But like, if the doctors are saying that this seems to be working well with all the evidence that we've gathered and most of the people are happy with it, then I'm like, okay, you know, I mean, then the question is, like, let's say a thousand people get this uh, operation and like, you know, 10 of them after 10 years are like upset about it. It's like, okay. That sucks, and we should figure out how to make sure those ten don't get misdiagnosed. But at the end of the day, we help nine hundred ninety people out, you know. And so it's like, okay, I think we, I think we did the right thing. You know what I mean? Like you're never gonna, unfortunately, get a hundred percent of it, you know. So, communists here and say, I don't trust the massive multinational corporate medicine industry in the United States at all. That's fair. So then why aren't you criticizing it outside of just trans people? You only seem to criticize the this when it comes to trans people. Where's your health care? Like, why aren't you focused on, like, supporting health care? Why is it always when it's the trans conversation that we're all of a sudden concerned about, like, medical issues? Uh, but it's only when it comes to trans people. You don't give a fuck when it comes to, like, anything else. What about people who just, like, have diabetes or, like, are, are, pay, are paying ridiculous amounts of money for cancer pay, uh, treatment? How come you don't have whole entire shows and episodes devoted to that? Why is it only when it comes to trans people that you're all of a sudden you're offended about the, the uh, medical system? Like, why? It, it's because you don't, you're just saying that as, like, a virtue signal. Be like, no, I care about everything. But you don't. You don't have entire episodes devoted to that in the same way at any capacity that you do for when it comes to, like, trans people. So doctors who come out and say, yes, the insurance companies are paying us insert treatment. I'm like, I don't trust these people. Uh, well, so, and I, I, I want to say too, I mean, there's there's been real issues in the US of medical malpractice. Every job field has corruption. Every job field has compromise. And I think too, it can be easy for people, you know, um, we're not getting into to different politics, but it can be easy for people to follow either what they're told to do right. or what their money coming in is telling that them they have to do. But medical malpractice against minority populations that are at risk for being discriminated against, not in favor of, right? That idea of if you look at the medical malpractices that have been perpetuated by big pharma and multiple situations, they're always against against minority populations. It's always against the black communities or the queer communities. Which is what we're arguing. No, for this one, we're arguing these people. Okay, so, and which is so, and that is, I think, the thing that we're missing that, like, I think is, like, the most nuanced thing about this conversation is in the end, even though there's, like, opposing views, we actually, everyone in this room cares about those 4,231 people, right? We just care about them in different ways and we think that, um, we think that we know what's best for them and that's tricky, right? Because who really knows best for those 282 double mastectomy? Probably the person, their doctor, and the parents would know best. That's all going to depend on how, like, good the parents are, so kind of individuals who really knows best for those 4,200 can't see that last number well, look, well, they're, they're a child suffering from anorexia we don't affirm right Why? right right because that would kill the child but a child suffering from gender dysphoria we affirm because that is the treatment i i hate this idea oh. of like well we don't we don't it's you don't understand how mental health works we don't treat mental health based on affirmation we treat it based on the best way for a person to succeed in society when you have somebody that's anorexic affirming by your logic means you don't give them food and they die when you have a trans person that does gender dysphoria affirming them increases the fact that decreases the chance they're going to live because they're going to reduce their suicidal ideations like you're just you're like it's such a weak argument it's pathetic and it's so boring to hear the same dumb, like, give me a better argument. Like, oh, well, we don't know. That doesn't, you're not saying any words. Like, you're just showing me that you have no fucking clue what you're talking about. It's just like a boring thing that you're saying. You just, you're wrong in the way that we treat anything. You're just wrong. We, we based on the issue that you have, we're going to supply different treatment methods because you want to have the highest probability of success. And that's what all the data is showing us based on the way that we're operating right now. Okay, because it's actually damaging in the long run. Are damaging and like you said, and then I could see how you kind of trace that, right? Because you go, we intervene because of anorexia, <clears throat> and then we trace that. You intervene because being trans leads to a higher suicide rate, so we need to intervene to stop it from happening. But in my opinion, you don't stop a trans individual from being trans. They're just trans. Like yeah, you, you can't don't. just stop you can't, someone from being You can't just say go away and it goes away. That's not how it works. If it did, we would have been doing that already. That's what had just been the treatment method. But it's not because that's not practical or real. So trans they're going to be trans no matter well, what this, this, all i can say is when you look up the studies that we have right yeah the study that you have where it's just some kids that used to that said they were non-binary and then they're like oh no i'm not and that was it it's not the same thing as someone with fucking gender dysphoria he's such a baby it's so annoying listening to how dishonest this dude is dissonance rates are uh, greater than the majority oh, okay my God. No. so there's i just 
You, you can make the argument that you don't trust the studies, and absolutely, that's fine. There's right. a lot of studies. The studies are dis you're, you're intentionally and dishonestly using the studies. Well, no, because that's somewhat of a shallow argument, being like, well, your studies aren't right. But no, but, but, then, then how is there any response to, if we went with the higher number of 95%, you right. are effectively condemning children to high rates of suicide by affirming something they don't understand. Oh, it's so they have a dumb. 90 plus it's percent so chance of just dumb. identifying with their biological sex by, by age 14 or 15. Well, I don't, again, I'm chatty, so I want to know your opinion. But then I, but and, I, and, and I'll, I'll add to it, too, if the response is, Oh, it's only a few thousand people are going home with therapy. Literally, it's only a couple hundred girls. I wish, I wish Desmond like knew. The problem is, is that Desmond probably just never has dealt with this amount of dishonesty. But the answer to that question is like, bro, he's just lying. He's lying about the the data. He's he's conflating people with gender dysphoria with like people that just identify as trans. Per year, who are getting double mastectomies. You also have these D trans stories. Fifty thousand members on the D trans Reddit. And the poster are, are sad and horrifying. The poster read last night was from a 17-year-old who said that where her mother didn't protect her. So, okay, question. 17-year-old wow. trans guy or female? female? Who got a double mastectomy. And so, but, uh, sorry, so trans was a trans guy. Identifies as female. Identifies as female now. Right. So hear me out. And this is a question that I actually want to post to you guys, right? And like really consider it. I feel like your concerns are valid. And I think that they come from good places. And I think that basically what I've read about this. No, also, I think that the woman is concerns are valid. I think she's honest. Uh, this Tim Pool is just a fucking like, he's just, he knows he has to know he's a fucking moron. Like at this point, like that's really what it's coming down to. So I've kind of heard about you. I feel like there's like a, a misconception. We care. We care in this room. Do you think we're making a certain person or group of people in this situation the bad guy, right? Because it's always framed, in my opinion, it's always framed in the same way. Just like how it was always, it's the black people that are going to come after the white people, so we need to separate the bathrooms. And I hear the same, they're coming after the girls, right? That's always, right? And always these trans conversations. It's always that idea of they're, they're going to try to take the girls and make them guys, and they're going to regret it. They're, the guys are going to try to go into the women's bathroom. And it always turns like the girls into this like, kind of like this this kind of victim right like this victim mentality like not mentality but this victim mindset of like we need to protect the women and the girls from the gays because they're trying to go after them and it's so ludicrous well, I, don't, I don't think that's true I think no it's no i don't think it's true for you at all but i think no, the general I, population I, is, I don't see that in any of the arguments, you the arguments don't see that. okay no it's male and female i mean you've got i see it really one-sided but i respect your opinion i mean J jazz jennings was male right uh, is male right and uh so a lot of these stories are male to female female to male i understand i that. think the data shows that the majority of trans youth are female to male and so that, that was the uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria argument. Well, argument. I, I also yeah, and that is probably has to do with the fact that like young girls are trying to distance themselves from being women because women are hypersexualized. And we're teaching like probably to, to too much of a degree, um, like almost a victim complex when it comes to that. Like instead of teaching proportion, like you need to be careful of men trying to predatorize you. It gets to like a little bit disproportionate. Uh, to this point where, um, like, uh, you know, women are so, young girls are so afraid that maybe they're trying to distance themselves from their uh, sexuality. And that makes sense to me. You know, I, I would understand that. Or their gender. Uh, it's probably what it is more than I also want to add that as far as erosion of parental rights and responsibilities, um, you know, in Washington state, we've seen where 12 uh, year olds can make these decisions um, to start these therapies without the barrier of parental permission. And California is is moving really in that direction. And then with the application of these school based health centers through the WISC model, the whole school. I mean, the idea is that like, hey, if a doctor diagnoses somebody with cancer, like, do you think that the parents should be able to stop the, them from being able to get that treatment? Like the difference between gender dysphoria and um like cancer is that cancer is very physical and gender dysphoria is very, um, it's more of a mental thing. And so it's hard to get a definitive test. And I understand that, but that's where like the fundamental logic would come from. So community of a child here, um, to so implement silly. school health clinics on school campuses where that can, I mean, there's already at least one school. Um, there was a story, I think in Fox news perhaps, but oh, that was great. recent where they were talking about, I think it was Nova high school where this was already being administered. And so the idea of, of a, automatic Fox. assumption almost that parents are not to be trusted. Yeah. I mean, a lot of CSE material, you can review it and there's a small segment that does say, talk to your parents. Sometimes there's even a, a, a you know, a section that has them go home and discuss things with their parents. But by and large, the message is talk to a trusted adult, talk to a librarian. And it, it really does. The majority of the conversation what? is this librarian. message of don't trust the librarian. parents. And so if we, yeah, if we get to a talk to a librarian, what the fuck are you talking about? What, uh, what is she saying? Okay. Interesting. Place in California. And if that spreads nationwide, as California goes, so goes the nation, then we will have an erosion of parental involvement in the decisions of healthcare needs of children. So I'll bring us to a, a uh, modern contextual story. There's a okay. man in Texas who has a son. His son, he says, is not trans. The mother says the son is trans. Okay. The she has taken the child to California. Okay, so what's the doctor said? I don't, like, you know, not to be rude. What has the doctor said about this? Uh, has the doctor said, like, hey, we have a diagnosed, we diagnosed trans. Jesus, I'm getting my ass pushed. And where she has now given gender-affirming sanctuary. What if he's wrong? What if this woman is suffering Munchausen's by proxy? What if, what if he's wrong? <laughs> like, I don't understand. Like, it's fine. Like, okay, so... <laughs> I guarantee you, if, if there's a case here, I think I know what case he's referring to. It doesn't matter which parent thinks what. If one of the parents is like they have their gender dysphoria and the other one says they don't, and then the doctor says, no, they do, you would generally go, oh, they probably have it. Now, maybe they're misdiagnosed, 
So far, 1% of people detransition that are diagnosed with gender dysphoria, not 95%, like Tim Pool keeps saying. So the question is, like, I get it, but then also, like, you're being, like, you're... What if she? What if she has fucking Munchausen spider? I mean, what? That's just so. That's just so fucking outrageous. To what if? I don't know. What if he's a fucking sociopath? Like, and you'd be like, well, that's crazy. Did he even say that? Yeah, well, you're being crazy by saying. What if she does? She probably doesn't. Maybe she does. Maybe he's also a fucking lunatic. Maybe he has like fucking bipolar. Maybe he's a. I don't know. Maybe he's like a, a thousand different things. Like, maybe he's schizophrenic. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, it's just outrageous. To be like, well, what if somebody has this insane fucking mental disorder? And that's why they want their kid to transition. Like, what if their kid's just fucking trans, bro? Like, what, what if that's it? The father is right. The obvious answer is non-intervention for the safety of the child. However, what's happening is the courts are going the other direction. If desistance rates are 60 to 95% and the mother has taken the child to California and the child does so undergo transition, dumb. there is a greater than chance percentage that child will suffer because of it. But the child the law protects her. Is, okay, but here's where I feel like, in my opinion, and this is like a, a bold claim because you are well-read and well-studied. But No, I, he's not. This is a fucking problem. Desmond did not come prepared for this conversation. Holy shit. I do question if you're misinterpreting these these studies because the child is trans so they're already at we don't know that no, but we do well they're probably trans if they got like there's a higher chance that they are they do, are, do have gender dysphoria if they've gone to a therapist than not i agree there's probably some therapists that misdiagnosed but like at the end of the day it's more likely that they didn't. So. It's like, we do because the child is saying it. No, 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 no. The child is not in this circumstance. Okay, so the mom says yes. There's, a, there's no. a video. There's a video of the kid saying I don't want to do this. Oh well, then no, that's a bad idea. So it's okay. If that's actually real, then like yeah, sure, that's a bad idea. Okay. And the kids, but, the kids, five, seven, five between five. I think they started when the kid was three. No, okay, so when, boom. When, wait, so when what what interventions would they even get? They're five years old. They're not gonna get like what intervention would they get? Wait, what is he talking about? What intervention would you get at seven years old that would be medical? All you would do is socially transition. Like, what is what's the problem? I don't understand. What? I'm so confused. What what are we talking about? Jeff Young's Younger's custody battle. Um. Okay, I mean, I don't know the specifics, but there's seven. They're not even going to get an intervention. I mean, in the same way that you're going to say, well, maybe the mom's forcing this person to be trans. Well, I could also say, well, maybe the dad is forcing the kid to say that they're not trans. I'm not saying that that's what's happening. But if you're going to, if you think that there's validity to the argument that she might have fucking Munchausen's by proxy and she might be lying, then it's just as likely that the dad is, is encouraging, um, the kid to say they're not trans for his own ideological reasons. I, I don't. Why are we believing one over the other? I, I don't know. They're seven. It's not going to mean anything. When Mario, when Mario Lopez yeah. came out and said three-year-olds cannot determine their gender, he had to come out and apologize for saying that. Because in a way, gender isn't fully understood. But in that case, he didn't have to say anything. I mean, I don't think three-year-olds do understand their gender. It's not that hot of a take. Okay. We need to allow kids to like an experiment with different things, in my opinion. But that idea of I know so many circumstances where the mom is supportive of a trans kid and the dad isn't. And if the kid is saying they're trans and then that makes more sense. I feel like dads would be less supportive. They're trans and then they're already at risk. What if they're just confused? <laughs> well, um, when you confu well, good thing they're seven years old. They're not actually getting it. Well, that's the thing. If they're seven years old, um, they're not going on medical interventions. They're waiting until they're like 10, 11, 12. So hopefully they figure it out by then. What if they're not confused? I don't know. They got okay. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Going back to the makeup point. Yeah. You choose to wear makeup. This is true. Why don't you choose to wear a jester cap? Okay. Um, I find this. Is, I like this line of question. Um, I, I choose to wear makeup stupid. because this is how I'm comfortable, and I don't choose any other type of visual <laughs> kind of stimuli because this is the look that kind of represents who I am. So, if if children want to wear makeup, do we ask the question, why aren't the children choosing to dress up like bananas instead? That's a great question. I guess that it doesn't make them feel good about themselves. What's the what is the point of the question that he's asking? And. <laughs> well, the answer is fairly obvious. Well, I don't know actually because What's for me, I, if my student wants to go to school dressed up as a banana, but they don't. But they, if they want to, they can. Right. But so yeah. the so the issue is social limitation, doing. mimicry, and adaptation. Oh, okay. Now I see. Where Maybe uh, or also there might be something biological about makeup that like women like prefer to gravitate towards. There's also the factor of that too. Um, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about how like red lipstick signalizes like you know sexiness and blah blah blah, and so. There might be something more biological about using makeup as well, and that might be, or it has an association with something, sure. 
Uh, or yeah, maybe it's just because makeup is considered attractive and a banana suit is considered silly and foolish. Like, okay, there might be a level of imitation of a particular thing. But then you wouldn't make this argument against a girl who wanted to wear makeup to look beautiful or whatever either. So now, like, this is the thing. You don't believe this argument when it comes to a girl. You only believe it when it comes to a boy. What he's trying to say is that the reason the boy wants to do it is some kind of imitation. Same thing with the girl. The imitation argument's out. It doesn't matter. The only difference at this point is that one's a boy and one's a girl. That's all you have left. A child okay. Okay. behaviors they they only can typically acquire from other people. A thousand percent. So okay, there, there is creativity. I would say uh, typically you find uh, deviations around twenty percent in most things. It's funny it works with electrons. It works with people. Right. And so a child may take all of these different ideas that he's mm-hmm. seen, she's seen, and then create an amalgam of, perce- of a perception of the world, right. and then okay. from that create something unique and creative. Saying yeah. I want to dress up in a gesture's cap because it's a unique and strange thing. You can cool. you know punk rock, right. mohawks trying to be shocking. Right. But typically children are just eating dinner. Right. So okay, when so. you go to a, a, a group of children as an adult man wearing makeup, mm-hmm. you are going to be giving these kids the concept of adults wear makeup, right. men wear makeup, right. and they'll adopt those social behaviors. More likely, th- they might. Who cares? The, the, I mean, part of the adoption might be just they feel. Calm. Who cares? Like, why does it matter? I don't. Ca- who cares if the kid wears fucking makeup? Like, what's the problem with that? I don't care. Then create a new one. It's fascinating that you should bring this up because one, I like one. I've actually never had a student try makeup after seeing me. It's, it's never happened, right? Well, but you don't know where they'll be in five years. I don't. Or a year I, 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 yeah, but I don't. I don't understand. Like, what's the negative? Like, I would push them. All, like, okay, what's wrong with that? Like, would I personally want my my kid wearing makeup? Boy, kid wearing makeup? No, probably not. I wouldn't really want my kid. I don't really want a feminine boy, and that might be prejudice. And that's you know, if you don't like that, that's fine. Like, whatever. But I'm being honest. But is there anything actually wrong with it? No, there's nothing actually wrong with it. Um, so, what does it matter? But with that said, my perception that I get the imitation, the, the right that, that's going to occur, is not men should wear makeup. Not, and again, I'm using the word man because biologically male, but I do identify as non-binary, right? But the idea of not you need to wear makeup, it's it's an option, right? Yeah, and sure. I think that's what does it fair, Right? And I think that's what a lot of people have issue with. It's like you can't wear makeup around kids because you're going to indoctrinate them. That idea of like, no, kids know it is an option. Like, well, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very anti makeup. Yeah, well, I, and that's completely, and that's fine, right? Not, not for social reasons, though. Yeah, okay, I, sorry. Yeah, I think it's uh, typically petrochemicals okay. that result in negative health effects for, I got for you. people. Okay. I got you. And, uh, cool. you know, there, there's a woman that I met recently who got mercury poisoning. Right, but that doesn't, like, I get that, but you also, like, you're not. Like this is just a way for him to distance himself from the argument he just made. He just basically insinuated that boys wearing makeup is bad and girls wearing makeup is okay. And I was like, well, I'm against it in general. I was like, okay, but in this instance, you're more against it for boys, right? So, like, stop, stop tiptoeing around your argument. What the fuck? This should be dead. There we go. Oh. Poisoning. Gotcha. Being a model doing makeup. And so I see this as a social practice that has only a detriment. Doesn't really provide any positive. I'm not I'm not a fan of, of adult women get caked up in makeup. It's I got just, you. And we can say the same thing about alcohol, right? But in the end, people's oh, yeah. choices are people's choices, right? You want to wear makeup, you wear makeup. <laughs> you don't tell kids to, to, to drink, do it. Drink you don't, and you don't tell kids to wear makeup either. And that's the, and I think that's where the distinction is. And I, so, so my position is not that uh, anybody wants to That's I, true. You, you want, don't usually tell your kid to wear makeup. Usually your kid just wants to wear makeup. Yeah, sure. Wear makeup, I really, really don't care. Right. I'm not saying people sh- uh, shouldn't be allowed to wear makeup around children. Women do it too. A right. kid may identify, a male child may identify with a female child. Right. My, my position is simply there are things that have no positive benefit and only a net detriment That's right. that children will adopt, be it drinking or uh-huh. doing anything else. But I don't believe yeah, wearing makeup is nearly as bad as drinking. I'm there we go. Okay, you already got me. Hey, 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 hey. Drinking is fucking based. It has it has the positive of me feeling fucking drunk, baby. I get to not think about my failures in life. What are you talking about, Timothy? <laughs> well, and I was going to say with regards to social Im- mimicry, um, I agree with that. Um, input often equates in a way to output. Um, kids do observe. They're very observant and curious. And okay. I think what you feed tends to grow, even as we are adults. I think this is why marketing is so successful. And that's why people have huge marketing budgets, because you can convince somebody to eat that burger uh, and get sure. that vaccine. You can convince somebody. Oh, they get the vaccine, even though it objectively has helped. And, uh, you know, we had an excess death rate of like a million in three years. Yeah, that's what a bad thing to do. Huh? God, I hate, like it's so annoying. If you're like a conspiracy theorist, it doesn't like the vaccine. You're just annoying. At this point, like I was he- hesitant at first too, but like it, uh, COVID exists, people died. If nobody, if you don't know anybody that died in COVID, you're probably just like a fucking, you're just a privileged little baby. Like I don't know what to tell you. That like just doesn't under, like you live in a very nice area that doesn't have access to go. You probably have a lot of money. Um, you'd probably don't live with a bunch of people. You probably had more money to be able to do like fucking other like I don't know fucking um, the peapod or whatever bullshit. Like you're just living a fucking privileged life. I don't I don't know what to tell you. I've known multiple people who died. My uncle passed away to it. I worked. I actually had to work through COVID. A lot of people were were dying. It was not good. So. <laughs> uh, that you, was unintentional. At all. I you, apologize. That was, very, that was very judgmental of me, and it probably was on camera. Well, and I do um, apologize. But it's true. Um, and I think oh, even goodness. education, um, marketing is is tremendously involved in education. And I believe we're often getting a bait and switch. I was recently at a conference in Philadelphia. I got there a few days early. There was a big education conference going on. Most of what um, was being discussed, I got to visit with some of these wonderful people who were there. But they did say one of the primary things that they're working on is marketing to the schools, then marketing to the staff and the parents. Yeah, because they want to sell their product to the school. It doesn't necessarily make it a bad product. But that's a capitalism issue, but sure. And then um, 
that's that's the whole focus. So I think we need to be analytical of of the marketing coming. I mean, there's marketing for people to take like insulin too and shit. Like, do you, I, don't, I don't know, like what? It's not fundamentally bad because it exists, but okay. And but when you're a child, the with your developmental ages and stages that you're going through, the the input received. I think that's and I actually think we agree with regards to this because um, you know there are teachers that do want to promote. They do want to encourage exploration. I, you know, this happened to a friend okay. of mine. We heard of uh, Abigail Schreier's leaked audio story from okay. a, a training that occurred. And th that audio was shared on the Megyn Kelly show. And I think there are some that do indeed want to promote this. Um, there was a, a... What do you mean? Is there a difference between encouraging exploration versus promoting a thing? Um, okay. Teachers Union uh, YouTube video where they did this video um, <sighs> discussing... Uh, a variety of topics but one teacher said teaching is completely political in all aspects and realms everything i do is political from the books i Probably. choose and everything that i center in class and so do we have an epidemic of uh, that growing in a wait are you talking about the teacher who's talking about how things were like inherently political but she wasn't trying to make them political are you sure that the teacher was saying that like they're making an intentional political choice or because it feels like she's talking about this one lesbian teacher that was like uh, you know was being questioned because like really for no other reason that, that she was lesbian uh from what I remember, but either way, like, are they saying that like their teaching is considered political or that they're trying to politicize it? Like, that's a two different, two very different things. Oh, I thought that was education. Good. I do think that's what parents are noticing, which goes back to curriculum choices and all kinds of things. But no, no, go ahead. So sorry. No, but I'm, there's so many more teachers that are against. See, like, we are like, oh, there's this group of people that are like, there's a whole bunch of teachers that are trying to make your kids trans. There's so many more teachers that are against it. There's so many more parents that are against it. There's like, I, uh, uh, and but, the, but the Department true. of Education and the teachers unions are in favor. But my issue is, and this is not an accusation towards you individually nor you, but kind of into a general group of people that play the victim that it's and you're not the victim right these people that are like oh poor us you're making our kids trans no we're not we're the minority population and we're not and these teachers that you keep bringing up in my opinion they're not actually lgbtq right. and like if you're not they're, they're no. not that's actually the we, crazy we, one we, i we, didn't buy that book we, i didn't call buy them it. uh they're, they're called awfuls like oh god well, white and I, liberals. Okay, so, I do think there's a lot of really <laughs> just, I, I just want to say this on camera too. <laughs> i do think there's a lot of great school staff and teachers that are not doing this right and i think that we need those most of them but. voices but from the school staff that i know um especially because the teachers unions are so loud um with some of this i think they're they're intimidated to speak up and we need those voices to say hey i'm seeing well, something saying something you want to well, well, I was I'll, I'll say, like, the only thing i would say though is that the, you, know, you know who else is super loud is and i don't even like using this word because i feel like it's so out of context like that the word bigoted really bugs me now because now it's like you say anything it's like you bigoted right but like the actual dictionary definition of the word bigoted that bigoted people are also very very loud no matter what i do they're loud as hell well which right? dictionary definition are you referring to let's actually pull it up i want to see right because the principal definition is someone intolerant of another person's beliefs there or you go right so beliefs and opinions right so bigot someone intolerant of a person's belief and opinion let's go with and I, i'm allowed to say this right like uh like tiktok for example right if you check out their instagram page they say you know we want to do a pride collaboration right i do a pride collaboration teaching pride in the classroom what does it look like right and i'm like whoa teaching pride in the classroom i'm a learning specialist so like what do you mean by that right and they're like well whatever you do for pride lessons and i'm like well, this is the closest thing I do to pride lessons. And it's literally having a student draw something on the front of their binder. And it could be who they are. It could be how they feel. It could be what they like to do. And that's pretty much as close to a pride lesson as I give. Or where I have a student draw their family and then a student draw another family that looks different. But people are calling me in. Oh, you're indoctrinated. Well, have, have you ever been to a pride event? You've been to a pride event, right? I've been, yes. I, oh, yeah, I've been to most of them, actually. Yeah. Uh, where, where, is there, you're from California. Do you typically go to like California pride? Oh, San Francisco pride all the way. Let's is go. It, is it child appropriate? That's a really great question. Have you been to San Francisco pride before? Not San Francisco. I've been to Sure. I mean, I think a lot of like the, 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 the pride festivals can be like not child appropriate. Um, and then like, that's an issue of like, don't bring your kids somewhere that it's not appropriate. Right. But that's different between pride and classroom. Like if you're going to like, obviously nobody's trying to have like, you know, there are some people that might be dressing up like dogs and shit at the pride festival, which is inappropriate for kids and like assless shops. Absolutely. That doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen in the school. Like that's doesn't mean at all. So LA, I adore San Francisco pride. Is it and appropriate for children? That is, I'll get there. Cause I have to answer your question, honestly. And I know people that work for San Francisco pride and I've gone every single year in fact my moms used to take me when i was getting oh my god indoctrinating it is different now it is very very different and in my opinion san francisco pride needs to have different sections and if you actually went to san francisco pride you would be fascinated by one of the organizations that you would actually type in which is gays against grooming which is that idea of if pride events are pride events for kids they need to have a certain level of appropriateness to them and i agree with that i agree well, with I mean, that gays against grooming is just a, this is so homophobic I mean, they just don't like trans people and they think that any drag person that exists around a trans person is homophobic or is like a predator. This is this is probably why people call Desmond a fucking centrist, um, uh, because like the, the gays against grooming is not a good group. They're not like actually concerned. They don't want any like a drag queen existing around your kid is not a big deal. As long as it's not like a sexualized event, it's fine. You're not going to fucking explode. But they sensationalize everything. Like it does. Like there was like a, a, a two drag queens reading books to kids at a park, and the parents took them there. They were both dressed appropriately. Fine. There was nothing showing. 
Gays Against Grooming showed up, a Christian organization showed up, and the Nazis showed up to all protest. And it's like, you know, I would consider why are you guys all on the same thing? And, was, and nobody spoke out against the Nazis there. None of the none of the Gays Against Grooming said anything negative for the Nazis, probably because they were afraid. And that brings up a new question is like, you know, if you're afraid to speak out against the Nazis that are supporting your ideology, but you're not afraid to speak out against the people in drag, to me it suggests that you're not actually afraid of the people in drag, but you are afraid of the Nazis. And now it's a conversation about like, oh, you know, if you're not really afraid of the people in drag, why are you so vocal against them? Right. That's the kind of where I go with that. Uh, oh, because there are certain things that occur. Yep. Right there. Right there. Like there are certain things at Pride events that are not age appropriate. for. These are not, that, that aren't even legal in many circumstances. Yeah. That are, are not, in, they're not enforced. A thousand percent. Despite the fact that uh, in West Virginia, for instance, it is overtly illegal to have child at a drag performance. Right. There's no law enforcement against it. But they well, there, it, sh it shouldn't be illegal to have a child at a drag performance. I mean that's stupid. It, a, it sh they shouldn't. It should be illegal to do a, a sexualized drag performance, but a regular one, who cares? But in public, right? And the police do literally. No, nothing. this is what's fascinating to me. Is like, and I also want to get your opinion on this too. Is like, there's this weird false equivalence that is not real. Like this to me, nope. I would not show my kids that. There's no way my future kids could not see that. My students would not be allowed to see that. Absolutely freaking not. Are how, you kidding me? How old were you when you went to your first private? Oh, I was like four. I was ten. Uh, how old are you now? I'm 29. Okay, I'm 37. So. Uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, you, you, at a younger age, went to a private yeah. event. My, my uh, mother would not let me, my mom would not, not let me go outside of our family. We had a coffee shop on, yeah. in uh, North Hallstead. Right. She told me stay inside. I wasn't allowed to go outside during Pride. And they were 10 years old. Yeah. And because they were naked men and women. Mm -hmm. They were performing overt sex acts and simulated sex acts. Yeah. And my whole life, that has always been the case. Yeah. So when that is the case for, from in my, in my life, right. basically three decades, that every Pride I've mm -hmm. ever been to is sexually explicit. Mm -hmm. When you then go to children and say, let's talk about Pride, mm. you can't have three decades uh, of sexually gosh. explicit in right. public, overtly right. illegal, and then tell children. I don't, that's, I just don't think that he's being honest at all. I'm pretty sure he's just lying. And the reason is because my wife used to go to Pride events a lot 10 years ago. And she was like, it wasn't anywhere near sexualized like it is today. And now like, it's just constantly like sexualized and like commercialized, which is the bigger thing is that people can go there. Like PETA goes there. Um, you know, it used to be more about celebrating like Stonewall. Now it's become a very sexualized event. So I don't believe that Tim Pool 20 years ago or whatever, I can't believe I didn't grab onto the thing, um, was actually experiencing this issue with pride. I just don't believe it. It's more likely that his parents were just like homophobic and they're like, don't go outside. These people are disgusting. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to believe that. And then I'm going to centralize my entire ideology around what my mommy and daddy said about gay people you know, 20 years ago. Children, right? let's, let's bring you into this. Because they're inherently correlated in your mind. They're inherently correlated in your mind. Maybe they should be, but they're not correlated in mine. Right? And I know that's crazy to think about now. It's, having this conversation. it's, it's, it's not about yeah. whether it's in my mind inherently correlated. It's yeah. that if you say, let's have you talk about pride and right. teach you about pride. And, and pride then pride events is, is, right. You are, you are, th but this, this, this is called is, grooming. But this is not pride. That is not pride. That is a pride parade. Right. right, and that's different than what pride is. Right, pride is being who you are, in so my opinion. Growing. That's being who you are, respecting everyone, understanding and people so are different. The, that's pride. What is effectively happening is whatever your intention may be. Right, you are going to a child and saying, "I would like to open this door to a world of inappropriate behaviors." No, they're not. If you do pride in school, it's obvious that it's not going to be sexually explicit. You're not opening the world up to any inappropriate behaviors. You're being disproportionate, and you're trying to play a grooming narrative. You're being a fucking baby at this point. Like, no, nobody's saying that. Teaching pride in school is not the same thing as fucking people in dog costumes dancing. You're not opening anybody up to anything. You're being disproportionate on purpose because you want you want an anti-LGBTQ like like narrative to operate on. There's no way I got hit by that. Fuck. To you right. by introducing you to this concept. Right. And that's that's why people call it grooming. Right. So the, the No, they call it grooming because everything is grooming to people because they want to make LGBTQ people seem like they're pedophiles. It's not why they call it grooming. There's no justifier for it. Nobody actually came up with that logic. That was a new argument that you came up with because you thought it supported your narrative. It's not what people believe. It's conception, I would say, with the I'm last word. I'm starting to finally understand what people are like worried about. I don't agree with it, but I fully understand the perspective. No, I never, don't. I didn't understand He's it to this extent. Just to, sorry, just to clarify before you continue. Pride, to me, I'm thinking, oh, it's pronouns. It's accepting who you are. It's being kind That's to everyone regardless. But to you. That's what most people think it is. Teaching pride is inherently teaching pride parades, which is intentionally no, teaching this, which a, is sexual. It's a dumb argument. He's not being honest. Stop believing him. Well, not necessarily. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's all under uh, the same umbrella it's with no pushback from the LGBT community. In fact, celebration of. Not gays against grooming. Gays it's, against groomers. We're very familiar. We're fans of. We're okay. friends with. There we go. So, but so this is why it's grooming. I'll break it down. Uh, I'll what's, give you an example. What's grooming? Look, traditional grooming. Okay. A man shows up. Uh, sees a traditional grooming is just teaching somebody, preparing somebody for a thing. Predatory grooming is very different. He's a teenage girl yep. at the mall with her parents. Right. He walks up and says. I work for a modeling agency. Right. Your daughter sure. is tall, is slim, mm -hmm. could be one of these Victoria's Secret mm -hmm. models. How okay. would you like to be world famous, travel the world? Take my card, look at my website. Mm -hmm. If this is right for you and you think it's good for your kid. This is uh, mostly grooming is usually like a family member, but this is like a very high, uh, I mean, this scenario is grooming, I suppose, so far. The, the, the father goes, wow, really? My daughter could be famous and be a star and be right. a model like on the TV. 
Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. two potentialities in this scenario. Yeah. A okay. legitimate modeling agent sees a okay. teenage girl who could be a wonderful model and genuinely wants her to just do Or he wants to rape her. Yeah, sure. Regular right. modeling. Maybe it's even lifestyle. Lifestyle right. is when they wear overalls and they're like right. merchandising. Sure. Or, or <laughs> he says, we're going to bring your daughter. Come on down. And the father is there with the daughter. Right? She does a normal photo shoot and it seems sure. all above board. Okay. They do this for a few weeks. Eventually, the father's like, ah, you, you, you can go. You yeah. know, we know what you're doing. I got to be at work. Right. And then, then, then the okay. guy says, we're doing swimsuit today. Mm -hmm. A month later, he says, now we're doing lingerie. Mm -hmm. A month okay. later, we're doing it. That's grooming. Right. A when, thousand percent. And something seemingly may be normal. That's not. Okay. I have to start the story over again because it's just a fucking. A man shows up. Uh, see, but so this is why it's grooming. I'll break it down. Uh, I'll give you an example of traditional grooming. Okay. A man shows up, uh, sees, a, sees a teenage girl yeah. at the mall with her parents. Okay. Okay. Teen, okay. So this could be grooming. It probably would be, right? Because you're doing lingerie and swimsuit and you're starting to get into inappropriate lines and you're normalizing inappropriate behavior, sure. Um, and then it gets to the point where he would have sex with her. You have to have, you know, you you know, the part of the grooming is, you know, molesting the child, of course. Um, sure, that could be grooming. Absolutely. Like if they go to that point. Okay. Now, first, like, just to be very clear, lingerie would always be inappropriate for a teenager to be doing modeling for. But, like, they are, like, Macy's swimsuit, like, whatever. Like, that by itself doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but, okay, but, all right, sure. <laughs> all right, so then they, apparently they do that. They're doing it to normalize, like, more sexualized behavior. And then they rape the kid. Okay, cool. That's what they sense. do this for a few weeks. Eventually, the father's like, ah. Okay, and then they mean the scenario. Couch and things like this. Right. Now, the issue with pride is that uh, there is no upper with the modeling world. There is a, an upper level of legitimate above board modeling right. so just so you know like the reason why that's grooming is because you have a person getting a child into a situation and isolating them so that they can molest them a general pride narrative that says like it's okay to be gay is not a isn't grooming anybody grooming is like an, a specific independent thing right like we understand that it's not just so them saying like hey it's okay to be gay what's wrong with that Right. You can be a superstar. You can be on TV. They're not trying to get you to do porn. Right. With pride, the upper level is men are performing sex acts on each other in public and, and, and defended by the LGBT. I would never say that, that that's not grooming. I, that's inappropriate. But nobody's saying kids should be there. In fact, I'd say most people say they shouldn't be there. That's why most LGBTQ people are like, yeah, kids probably shouldn't be at this part of this. That's not grooming. Like you just you described the person setting somebody up in the, uh, somebody up in a methodical way to rape a kid. Versus uh, uh, some, there are some adult teams at a gay pride festival that kids probably shouldn't go to. These are two very different things. There's no level of specific isolation, and the parent has control over every uh, every one of the actions. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, first of all, in my opinion, there's no levels of gayness, right? No, no, what, 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 I, understand, I completely understand what you're saying. Uh, what I'm saying is right. the, the, the two paths in terms of quote-unquote modeling is the deviant right. of trying to trick a child or groom them into right. prostitution right. or just being on the cover of magazine. Which is crazy, but, but yes. The most pronounced experience of pride is... For, th for 30, 37 years, I've been alive. Yeah. From the 27 years since I have witnessed these, yeah. they are overtly sexual. Yeah. North Halstead, Chicago. I'm told my whole life, love is... Okay, but that's probably not true, right? But okay. Love. I'm a little kid. My family's liberal, Democrat. Yeah. And they said, we agree with gay marriage. We agree with all of this because people are allowed to love whoever they want. Yeah. And then I said, how come the mannequins are giving each other blowjobs in, in full view of the public? Right. What does that have to do with love? Right. I'm like 10 years old and right. I'm like, it's not they, they have penis and vagina macaroni and cheese. Right. It's not about love. Right. So when you go to a child and say, I want you to, to entertain pride mm -hmm. and the public facing... Nobody thinks this. Nobody thinks that Pride in the Schools is going to be celebrating blowjobs. That's just not something anybody actually reasonable believe, reasonably believes. This is a new argument. Okay. Prominent community is overtly sexual. Mm. That's why people are calling it grooming. Got it. No, they're calling it grooming because they're uncomfortable that they think it's gross. They're having a, a, an immediate response that they think it's yucky and they don't like that because they're uncomfortable with it. They have a disgust reaction and they're like, oh, this is grooming. That's it. That's all there is. That's all it comes down to. There are significantly more people getting fucking molested by priests than there are by like fucking gay pride festivals. Now, here's the deal, right? And I let's make sure like the microphone gets it. Like LGBTQIA, we're not pedophiles. That's a pedophile. There's a difference between a pedophile and someone gay. Well, and, do, do you yeah. think these two men performing BDSM in public are pedophiles? No, because... No, probably not. They're just doing something inappropriate. It doesn't make them a pedophile. Are they doing it on children or are they just doing it on them, each other? I don't... What, what do you... What, what do we not like? What is a pedophile to you? I don't know. They're clearly gay. They are gay. They're doing something. And here's here's where and this I was so looking forward to like talking to you about because like, I've heard some of like and I wouldn't call them accusations, but like some statements made by you, right? Where that idea of like if you do this, then therefore like you're a pedophile, you're against you know da da da. But it's like they're not. They're gay. They're gay. There is unfortunately a misunderstanding though of what's appropriate to do around kids and what is not. And hear me out, like love to both of my moms, right? But again, the Pride Festival is really not kid friendly, so I don't think that they're going there to do it around kids. They're like that's a parents, you know, take don't bring your kid to this event. And there should be like a separate section for kids. But then if there was a separate section that was non-sexual for kids, 
then there would be a complaint anyway because it's not about that. The main, the primary argument that people are using against why it's grooming is because the word sexuality has the word sex in it. <gasps> oh, you're trying to teach kids sex because you want to teach about sexuality, which is just about people having sexual, like not even sexual, just like love preferences. It's not grooming. We've created a new fantasy argument here. Um, there was parts of Pride that I was not allowed to go to right, as a kid, right? Because they were not appropriate. And I think there are parts of Pride that are appropriate for kids and parts of Pride that are not appropriate for kids, right? There was a Pride event, and you're going to literally, like, destroy me on this one because you're going to be mad. You're going to be mad, too. There was a school, there was a school district Pride event that we had, and I was, like, the person for it. I was, like, the spokesperson for it. And, like, hear me out, it was a great event. It was a really great event. We had different booths, and the entire Pride event was be who you are. There was nothing sexual about it. We had an individual, um, I don't even know if I could say her name, if that's a good idea to say her name. We had an individual, she came, she told her story about, like, what it was like to transition, and I had to coach her a little bit, even though she was older than me and much more successful about you know what? You actually can't say that you were considering suicide in front of kids. You know what? You can't actually go through the medical procedure in front of kids. There is yeah, totally a way sense. to make pride child appropriate. And I respect your understanding that there are certain things that children should not see. And I understand your concern, both of your concerns. If the, but it's possible. It is, we can make pride appropriate. We if, can. If the only thing that exist, existed in modeling was prostitution. Right. That the su supermodels we all know about were are all prostitutes. All prostitutes. Then you don't let your child model, right? And the same thing. I, I love your points. Ah, right? Uh, yes. These points are garbage. They're just dumb, dishonest points that he knows are dishonest. Right? And if it was only prostitution, there's no way your child should model, ever. And if being gay yeah, no and being shit. LGBTQIA was only about sex, then there's no way you would expose that to well, kids. No, I, well, and yet, right. and yet, it's not always about sex. LGBTQIA actually isn't about sex. And I know that's ridiculous to consider, but I had this conversation with a friend the other day. LGBTQIA, gender identity, lesbian, gays, bisexuals, gender fluids, non-binary. Sex is actually a very small part of the equation. But, but my point is, pride events, I have, I have never seen a public pride event that wasn't that, that was appropriate for children i'll invite you to my next time um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm totally messing with you but, but, but okay, that's not relevant because you're trying to take the comparison and say well because pride events are inappropriate that means that when they do pride in schools they're going to be inappropriate that was your original point and you've already walked off that look i'm, I'm not saying they don't exist I say, they I, do. i've never seen one because I i'm sure there are some where they just march on the street and they have flags I wanna, yeah like i want to know something and oh gosh and i'm not gonna because uh, i was actually told by the district to not actually make it a big deal because they don't want too much media attention especially in hiring me but want to know something this was a really big topic of conversation at the Pride event, but because we were sponsored by a library, mm -hmm. right? And, and they have that in, in, in accessible uh, children can access gender queer. Uh, yeah, so here's where it got very interesting, right? Is that we got this book recommended to us by the students that were, um, right? Mm -hmm. I looked at this book and I'm like, of course, as always, I read through it and I'm like, you know what? Amazing read, amazing, amazing read. I agree. Right, great read. Conservatives it's, don't read it and they should. It's a great book, right? But with that said, have you read it? No. It's yeah. very interesting, but we have some. I don't think I can show this on camera. I've seen a lot of others, though. Right? We have some seriously graphic images, right? I mean, it, uh, I don't know if I can even show this. No, like, no. <laughs> no. But we have some like, graphic <laughs> images, right? We, we, can't, we can't show this on a freaking podcast. On that, YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. right? No, that's it. Hear me, and I will tell you the story. I supported my students getting this from parents if the parents thought that it was appropriate for them. But we, that's fair. as a group, we had a whole group meeting about this. We were actually like, we actually can't have this book at the Pride event. There are kids that are under the age of 10. Mm. Guess what happened? We did not have a book at the Pride event. We invited a library. Guess what book the library brought? They brought this. They brought the freaking book. And that's why people are calling them groomers. And that's why they're calling... That's not why the people are calling them groomers. People are calling them groomers because they want anything. They're, they've decided that they're already groomers and they're using any bit of information to operate with. Uh, like, yeah, that book's uncomfortable, but like no reasonable person would be like, oh, that's part of grooming. They would be like, oh, that's inappropriate. That's it. Like, there's like, uh, it's just inappropriate. It's not a grooming metric. Okay. Us groomers, we were a group of gay people and we were like, we can't bring this. And the library said it. But and I'm like, are you kidding me? You're making us look so bad. And it's not us. But that, we're not doing it. But that's why there's gays against groomers. That's literally. Can no, I gays against groomers exist because they're, they, they, they hate trans people. Join okay. that group. Like, literally, it's killing me. Like, it's actually, them, we they, are not, they, 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 we are not your enemy. We well, are not your enemy. Some we're, people we're, we're, we're friends with gays against groomers. Yeah, like, love we, we have their, their literature and stuff downstairs. Right. right. Because but we're not perpetuating this. We, I would give this to a student if the student won. If a student ever, if I thought a student could ever benefit from a book like this and it's a great book, I would talk to the parent about it. I would get the child perspective. I would talk to the psychiatrist about it. I would talk to the coach about it. I'm a learning specialist. I don't just give books that have very explicit material like this. It's a good book and I I would promote this book. I think it's great. But would I have it at a public event for kids under 10? Not necessarily. Was it accidentally there? Yes. Did it cause any problems? Actually, no. It didn't cause any problems. It did not cause anyone to be gay. It wasn't a problem in the end, right? But in the end, I just want to be super clear. We had a meeting about this book and we banned it as a group of gay people putting on pride in freaking the area. So, so this is the issue. The, the, the argument that all gay people, all LGBT people are groomers is yeah, not correct. It's so right. I have people because, that, yeah, that like pretend to be me online. I'm like, hi, I'm Desmond Fambrini. I'm a groomer. Want to hang out? And I'm like, this is how I had to go off Discord because there were so many freaking Desmond Fambrinis. They got that audio clip now. Like, oh my <laughs> God. But, but we're, we're, like I said, <laughs> we're friends with gays against groomers. Right. They have a subcategory mm -hmm. trans against groomers. Right. We have uh, fr uh, fa uh, fans and friends of the show who are trans. God. And the big issue is there are certain things that are not appro appropriate for children. Not. So if you come out and you're like, you know, you believe in pride and all this stuff, we're mostly like, okay, just, you know, we want to keep certain things away from kids. Right. I agree with you. If, if parents believe that this is appropriate for their children, parents have the final say. Collaboration. Do, within a certain, to, to a certain extent, right. I don't know, there's, there's a moral line. You don't want parents being like, hustler is appropriate for kids. Right. No, no, no. We intervene there and be like, you clear, clearly cross, cross the line. Right. Uh, I, what I always. There's probably more people who would think that hustler is appropriate for kids than fucking this book. 
like especially more conservative leaning people. I mean, you got people bringing their fucking the conservatives bringing their fucking kids to Hooters. I mean, the issue obviously isn't sexualization, like fundamentally. Say about this book, genderqueer. There are a lot of conservatives. There are a lot of uh, you know people critical of gender ideology. Mm-hmm. I wonder. I say, have you ever read? They go, no. And I'm like, look, you know, it's not. It takes a 20 minutes. 20 minutes. It's a graphic it's a novel. Good book. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good book. Yeah. I think it's a good book that explains uh, the problems. And what's fascinating to me is, I'm assuming you think it's a good book because of the perspective of the non-binary individual and everything. I think it's a good book because it explains the psychological torture and torment. Of I this think individual. that that oh, okay. is so such an important facet of this book. Such an important facet. Of, but- <laughs> he thinks it's. He thinks it's a good book because obviously. It, <laughs> okay. Whatever. Facet of this book, right? And I feel. All right. Wow! See, I knew this was. Well, let, but, but, I was surprised. I was like, "Oh, we actually think the book was decent." Like, and the, obviously, the takeaway from the book is, you know, for an adult to read it, is that like, "Oh, here's the struggles that are associated with, you know, whatever." And he's like, "No, I think it's great because it gets to show people how like deranged trans people are." Like, that's his perspective. It's like, wow, incredible. So he just, he's just, he's just transphobic in general. It's just a book talking about struggles people go through. It's not that big. Look, of before you yeah. accidentally agree with me, yeah, I'm not fully agreeing with you. Right? This is a book about right. a female right. who was. Uh, mercilessly abused right. by her parents, right. neglected, psychologically tormented, mm-hmm. and now is suffering from developmental disorders mm-hmm. that are being affirmed right. by modern society to the point where they think it's good children learn and, and believe these ideas are correct. <laughs> but you have a young woman who is pissing in her backyard, yeah. who was never taught to read, mm-hmm. who, who wore for three days in a row dried pads crusted with menstrual blood to the point where she smelled so bad, this is in the book, that she was made fun of by her classmates and then internalized all of that and said, the real problem is Angelina that being a girl sucks. became a member. Oh, thank you for the membership. Sorry. Oh shit! A bunch of alerts are gonna come through. Kimmy became I'm a member. Skip through. Thank you. It's a bunch of people Jose that. Luis it's a bunch became of people that. that it's just auto renewal. Oh, thank you so much, guys. The real problem was you're fun of by her classmates, and then internalized all of that and said the real problem is that being a girl sucks. The real problem was your mother and your father abused you emotionally and not with direct physical violence, but it was physical abuse. Having your ch- so I have to watch the, read the book myself to figure out the specifics of it. Um. But that doesn't matter, right? So here's the reality of the situation. If there are, like, uh, if if going through intense trauma would manifest somebody being trans, that that would still be their treatment. Like, maybe there are uh, environmental aspects that would make somebody have gender dysphoria. It doesn't take away their gender dysphoria. They still have it. That's like saying, oh, they don't really have PTSD. You just went to war. It's like, what are you supposed to do? Remove the war from life? I'll go back in time and just remove Iraq from your fucking brain. Like, I, I, it doesn't really matter. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, something might have spurred on a series of different conditions might have, you know, created this scenario, but you can't just take that away. So if somebody did have a traumatic experience that made them trans, um, if that is even the case, that doesn't mean that they're not actually trans, right? So child urinate in the yard, mm-hmm. having them wear crusted menstrual mm-hmm. pads for days. Right. This is something where child protective services is supposed to intervene and, and save this child. And the child sh- in this book, she talks about how when the other. And it's also possible that the reason that the parents did abuse again, and I don't, if he's being honest, if you don't know fucking no temple. It's also possible that the reason that these parents abused the kid was because they identified them as trans and they hated their kid. I'm not saying that's the absolute truth, but there is a correlation between uh, trauma and being, uh, you know, and being trans or being LGBTQ. That doesn't mean that the trauma creates being LGBTQ. That could also mean that being LGBTQ can make you more susceptible to being traumatized. If you're like a young gay boy, for instance, like people know you're gay, you're born gay, you're more feminine, you usually uh, identify more with girls or you gravitate more towards girls, your mom, other young boys are going to bully you because you're not as manly as them. And then like you're more open to like since you're ostracized from like a general male community or potentially that could leave you open to abuse. Your parents might hate you because they think there's something wrong with you. Like, yeah, these there's there's we don't know. I don't know enough about the situation uh, to, to be able to push back. I'd have to read the book. Girls made fun of her for not shaving her legs yeah. for smelling like feces. Right. She then said, if only I was a boy. Right. No, 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 no. It's right. not if only there was a boy. It's that your parents abuse you. Right. And so what she does then is she takes this abuse and equates it with being, being female and right. not. She doesn't want to be a man. Right. She doesn't want to be a woman. Right. One thing that I actually take personal offense to. I saw a clip from Billboard Chris where he asked a trans man, how do you know you're trans? Mm. And this biological female identifies as a man said, you know how you wake up feeling like a man? I wake up feeling like a man. No, I don't. I don't wake up feeling like a man. There is no there's no point of reference for anyone to wake up feeling like anything other than themselves. Okay. okay. But they create this idea of it is better. I mean, I imagine you do wake up feeling like a man. You just don't really have you don't really think about it because it's just very normal to you, whereas somebody with gender dysphoria might be processing that a little differently. But okay. There to be an other, an assumption of right. the feelings I have, and they want to appropriate that from me without actually understanding it in any way. Okay. So you're pretending This woman to be explains a... later on in the book that she's actually a fetishist. Right. She's a, what's called an autoandrophile. She has sexually aroused the thought of being a man. You then come to, uh, I think, what you see okay. here is, she's a teacher. 
going to children, asking these children to fulfill her sexual fantasy. Whether that's the core reason why she does it isn't the issue. What? I have to, I, I just, I can't take anything he's saying. I mean, is he right? I mean, Desmond, you have to push back if it's not correct. Um, they say that they're a fetishist and they get off to the children in some capacity? What? She does. She explicitly says she has sexually aroused the thought of being a man and then asks children to entertain that thought. That is completely inappropriate. What we have here is someone who has suffered psychological trauma, mm -hmm. who is now pushing that onto children. That is, is, is horrifying to me. Now, here's, there's so much that I want to unpack there, but I also- What the fuck are you talking about? I want to give you a chance to speak because I think you have such an amazing perspective. And that was such an interesting interpretation of the book. One that I, of course, have different viewpoints of, right? Well, then but tell us your you pushback. Know, I'm very, a huge fan of finding common ground, right? And well, oh, Desmond, I think that this is the moment where you'd want to push back because people are just going to go, oh, if you can't, if you're not actually going to push back, maybe you don't have the perspective. Maybe you don't have like a, a, a differing perspective on it that would be strong enough. Do I think that it's hugely problematic? Do I think that people are trans because of trauma? No, I don't think people are trans because of trauma. I sincerely disagree with you on that. However, well, she's not trans, she's non-binary. Well, yeah, I know. Like, she rejects, she rejects that would, feminine. That would, be, that would be considered trans, but okay. Right, um, but like the idea of like, the, the classic idea of like, oh, people are trans, people are gay um, because of trauma, right? And like now there's this movement, apologies, like just to clarify, but now we, we sometimes hear people that are non-binary going under the- It's possible that it's a factor. It doesn't matter because trauma still is part of your experience and part of your character. So even if that was a potential factor, it's not even, doesn't even speak negatively to trans people. So trans umbrella. So I just say like trans for everyone. Just want to clarify that. But with that said, even though I very much disagree with a lot of that perspective where it's like, oh, it was because of trauma and you're pushing it on kids and this is that and the other. What I do agree with is there's a conversation that needs to be had that being non-binary and being gay isn't for fun. It's actually freaking hard. Right. Sure, and it yeah. can be. And I don't necessarily do this. In fact, I don't do this for fun. I wake up and I do this to myself and I feel like this way and I talk like this and I act like this because this is what feels right for me. And I do think there's a problem. In social media, the mimicry idea that you make gay look fun and trendy and then kids hop on that bandwagon without understanding that there is discrimination that you are going to go through and that there are problems. That well, I mean, so I, I half agree. I think that like um, there can be levels of like, sure, like it's not it, it's not good to be oppressed by being gay or trans for sure. But then when you say make it look fun, it's like, well, do you want to make being gay look sad? Uh, you know what I mean? Like you want to make it look like, oh, it's cool. It's fine. Like that's so, I mean, I half agree with the message that Desmond's talking about here. That you're going to go through. But people are born the way they are. Thank you for watching opinion. both So I feel like there's this you. gray area that is never explored, which is yes, sometimes people accidentally equate being queer to being different and trendy. But on the other side, there are people that are just queer and we shouldn't just banish uh, like we shouldn't just say oh all gay people are just you know traumatized i was not traumatized i just don't i don't i, yeah. I, I don't think people are uh, i think there's a, a variety of different people who are trans for different reasons a thousand percent. i think the uh, uh, can we just like can we, why, can, what can you do to like wind that back right because like the idea of people are trans for different reasons people are non-binary for di that is I, so never talked about i think the principal Sorry. reason my, my view is probably plastic endocrine disruptors uh a lot of people talk about why is there things to a uh, plastic so it's like plastic what does that plastic mean explosion of trans youth and transgender uh, transgenderism well okay. we're like the second generation of plastic we are the second generation born of plastic products i went to an antique store oh so it's plastic so plastic is making people trans. That's f uh, okay. No, fine. Soda cans were hard metal. Knee high orange soda was a hard metal can mm -hmm. when you like crack open. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, from the fifties. And then uh, the advent of plastics and plastic products are to emerge probably around the late, the, the mid, the, in the sixties, mostly in the seventies. And then you end up with the boomer generation who are now in their late teens and twenties into the seventies, consuming products all wrapped and coated in plastic, mm -hmm. PCBs, phthalates, endocrine disruptors that we know to be endocrine disruptors, as well as other pesticides and chemicals. You then end up with the boomer generation oh consuming majority of these chemicals Dude, while they have babies. And then we're surprised to see that millennials and Gen Z have a higher rate of, of transgenderism. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only reason. But I think we. Incredible. Known for some time about uh, phthalates and PCBs, for instance, and the effect on, on babies and the, the endocrine system. Yet, for some reason, there are many people who are associated with the right who would say there are no trans kids. There's no. And I'm like, well, if we well, if, are, if, yeah. if if you go back to Alex Jones yelling to turn the freaking frogs gay. Yeah, it's been <laughs> literally ten, about to bring that up. Ten years right. of people on the right saying. Right. I maybe I don't even. I, sure. Uh, I guess. Pla okay. That there are chemicals that cause endocrine disruption in in, in life and animals. And it's <sighs> I, I mean, so, I doubt that like microplastics are having that much of an impact. But okay. The question is is then. If someone was trans and they're experiencing gender dysphoria because of endocrine disruption due to the chemicals in our food and environment, okay. how do we adequately accommodate these individuals who through no fault of their own are experiencing this? And that's a great question that I think is like so important to have. Uh, they would just be the way that they are, right? So. Have with parents, with medical staffs, with teachers, and for everyone to be included. But there are trans kids. There are non-binary kids. But that idea of like people are turning them trans on purpose. It just, it really, it hurts me a little bit, right? Because like, and it probably just because like it hurts, you know, when like, um, like just for an, for an example for you, right? That idea of like, oh my God, I can't believe you didn't tell me something happened to my kid. It's your literal job to protect them. You care about the most. And it's like kind of a slap in the face, right? At least that's the perspective that I would think that you have, right? Like someone, ins someone insults your kid or your kid is says that they're a girl or a boy or whatever. And they, you don't tell me I'm their freaking parent. What do you mean you're not telling me? And I get that perspective, but I have the same perspective as like, a t like for, as a teacher, right? That a teacher that wears makeup that's non-binary, that idea of like, I make myself a public figure. I'm live scanned by the state of California. Every move that I do is watched, right? And I- Guess what guys? 
I'm gay. What, make a I'm video? Gay. I put on some eyeshadow and you're like, you are indoctrinating my kid. That's such a slap in the face to me and my community. Like, I went to school for freaking 25 years. I went to grad school to make sure that I could teach your kid to read the best that they could ever read. I went to school to make sure that your kid has an individualized education program that no one else has. Because I do custom products for each kid. And you're saying I'm grooming them because I'm wearing lipstick? Like, that's such a slap in the face to me. You know, you know what I do find really funny is um, the guests we've had on the show who are not LGBT, but yeah. are like affluent, affluent white liberals, right. tend to adamantly defend books like this. Uh, tend to adamantly defend this book is be, be, uh, gay being given to children. I mean, be uh, listen, I, I, I know I'm orbiting here. I remember Destiny going on there and he was like, oh yeah, this sounds inappropriate, but it's probably not grooming. It's probably done well-intentioned. Um, It's just that it goes too far. So it, he, I don't I don't know how, maybe, I mean, there's probably other people he's talked to this book about. It seems to be like a really fun book to him, but I doubt all of them are defending it adamantly. He censored. And then whenever we have actual LGBT people, they say, I agree, this stuff's inappropriate. And so it's very interesting that when it comes to issues of race and gender, it yeah. tends to be affluent white liberals yes. who are not members of this community. Which, so, uh, and they're trying their best yeah. to support. I want you to think I, don't, about I don't know if that's, I think they're well, trying their best to get clicks on the internet. Well, it's, they're, you know, they're, uh, they're trying to, you, so, okay, I'll tell you a story. It's better not go viral, I swear, I swear to God. Um, but I, you know, I feel like people try to be accepting and sometimes there's a misstep and it ends up causing a media, like, corruption, true. right? So I walk uh, into a school, they hire me. Um, they have a couple students that have a very specific, you know, ADHD diagnosis combined with dyslexia. So very, very tricky to read, right? They bring me in, they hire me. I walk into the school and I go, you know, oh, by the way, can you show me where your bathroom is? And they're like, this one right there. <laughs> into the girl's bathroom. Oh, wow. And I'm like, oh, like the bathroom, like for adults. Because I don't want to be like, oh, I'm just, I just, I'm non-binary, I wear makeup, but I use the guy's bathroom, right? But they're like, it's right there. And like, like, they pointed to the women's bathroom. They pointed to the girl's bathroom. There's like an eight-year-old girl who just goes in there, yeah. right? And I'm like, and I want to be polite. I'm like, oh, no, the bathroom for, for adults. And they're like, oh, that one's on the other side of the campus. You could just use that one. And I got where they were coming from because they were like, oh, you know, she probably. I mean, I wouldn't want to use the kids bathroom either because like, I don't know, that's just like a barrier. You know, you got to make sure the kids know that you're better than them. You know, so I'm using the I'm using the grown up bathroom. I'm not using some baby piss potty. Uh, the microplastic issue is a real thing. I've even affected me because I see cursed me to have the dog. Oh, so that, that's why you have that dog in you. That's the microplastics, gotcha. Probably identifies as a woman and she wants to be included. Um, first of all, I think the bathroom topic is just nonsense. I just think that there should be separate adult and children bathrooms in the first place and that would solve the problem. But that idea of like people are trying their best uh, to accommodate, sure. but sometimes you try to accommodate a little bit too much and not everyone has- That's what they do. Yeah, not, not, sometimes you try to accommodate too much and some people like me are, I have to be on my guard all the time, right? So I, bro, I'm like, I'll go to the one across, I, I've walked the entire school, but like they're trying to help. They're trying to help, but it's accidentally misinterpreted. And then what if I said yes? And there was a picture taken. Oh my gosh, you know, trans teacher goes into a child's bathroom with an eight-year-old. Then there's going to be a freaking news story on it that's going to be talked about on this podcast. And you see how quickly things tumble, right? And that's why. True, it would be talked about on that podcast because it pulls a dishonest piece of shit. Yeah. Let's let's, let's uh, <laughs> yeah. we spent a lot of time talking about gender. We haven't talked about the critical race theory stuff that's in schools. Very interesting. And I, I think just, yeah, I think that's a, an important uh, component. Like burning out on this whole fucking thing, this whole conversation. Funded as well, obviously, because Holy what we shit. find is there's this really hilarious study a few years ago. Um, two of them actually, I'll cite. One was okay. White liberals are the only demographic with an outgroup preference. So what black people mean? tend to prefer to be around black people, but it's, it's small margins, surprisingly. Yeah. It's like 18%. Okay. Yeah. So it's like slim minority. But you see sure. that, you know, black people prefer to be around black people, Latinos around Latinos. White conservatives prefer to be around white conservatives. Asians prefer to be around Asians. And white liberals prefer not to be around white people in general. Uh, I mean, listen, I would ask, how come you exclude it? Like, I wouldn't doubt part of that, but I feel like there's something weird about that study, and it's that, like, they separated, they, they talked about black conservatives and everything, or they, they, they everybody else seemed, hold on. White liberals are the only demographic with an outgroup preference, so black people tend to prefer to be around black people. So black people tend to be around black people, fair. But it's, it's small margins, surprisingly, yeah. it's like 18%. So it's like slim minority, but you see that, you know, black people prefer to be around black people, Latinos around Latinos, white conservatives prefer to be around white conservatives, Asians prefer to be around Asians, and white liberals prefer not to be around white people in general. So like the only groups, the, why are the white groups the only ones that were politicized? How come every other group is like, oh, white people, or it's like Asians like to be around Asians, black people around black people, and then white conservative, white progressives. Like why, how come you haven't split the progressives and of every group? Because I imagine the trend is going to be the same in general like why not split that i mean uh, why 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 not i'm a little confused okay and i think this is for whatever reason uh, like whatever how, for whatever reason they're adopting this resulting in a lot of the problems that we're actually seeing in What's that, that you end up with these circumstances yeah. where what, what circumstances? white people go around calling other people racist you end up with white liberals calling larry elder a black man a white supremacist I got okay. called racist and transphobic on my TikTok page for the full year. <laughs> and that means I'm, really not, I'm, not, I'm not understanding the point that he's making here. Anyway. <laughs> he's saying white people, white liberals like to hang out with more diverse groups of people, and that makes them racist. 
I'm a little confused. Is that what he's... Am I, am I misinterpreting this? Or? Oh, but look, you... Have, for a full year, I was told that I was racist and transphobic. Like, for a year. Like, I just want to put that out there. It's like, you can't win. I mean, oh gays against groomers are called homophobic, despite the fact that they're actually gay. Well, it's, that, uh, okay. I think... And again, it's not a... You know, there's parts of the organization that I've heard that I still use, like, some... But it seems like it's a solid organization, that idea. Like, things it's are appropriate for certain things, and things are appropriate for not. But the idea of, like, I want to hear your perspective, because, hear me out, critical race theory, of course, there's, like, maybe some issues. But I was on, you know, different shows, different podcasts, different news channels. Do you worry about your kid maybe never seeing people that look different or act different, or maybe your, your kid hasn't seen someone who looks like me, right? And oh then you're gonna have, so an, they're, they're gonna have an idea. They're gonna be nervous. They're gonna be worried. They're gonna be true. And or, or they may not be. Or they may not be, right? No, our, yeah. our kids see a, a lot of diversity. Great. Okay. So, so and then well, and so you probably do a very good. Job. I kind of doubt that if you're in like a pod school, but making sure that occurs, right? But I do get worried in some homeschool situations. It's not even intentional, right? We have like just geopolitics. I kind of put like you said, different people in different areas. But I just get worried when you get to the homeschooling idea, where it's like you only have people that look a certain way, act a certain way, and it's limiting, right? I, well, I don't, I don't. And they're not saying it's intentional. Like, like I said, he's saying or Lesman is saying it's because like there's an issue with like, you know, you might live in a rich area and it might be a very white centric area because white people tend to have more money. Like it's not like a intentional necessarily. No, I've like, seen I've it seen still a, reduces that life experience. A lot of diversity in yeah. homeschooling. I mean, there were a Where, lot of families that that just chose to homeschool on their own because they thought they could provide uh, their child a, a different education. There's a lot of kids with different special needs. Right. There's all okay. I mean, all across the, the scope of things. I, I've seen, you know. A lot in homeschool. And I would say that, um, I mean, for me, the homeschool experience has has brought back, I mean, for example, I know I know this isn't talking about critical race theory, but I'd been working with our children to read uh, prior to them starting preschool and kindergarten and all of those things. I was working with them because I've collected books since I was little and I love books. Cool. Um, and, and so anyways, our daughter was making all of this progress prior to entering kindergarten. And then she gets into kindergarten and she's doing this queuing reading where she's having to kind of guess what the sentence is, which is making news right now. And I mean, I think... Um, after, you know, then we get to first grade and I even suggested to the teacher because she was bringing home some books that were, you know, as far as literacy, they were behind. Right. And I said, you know, was talking with them and stuff, but she didn't enjoy reading. She, it was, it was daunting. She didn't enjoy school. Our son wasn't enjoying school. He wasn't feeling challenged mm -hmm. enough. And, and so at any rate, I didn't know how homeschooling was going to go. I had actually told my husband mm -hmm. in December when I fail at this, <laughs> we need a plan B. We need a plan B. And it was a, it's still a shock to me how well it's gone. But what ended up happening is a couple months in, our kids were on their own reading and they were reading all different kinds of books and chapter books. And I remember looking to my husband and the kids were in the back of the car and I said, <clears throat> look, the kids are reading on their own <laughs> and, and they just loved it. And so, I mean, I feel like education, I mean, California's education has really gone downhill. Um, I Based on what? Like what metric are you using other than like I feel? I think nationwide, you know, there's just been a, a, a complete shift in, in educational topics and different things. Okay, so you think it's going downhill because you don't like that people are teaching topics about lgbtq people I, I don't like it doesn't seem like you have any like real reason or any real metric as to why you think it's getting worse you just don't like that they're teaching stuff that's not conservative like you're that's it but you're I just engaging in trans panic i okay. think the thing that gets me is if kids aren't reading if they aren't able to do math math was a challenge to me when i was when i was younger um even in college a little bit but all of these topics I, I mean, I want kids to love learning and okay. I, I can tell that from you as well. Absolutely. And I, I want kids to be able to just develop. And and I think right now, I don't know, it's it's been a, a very this is completely unintended journey for me. Yeah, I never in a million years thought I'd be doing this. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, with regards to like like California's ethnic studies um, for me, it was looking at that material and then trying to think through um, like who is France fan and wretched of the earth. Um, you know, some of the source documents, it's new for parents to hear about all the, these different critical theories. You know, the source documents that I okay. looked at, you know, it mentioned queer theory, lat crit theory, critical race, uh, critical race theory, and all of these different things. And then the content, you know, trying to look through some of the materials from the curriculum, they were teaching kids how to be an activist, um, how to develop a counter narrative to a narrative, um, all different kinds of things. And I feel like- it, That doesn't sound that bad, okay. You know, for my part, I think in some ways education has lost its way, and I kind of get the impression that we agree on quite a bit. It's very interesting. Um, oh, yeah, thousand percent. On some things, I mean, not on. She's just floundering. Like, just fucking get to the point. Like, you like you just keep going. Everything. Not on everything, whatever. but it's very interesting. But, that you um, say that. She's so inconcise. It just feels intentional. Like she knows that she wants to say something homophobic and racist as shit, but she just like can't because she knows that it's fucking homophobic and racist. So she's speaking like uh, like ah, uh, you know, she's speaking in, in roundabout. Like, I don't know if there's issues with critical race theory. From what I've seen, it just seems to be the idea like of just teaching people basically like race shit it's not that big of a deal as long as you don't teach like white people that they're bad or anybody that they're bad for the, the color of their skin i don't care um but it doesn't seem like she has any actual foundation for why she thinks it's bad other than she just doesn't like what's being taught like, you know okay. I, I i just think with with ethnic studies this idea of of the politicized part of it mm -hmm. um you know 
it's it's interesting. I wow. I initially heard ethnic studies and I thought fabulous. Yeah, and I think it's really important. well. And I, I thought we're going to be learning about all these different um, ethnicities and we're going to learn about people's cultures and all of these things. But then I saw Antonio Gramsci and I did see a reference to Karl Marx and I'm going, okay. okay. So one reference to Karl Marx just did it for you. Okay. Uh, uh, CRT is the study of how race plays a part in the making of our laws and functions. Yeah, that's fine. That sounds like a fine thing to 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 learn. I'm fine with that. As again, as long as it doesn't shame people for being any color of their skin. <laughs> That's so not what I anticipated. Right. And I think you bring up like a really interesting point. And just like, okay, here's where I think we agree. And also like where we disagree. One Carl's Mark reference is lost. She lost it. And like, I just, it's so sensitive. Yes, I think that like just the way that she speaks, it's such a weak argument. Well, I, I saw Carl Marx reference. That's all it took you is that you saw a Carl's Marx reference. Like that's it. One. It's so interesting that the, the, the bar is on the fucking floor. If CRT talks about Karl Marx, it has a slight reference to Karl Marx. All of a sudden, it's bad, it's Marxist, it's antithetical to being America. But if we had like founding fathers who are incredibly racist, all of a sudden, America's not a racist country. And it's like, okay, which one is it then? You have to like pick one. I don't think America is an inherently racist country. I think that there's racism ingrained in America, right? But... Like, you can't go, oh, there might be foundation for CRT and Marxism. Marxism, like, uh, CRT is 100% bad. So then America's 100% bad because there's a foundation of slavery and racism. Oh, no, but no, that's contextual. Like, it's a history is different. I, 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 how, how do we exist in the cognitive dissidence of these ideas? It doesn't make any sense to me. Like, we just, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It's just like people are picking and choosing what they want to believe. It's just childish. Things like gender theory critical race theory you know gender studies are all like so important because in the end i feel it critical thinking is matter. the skill that we need to teach kids to be able to think True, critically, differentiate points figure out things on their own right i feel like that is key and that's why it really hurts me when people are like we need to just ban critical race theory we need to ban gender studies no, these are the studies that are really important because you're thinking critically about societal issues however where i think a little bit of the misstep like you said happened is we started prioritizing critical thinking before we taught the fundamentals right and if you teach critical thinking what before teaching the that? fundamentals of reading math science you accidentally insert your own opinion into teaching critical thinking as an educator and that's where the misstep is in my so opinion. I think but they should I, mostly. What are you talking about? What, uh, who? What's that mean? Are you saying that they're just like deciding not to teach fundamentals like math and reading before critical race theory, or are you just saying that like there's an age appropriate time to learn this stuff? I mean, I like Desmond, but this is why people call them a centrist. Like that point doesn't even make sense to me. Like, what are you talking about? No, no, like, there's. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Is you know I mean? like, critical race theory is rooted in Marxism, quite literally. In the founding document of critical race theory, uh, Kimberly okay. Crenshaw explicitly. We could just remove those parts from it. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? Like, that's wild. We could just be like, nah, you know what? I'm good. In the same way where it seemed it's very inherent to American history. Like, black people were, what, three? Like, they weren't people when we first founded America. So, like, we were able to change that. You want to claim America's not racist? Then you also can't keep fucking virtue signaling about Marxism. Explicitly said, Karl Marx got critical theory right, but doesn't understand the racial component of the United States. So, the, so what they're doing is they're not teaching kids about uh, understanding, you know, the history of this country. For one, 1619 is, is, is mostly a fabrication. Even, uh, what, what's it, I can't remember what his name, who, who uh, wrote it said it wasn't intended to be accurate history. Uh, you end up with these ideological curriculums in math and science that create a false a false picture of what is really going on with race relations. What? what are you talking about? Indoctrinating kids into the idea of oppressed versus oppressor, which creates an antagonistic society. And then people always... You could potentially do that. I want to make sure that you don't victimize anybody or blame any but a group of person. You know, there's the, you just have to find the balance of teaching it correctly. Like, the problem is, is he's not being critical on critical race theory in a way that's like, yeah, you know what, I agree, we should teach slavery or, you know, or, you know that the different race relations in, in our history... Uh, but we should do it carefully. He's not saying that. He's just saying we shouldn't do it at all because he's finding one flaw in it. That's the biggest problem, no? Please vote to be the oppressed as opposed to the oppressor. Well, right? because the oppressed are actually the oppressor. R well, those, those, right, well but I understand your point. But, but it is. Those yeah. of victimhood today are granted special privileges. For instance, if like you are perceived what? as being like oppressed. going to jail at a higher rate? I don't understand. <laughs> like what? You get banned from social media. So the interesting thing is the victim. Uh, yeah, I guess. I, like who? You're still on social media and you're saying the same shit. I don't think that the oppressive banning is happening as much. Like, is it like, yes, you can get canceled. It's a higher chance you're going to get canceled if you have a more conservative leaning idea. You're on social media. You're fine. You have an entire very popular show. It's clearly not this huge problem that you're trying to make it seem like. But in the real world, it's better to not is not the same. But OK exerts this tremendous authority over everyone else to fall in line lest they be removed mm -hmm. from, from society. Mm -hmm. So those pretending to be oppressed are actually the oppressors. You know, you, you have the story out of the UK of the 16-year-old girl who called a cop a lesbian. Okay. She gets arrested for it. Oh, I saw those it police too. are the oppressors. A 16-year-old a, a autistic child making an off-the-cuff comment which you find offensive does not warrant the arrest of that child. But oh, well then that's just a bad police officer. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about.
the person, the police officer, they, they then claim that these officers are uh, victims of hate crimes. <laughs> no, they're an oppressive force who are targeting a child for saying something stupid. What we end up seeing in these schools is, first, I think the important thing is critical race theory as written by Camille Crenshaw is Marxism. Marxism, I think, is very, very bad in a lot of ways because it pits people against each other and creates disunity. Uh, in the schools, you end up with these really weird circumstances. We have a bunch of these books actually on our shelf outside that were given to us by uh, our, many of our guests. They do things like this. <clears throat> this, is, this is the issue with critical race theory. If you're going to go to a bunch of kids in Florida and say, let's teach about the history of slavery in the North Atlantic slave trade and give you a full view of it, for one, anybody who brings up an element of slavery that doesn't adopt the worst view of it will be attacked for bringing it up. For instance, if you bring up that many slaves worked in shops and received money, they'll say, that's probably just not true, but okay, I don't care. Say that you are downplaying what slavery was because. Well, yeah, because no slave was paid. I don't know what you're. Were, 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 sla uh, were slaves paid in shops? I mean, that's not really a downplay. Some enslaved people received small amounts of money, but this was an exception, not the rule. Oh, so what's the point of you even bringing that up? Like, oh, interesting. What's what is what do you mean when you say that? It's not just about what you're saying. What do you mean? Because if you're just saying that, like, oh, okay, like that's just an interesting factoid. But a lot of people would interpret that as like, oh, well, what's the point of what you're saying? Most of them weren't. So, like, why are you saying that? It sounds like you're trying to run defense. Um, okay. Because slavery was always the most abusive and intolerant thing. Now, slavery was bad, but it was many different things. It was very. Well, slavery is always bad. It's always abusive. It's always intolerant. It's always destructive. It's always robbing somebody of their identity or their individuality. Their autonomy. Slavery is never good in any capacity. Even indentured servitude. I've heard people say, "Well, Papa got you know indentured servitudes. It's consensual. They consensually want to be slaves. Really? Then go do that right now. Do you think that somebody poor right now should be a slave because they don't have the money to pay for stuff? Okay, you're a fucking lunatic. Nobody consensually becomes a slave. They are put into a situation where they either become a slave or they get put in jail in some capacity. So they have to become a slave. It's a choice. Hey, would you rather be dead? Would you rather die or be a slave? Oh, what a choice." Thanks for the consensual engagement. I'm shitting and coming my pants. Slavery is bad, but was it? It's like okay, fucking awesome. Very bad. <laughs> right? It's, it's 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 considered a moral failing. It was like, it was like one of the greatest moral failings of like the human population. And but still, it's it's a, is, yeah, yeah, but it does banning it. But no one's, the problem. no one's banning telling kids about slavery. In fact, I would make the argument that those who are banning discussions of slavery are actually on the left. Okay, so Why? I'll give you an example. I see your point, I see your point, but I disagree, if, but I see your point. If you have uh, someone tell the story of uh, many slaves in the South, for instance, I've been, I've been reading a lot about Civil War. Uh, when you ask someone what was a slave, imagine a slave. Mm -hmm. They're going to imagine a man in a field being mm -hmm. beaten by a plantation owner. Mm -hmm. What they're, yeah. If you then come out and say, did you know that many slaves were actually working jobs and received money for what they did? They'll... Wow, that's not true. Objectively, proportionally, that's not true at all. Right. So this is what we're saying. The, 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 the terminology, many slaves were, okay, like, let's say there's a million slaves and like five and like a thousand of them got paid. That is many proportionate to, because uh, a thousand is a high number, but that's not many proportionally, right? And I doubt it's like a million, but you get my point. The, what, this is why people think it's a defense run. He's like, well, did you know? Oh, oh, what do you think of a? Uh, uh, what do you think when you think of a slave? Oh, I think of a person getting beaten in a field. Oh, well, did you know a lot of them actually? Uh, they actually got work jobs and got paid. So you're doing a defense run. Like, well, how else do I interpret that? Like, what's the point of what you're saying? First of all, it's not true because you're misinterpreting the information. Some slaves, the vast minority, were paid in a job, and that doesn't mean that they weren't the victim of abusive circumstances. You're thinking all of a sudden because they worked that they were treated well? Like, we have workers today that aren't treated well. It doesn't even make sense what you're saying. This is why people say, call it a defense run, because it's what it is. I'll say, that's insane, you're lying, you're wrong. They dismiss the, the, but this is an important conversation about, say, Frederick Douglass, when you learn the stories of slaves who bought their freedom. They worked wow. hard, they did receive money, but they were fully controlled in every element of their life by wow. enslavement. So what's the point of what you're saying? Oh, slavery, oh, I guess it wasn't that bad. Let's bring it back. What's, what is the point of what you're saying? Like, what is the goal of what you're saying? Why, what is your, what does it mean to you that, like, some slaves brought it back? Some, some, so, like, what, what does that mean to you? Uh, it just, what does that mean? Like, what is it, what are we learning? And this is, a, like, okay, what are we learning by sensationalizing uh, something that's going on? Many slaves were paid. Not really. A minority of them were paid. What does that do for the narrative? You're just trying to say it wasn't as bad? Eh, it wasn't that bad. What? You know? Master. That's wrong. But many many of these but, individuals were working in shops because it facilitated the business of the, the white slave owner. And in some instances, not even white Native Americans and other black people had slaves too. Not the yeah, mostly white though. Okay. Majority. But uh, they would be able to receive compensation. Granted, the person who owned the slave would receive more or receive fees. It's 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 it's, it's a much broader picture. You hear stories about a teacher what does this tell us? who would bring something like this up and then get attacked and canceled by the left for it. Nobody's brought this up and got attacked and canceled for it. What's the point of what you're saying? It doesn't even make sense. Okay. But the bigger issue is we see these books. Where instead of saying, let's teach you about the history of slavery. Let's move on from that, guys. Let's move on. Free. 
It's a math book. Yeah. And the math book says, Jamal has been stopped by police 17 times this month, where Eric, and it shows a picture of a black man and a white man, Eric was only stopped once. What percentage of the stops were, you know, uh, of the young black man Jamal? Biased. Is this real or are you just making up a scenario? Like, I feel like he's just making this up. Yeah, yeah. And so what they're doing is, they're creating these math problems mm -hmm. that create an, a worldview that indoctrinates what? this oppressed versus oppressed. Somebody's making math. I, uh, show me where. Oppressor narrative. Which in a very much, all fascinating points as always, but it very much though, I do worry about uh, kind of an inherent issue where I remember. How do I look this up? up? Is this is this is not a thing that's happening in any wide form capacity. Math problems, racism. I, how do I look this up? What is he talking about? Okay. I know. I remember in first grade being taught about slavery, and one of the key things that was always said to me in slavery units was, "But you know that you know Africans actually were the ones that were selling other Africans, right?" And I felt I didn't understand it at that time. Right? That is that is that is true. That is part of it. Sure. And then it comes down to like, why are you saying that? Are you saying that it's like, oh, in if I said that, I would be saying like, yeah, you know what? It's unfortunately like it was a barbaric practice that everybody engaged in, um, and it's 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 terrible, it's brutal, and it goes really deep. Some people say that though, just so that they can think, be like, yeah, see, like it was your own fault, basically. Like they'll they'll sit here and they'll go, oh, stop blaming white people for the history of other white people, and then they'll go, but black people sold black people to slavery, so it's kind of their fault. And that's kind of the undertone of what's going on. And it's like, okay, like pick a fucking side, bro. Like Jesus Christ. Right. And now with my education, I understand, well, that they had a very different idea of what slavery was when Africa, you know, the idea of training people, we had very different, it was a very big miscommunication, right? But in the end, you were just stealing people. Slavery is bad. I really got to underline that, right? But I do get worried if you say, oh, you know, well, they were also earning wages and they were also, they could buy their freedom, this is that, the other. I do get that worried that we somewhat happen. downplay the severity of how bad slavery was. Now, is critical race theory perfect? No. Is Marx actually worth studying? Yeah, Marx is. But like, in my opinion, um, but it, it's tricky to me because. There should be an awareness that there is racial bias. There should be, right? Sure, there, yeah. And I think it's important. And I think it's tricky to kind of get everyone to understand that without putting it in curriculum consistently, right? Sure. I do want my students to know that I have encountered police officers a bit more frequently, quite more frequently than my white counterparts. Being I didn't in, know that. Well, that's actually a great question. Um, and on, so how do I know that? Uh, you know, I asked them. I don't know. Like, it's, I'm sure, like, okay, maybe. You know, a cop pulled me over once. I was like, I'm not, you're not supposed to. I'm white. Holistically, or how do I know that? Just my personal experience. Both. Great question. Uh, personal experience, right? Like, for example, I will be walking down. I don't know if you know, like, Waterworld USA, and like, right? Have... Like, I mean, it's also possible that uh, these things are a little bit more. It's usually entire areas that are predominantly black, and the reason that they're predominantly black is because they've had different things denied from them. Um, and then what happens is that they have a higher crime rate. And that, like, this is something that even in, it seemed like black uh, politicians were like, okay, over police those areas to reduce crime rate. And then it kind of like did the opposite impact. And it was like, oh, oops, we accidentally committed a systemic racism. Right. And the reason why black people live in poor areas is because of their the opportunities were denied. Right. So it's not like it, that's usually how it manifests. You know, I don't know how much, I mean, I'm sure it happens, but I'm not sure how much, like, oh, there's a bunch of black people getting arrested and, like, what they're, they're well off. Uh, maybe it does happen. But it's more of those like isolated areas. But sure, go there. And I always remember I like hated going because there was always like security everywhere. I would always be asked to show my freaking receipt, and it's so funny because my mom would always be like, "Keep your receipts," and I never understood why. And it's because I was always the one. Whenever I'd be walking around with, like a bag of candy or like a toy or whatever, the an officer was up. Do you have a receipt for that? And I, I find this always like so weird. The officer, a police officer. I don't know. I I like when I go to Walmart, I always just offer my receipt. Like, I, I don't know what you even asked me. I just walk up to them and I hand it to them. Not like, my in, friend. In the store. In the store. No, outside the store. When you leave the store. Right, right? In public. Oh, leave the store in public. Right. Or in like the water park. Do you have a receipt for that? And I, dang right, I do. And I would keep like, going my way. Right. But it was odd. It was weird to me how I would consistently be like, oh, well, you know, you need to prove this. You need to prove that. You need to prove the other. And it, it didn't happen to my white friends. And I do want my students to understand that there is a difference in kind of treatment right now how we implement that in a curriculum is very if anything good. it makes more sense to uh to, to like ask the, to, if you're if you if you see a group of like you know there's like a black guy and then like a white guy always go for the white guy first because that white guy is probably acting as a shield for the black guy because usually you see a black guy and you're more likely to arrest them so the white guy's like oh i'll hold whatever we have on us that, that might get us incriminated boom always go for the <laughs> always go for the white guy Smart, smart plays, police officers. Difficult, right? And I think this is actually where, and I'm not speaking like for you at all, but like I think in looking at like this content that I've seen from yours, I think that this is where you're accidentally misinterpreted sometimes because I think you say things like I'm against the critical race theory, I'm against this or that's against that. And you're not against teaching the ideas of it, but you're more for the idea of the individuality and individual perspective. I'm pro teaching critical race theory. I actually didn't. Okay. No, that. So that, yeah. that idea, right? I'm, I'm against uh, um, critical race uh, uh, practice. Okay. So see that, and I think that's where it's the crap. Yeah, that's the, that's what? where the differentiation, see, okay. right? No, that's where the differentiation takes place, where I think you're sometimes taking out of context where you appear and then people are like, he's trying. Oh, they're lying. Yeah, they, I know they are, right? But that idea of like, I think people don't give the other side the time of day because I think there's a way to really individually teach 
slavery, what happened, what the implications were. I even think, get ready, let's start a tussle, right? Because we're getting still along a little bit too, all right? Like, I even think there's a way to kind of implement affirmative action to the point where it is beneficial. But I, I don't think, think that there should be a point been. system. We struck that down in a previous Supreme Court case. I don't think that somebody black should inherently be looked at thinking, oh, you are always going to have a struggle that is more oh, intense in every that, circumstance. Yeah. There are certain circumstances, but not all, right? And I think that's important to teach. I think it's important to take that into consideration for college admissions. I think having a class that is more diverse is going to be inherently more beneficial, right? But I think it needs to be done very, very carefully. And maybe we did a rush job at kind of you, doing that. Yeah. You said sure. you're 51% Italian? I am. Do you have one white parent, one black parent? I do. Yes. So uh, I'm curious your experience. Like, which, which one of your parents is, is white? So oh, my... it's... it's the mom. Wait. Yeah, I think so. My mom. Wait, my mom actually passed away. That was my biological mom, but Sorry. she was white. No, thank you. For... I, uh, I fucking knew it. I knew it. I, I, I knew it. I knew it because why? Because white Italian men are too racist to date a black girl. I always, I always call it. I always call it. I'm always right about it. Always. Okay. Always. I oh, appreciate it. Um, she was she was purebred Italian. Um, hundred percent. So I'm fifty one percent Italian. She's blonde hair, blue eyed, and then my dad, who kind of out of the picture, very out of the picture. Um, That's why I love Italian men. <laughs> um, he was black, right? Which is like, of course, you kind of like, well, see, this is the problem. Like, this is that and the other. You kind of get that whole perpetuated, like, well, this is the stereotype, right? So you you yeah. grew up uh, when you grew up, you had two moms, or one mom passed away young. So one mom passed away, and I grew up. Two moms were separated. My biological mom I actually lived with for a while, and then kind of became an adult, and she passed away. But I still have my other mom in my life. But with that said, I, I assume your question to be like, well, oh, who'd you grow up with? Like, what was your family look like? Italians, right? They're very much Italians. However, my mom's made sure to also raise me with people that look like me. When I started dancing in the fifth grade, I was, you know, That's taken, cool. I was on a dance team in Oakland and I got to, you know, learn about that aspect of my culture and what that was like. And that was very important for me to have both of those kind of experiences to draw from. Also, my second mom is Japanese, right? So I also had that culture. Right? Oh my God, see, so hear, hear me out. Not only did I suck at learning Japanese, even though like I remember my grandmother speaking Japanese, not only was I not allowed to, like, not only did I suck at learning Japanese, but then the, what I was actually good at was Italian and I wasn't even allowed to speak that because Italians were not very fond and people were not very fond of Italians in San Francisco and we were immigrants. Oh. So like we were not allowed to speak Space. Italian in the family. My grandparents <laughs> wouldn't teach us. So you have, I, I know sign language, I'm fluent, but. Oh, really? <laughs> But um, but no Italian or Japanese. Sadly. The, the reason I ask is because sign language is a good thing to learn. I think. The, I come from a mixed race background. Everyone yeah. knows it's a meme. Right. My dad's a white German Irish guy. Right. My mom's a Hapa. She's right. uh, half Korean, forty uh, percent Korean, ten percent Japanese. Very we cool. learn that it's uh, through DNA testing. Yeah. And typically, when, when I tell people I'm Korean and Jap I'm, I'm part Korean, they go oh, a little bit Japanese. They go oh, because the implications historically. But uh, the reason I bring it up is okay. I grew up in this uh, uh, with these experiences of racism. We had uh, our house was attacked a couple times by uh, white supremacists or whatever you describe right. as putting they put pamphlets on our doorstep saying race mixing was wrong. the one thing that i'm uh, okay sure. wrong right. be ashamed and you know the kids are I'm, I'm only curious because he said that they only found this out because he did a dna test which makes me leads me to believe that like they he didn't know that he was like mixed race growing up or or maybe he was just talking okay maybe i i don't know I, I, whatever okay girls and things like that right. then i have his dad who is clearly not in agreement with these right. ideas, he marries a Korean woman. And uh, okay. then when he goes to work, he's, he's told that because he's white, he's privileged and not allowed to receive certain uh, standard things, right? He wanted to uh, get a promotion in you know, the fire department, they passed him up because they wanted a lower, a lower, uh, someone who got lower on, on the, on the uh, promotions test, but who happened to be an ethnic minority. Okay. So my dad, who is someone who absolutely resists the racism, is punished mm -hmm. by the system. Then I, as a child in a mixed race family okay. who's being threatened and targeted by racists, mm -hmm. suffer because of it. Right. Mostly, I, I, I'm not going like, to suffer. I mean, listen, fundamentally to affirmative action, like we've denied people opportunities for a very long time. And, um, you know, one of the ways, like, there's no perfect solution. So one of the ways that we reverse that is go like, okay, we have to have quotas. Are there going to be negatives to quotas? A thousand percent, man. It's unavoidable. It's unfortunate. But uh, overall, it's better to have a quota that says you need a certain amount of like BIPOC people in a business than not have that, especially historically, because then you won't have any BIPOC people with these jobs. That's the point, right? So it's not never going to be a perfect system. But. Relative for the most part, I, I would say, growing up in a you know like lower middle class family or upper lower class, everyone describe it, life was life. Right. It was what it was. But my, I know that my life would have been better had they not discriminated against my father, and then because they did, okay. caused uh, they basically held back a family, a mixed race family, because one family member happened to have been white. Mm. That's okay. affirmative action, and I grew up with that, and that's okay. why I uh, like firmly oppose it in the entirety. Mm. The idea that you would say. Okay. This man's white, therefore he's privileged, therefore he can't get these benefits, right. and he's actually in part of. Well, that's not what they're saying, though, right? They don't say you're white, you're privileged. They're saying we need to hit a quota because historically we've not given black people jobs. Again, is it perfect? Oh, no, of course not. But it's not like it's not saying you're white, you're privileged. It's saying like, oh, we've kind of fucked over everyone else for a while. So like, unfortunately, you know, it's just society. It does suck. But like, you know, what do you the, the alternative is to not have like really any represent any representation in the businesses. Now, you might argue like, oh, we should be able to get rid of that now because there's more representation. Maybe I don't know. It's possible. 
Uh, but it makes sense to implement affirmative action. It's just not, family, not be that, perfect. That minority family suffers because of it mm-hmm. makes literally no sense. It doesn't make sense. And I think you also, and I would even go back to like your original point, which is that idea of like, you know, on this, like on this show, right? You're right, that idea of like, well, you always have to define a word because it means different things yeah. from like different people, right. right? And one thing for me that I always seem to be running issues into on, like on social media is like people that are like, well, you can only be racist to like right, <clears throat> white people can't be racist, right? And like white people are always the oppressors and this, this, that, and the other. And yes. I gotta say, like, you know, I would I push back on that person. narrative because I think that racism looks different based on the context, right? Sure. I think there is systematic and systemic racism in America. Well, yeah, I've never, I've never heard somebody that says you can't be racist to white people that wasn't using that as a justifier to be prejudiced towards white people i've never heard somebody say it like oh you can't be racist to white people oh uh you know because of the systems that be they're saying it because they want to say something rude to white people like that's literally all it boils down to so that's why it's a dishonest narrative thing. Yeah, I think that does need to be addressed sometimes. But can racism occur on an individual level or on a more system level, like, for example, uh, a workplace environment? Mm. Yeah, a thousand percent, right? And people are always yeah, like, well, sure. no, black people can't be racist. And I go, if I hung a door on my... I think I'm very racist. This is racist to everybody else. Like, we're all... Everybody's tribalistic. You might want to say that it's because of the product of a white supremacist society that they're taught racism. I think it really just everywhere has a level of tribalism. Um, and that, like, you know... Education and that, like education and like access to other people is what changes that. Um, but like, yeah, everybody's pretty racist. So office that said no more white students. That's a black person being racist, yeah. right? So black people can be right. Black people can be racist to other people, but on on average, right? We do have one kind of group that tends to oppress the others more frequently. Now, sure. with that said, there are nuanced situations, like you said, right? Where somebody that is white, that like allegedly, like you said, I don't want to like make any assumptions, but seems to be more qualified that was passed up. And I'm, I'm sorry that occurred, right? But I do think there are situations where you can take somebody's race into consideration and say, oh, you definitely were more challenged because of this instance without without making it a point system, without saying all white people are doing this or all sure. black people experience this. I don't, I don't know. You know, they, they had the Supreme Court ruling. Harvard now says they're still going to take race into consideration for admissions, but yeah. they're going to do it by an essay basis about like write an essay about yeah. how you were oppressed or something. So they're going to find ways to get around it. Yeah. And the, the issue here is you, you can't determine whether or not someone is good, bad, smart, stupid, worthy, unworthy by their race. No, you can't. But no, you can't. of course you can't. You can determine by tests. But then also we understand that historical context matters. And like when you have an entire group of people who, you know, were <laughs> oppressed and their wall street was destroyed and everything like yeah you have a there's probably a higher there's a higher chance of you being of you having like a historical oppression if you're black than fucking white you know and it doesn't just have to be race by the way like you can be a drug addict there's a bunch of different things yeah yes right oh my god so so that means in the positive negative sense right i I don't think that Look, anybody, I have a grocery store. Right. I don't care who you are, you walk in. Right. I want, I want people on security cameras to be paying attention to what right. you're doing. Right, 100%. You can make racially profiled arguments and all that stuff all day and night. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm not going to give someone the benefit of the doubt to steal from me because they happen to be the other race. That's right. stupid. That and then a white guy comes in and robs you. Right. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah. It, but the guy at my 7 Eleven I go to always follows the black people around the store. So, <laughs> this is kind of a thing. I'm just saying, it does kind of exist sometimes. Uh, it is what it is. It goes the other way too with Harvard. Telling the, the way I always describe it is whenever someone tells me they're for affirmative action, I say, then I want you to be the one mm-hmm. to look that lower class Asian child in the face right. and tell them you will never be allowed in Harvard because you look like they look. Right. And I think you bring uh, up a very interesting point. And I also want to hear your perspective, too. Right. Okay. But that idea of it being a touchy subject. And it's very interesting because I, I still remember to this day, um, you know, I don't want to do a story time to bore anyone. But like I remember in high school, we had to actually make the arguments. Um, we did like the moot court. Did anybody do that in high school where you did the moot court in high school? Go to high school. Oh, right. There you go. <laughs> we did a moot court right where you had to pick a side and you had to argue like, OK, you're for affirmative action against affirmative action. Okay. And I remember specifically that I, I wanted to argue against it. And the reason I wanted to argue against it is when I wanted to get that perspective, because, you know, on average, I do think it should be taken into consideration. But two, I thought it was so just ambiguous how affirmative action was being played out right to the point where it actually could be accidentally promoting what you're trying to fight it right like accidentally uh, maybe, doing what you're sure. actually out to be against right unfortunately so i thought that these systems were awful and i think that i think that the point system was terrible and i think that assuming everyone black has a harder time is a problem but i do think race should be taken into consideration and i want to go to your point which is so amazingly valid which is you cannot tell if somebody is a good or bad person based on their racial background valid. however on average on average which i know is dangerous you can tell how someone has experienced life or you can tell the treatment someone has received throughout life based on their racial background i disagree I, and that's okay and i want to hear that perspective right and i want to i mean in general yeah you could you could make a general statement like if you have like 100 white people and 100 black people you would assume that the 100 black people probably had a harder life than the 100 white people because again if you look at statistics and black people are statistically like lower class and if you if you're not racist you would be you would obviously not think that has anything to do with their biology and has it has everything to do uh, with like their life experience, and since we've had a history of slavery, redlining laws, black people weren't even considered people until like 1965. Like we, we would know that it takes more than one generation to reverse these these situations. Um, so yeah, you would make that general assumption. I get that perspective, but I know that when and again, um, when I have like my black friends around me, there's a current under there's an understanding of like how <clears throat> kind of interactions with say police officers work, but, right? But, but it's an assumption, and it's it a, it's an assumption, and, and it's it, it it's 
it's, a, it's, it's average. It's and a, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even necessarily think so. I think you, you can look at New York, for instance, stop yeah. and frisk overwhelmingly right. targeted right. black neighborhoods. Right. Bloomberg was unapologetic in this. He said, well, that's where the crime is, so we're going to go and we're right. I'm like, first of all, they're doing it under the guise of violating these people's Second Amendment rights. First of all. <laughs> yeah, no, no, the, the argument is like, I think progressives and conservatives were all over the board with doing that at the start. Because they thought it made sense. Oh, there's a lot of crime here. We're going to over police, and it didn't address the actual systemic problems, and it created a bigger issue. Like, yeah, but like I think Democrats and like like left, like left and right leaning people were all for that idea, and that's like one of the aspects where you'd be like, oh, that's like a systemic racism. Like it wasn't individual racism that went after these black people. It was the system itself, right? It's just like different, different uh, like historical aspects of racism just compile onto each other. Like I doubt, like they were like, oh, let's go fuck up some. Uh, some black people. It was more like, okay, we need to get the crime down. Let's over police these areas, and it didn't help. Um, you know, it didn't address the systemic problems. Stop and first was you're not allowed to have guns. Yeah, are you kidding? Yeah, I think that's absolutely insane. That in this Democrat bastion of New York City, the police are targeting minority neighborhoods over whether or not they have guns, and they okay. say, oh, there's a lot of shootings there, so we do it. And I'm like, well, that's a problem, right? Because the Constitution says these people have a constitutional right to keep and bear arms, and you pass some law which I view as completely invalid, mm -hmm. telling people they can't. Okay. Then they go and they specifically target minority neighborhoods. That I completely understand. But there, uh, I think the bigger issue is it's mostly about poverty. Mm. And they, what, what happens is there are reasons why certain neighborhoods are impoverished historically. There, uh, and, and this includes a Racism, large portion of, uh, of uh, African American or uh, Latino. <laughs> and so what, what ends up happening is usually people like Bloomberg say it's the black neighborhood. I'm like, well, it's actually a lower income neighborhood. It is, a, yes. And again, targeting their Second Amendment right. rights. Oh. But okay, so then what would you do about it? Is my question. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, what was my experience? It, the, the cops weren't harassing black people; they're harassing all of us. Mm. And so there was this uh, cultural thing about the talk. And all of these affluent white liberals and, uh, you know, we call them awfuls, affluent white female liberals are saying like, it's so sad that like these poor black people have to get the talk from their parents. And it was a commercial where it's like a guy That's putting cool. his hands on the wheel, putting his keys in the dash, turning the radio down. And I'm like, Wait, that, that, that was not, we all got the talk. I, in my neighborhood, mm. white people, everyone's parents gave them the talk. Mm. Here's what you do when the police come around. Mm. Here's how you act around cops. Don't talk to cops. When you get pulled over, you turn the car off, you put your keys, you turn the light, dumb light on, you put your hands on the wheel. You know, uh, don't, you know, what is it like? Uh, was it like 10, 10 and three or whatever? Mm -hmm. And you roll the window down. Then when the cop walks up, you look over and you ask the officer, you know, what the issue what is. The then all of a sudden I see in the corporate press. I mean, that is like effectively what I learned as well. Yeah. And among prominent liberals, this is only a phenomenon of black people, which is fundamentally false. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a phenomenon of anybody who lives in cities who came from a poor area who had to deal with police. Then the narrative becomes black people. I don't know, man. Listen, I've dated multiple girls that have had like grandparents in the police department. And what I know is that they are insanely racist. Okay. They are insanely racist, like ridiculously racist, like to the point where they don't want end of life care from a black person or a Hispanic person because they hate them so much. Right. I have friends in the NYPD, you know, some of the older guys in there are a little more racist. You know, I think things are definitely changing, of course. But I feel like it's a little bit more than like, no, 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 it's not happening. Like, no, these motherfuckers are racist as shit. Like some of these motherfuckers, like any any grandfather cop is racist. Like they, like you just know it. They probably beat their their wives too, of course. You know, but that actually kind of comes part with the course, right? Um, some would say that they should just endure it. Um, but like, yeah, it's it's not just like ah, this is it's he's trying to make it seem like it's a fantasy thing. You know, I think it's more than just a fantasy thing, and I think that it's hard for you to say in one breath that the police officers were we're basically targeting black people and reducing their rights. And then on the other hand, say it's no, it's not just black people. And it's like, but you knew it was black people, right? So uh, I don't know. I, I, I get what he's saying. I think, I think poverty plays a huge part of it. I think it's most of it. I think if we could reverse poverty, we'd solve the problem for the most part. But I also think that race is definitely a part of it. And I think that like the poverty keeps individuals of certain races poor, uneducated and unable to help themselves in every scenario. Cause the poor people in general just get fucked. And then, like, the, the stereotype perpetuates itself. I think that's what really happens. So, <clears throat> people have to deal with this more yeah. than anyone else. And I'm like, you know, now you're creating racial animosity. Mm. Because if the real well, factor here is when it comes to affirmative action, when it comes to income, when it's. Well, you just admitted it. You're saying that black people tend to be more poor. So, of course, they're going to disproportionately have more problems with police. Because you're saying that it's about poverty. When it comes to education is not race, but it's in fact upward mobility. And, and, and like, look, Oprah Winfrey's family is going to have no problem getting to Harvard. Will Smith's family is going to have no problem getting to Harvard. True. Yeah, I heard the locals out in Appalachia. Ain't anyone I, I really just don't know. Like, does Tim Pool have any idea how to like empower the middle class in an effective way? Or is he just like, uh, like, oh, it's all poverty and then doesn't really address the problem? Going anywhere near Harvard. Now Harvard's outright saying they're going to give a net benefit to the children of these affluent, ultra wealthy celebrities and the poor people of Appalachia have no access based on race. Fair enough. All that does is create racial tension, hatred, and animosity. And it does create racial tension. And it's like you said, right? Because we can look at test scores, right? Who has the highest SAT scores? Who has the highest scores? It's not. 
it, I mean, you could look at how the race kind of is, is separated, but you top scores are from families that are 200,000 plus a year, yep. right? And they that's can buy private tutors. Yeah, private tutors, right? And a thousand percent, that's why I volunteer every Friday, right? Because a thousand percent, not to be like pompous, right? But only a specific type of person can afford my services. And we need to make sure to disseminate that service to a, a, a broader group of people, right? But with that said, I just, I, uh, it's very, very tricky because I think you bring up the point that is by far the most valid but overlooked point in affirmative action, which is money matters a lot, right? People historically, not even sure. just in America, but the poor population has always been mistreated throughout history. Always. It's just a fact, right? Yep. And affirmative action should take that into consideration. But hear me out. Hear me out, right? What if I said I was in favor of the Harvard affirmative action way that they're kind of getting around it by making an essay? And the reason I'm in favor of it, right? And this is off the cusp, but I'm not 100% saying I have this opinion yet, right? But I formulate my opinions over time. It's not like an immediate thing, right? But I'm saying, oh, I'm trying this opinion out. I'm in favor of the Harvard affirmative action essay because it takes, into, takes into consideration somebody's individual struggle with race. Will yeah, Smith's kids. Will Smith, shout out to you. You're great. You signed something for me once. Um, but <laughs> Oprah, they won't have that. Will Smith. Right? But they won't have that. What, what did he sign? A boxing glove? Like, what the fuck? That. Yeah. They will not have, if it's an individual essay, they're, or they may, or they might, they might. Right. They may. And I'm not sure I shouldn't make assumptions about people's family. They may haven't had some racial issue that I was not aware of. Right. But they may not have it to the extent that some of my friends had it growing up in Oakland. Right. And, and I had an issue with that. Right. I had an issue. And, and I do have an issue with that. So to me, Harvard policy is like, OK, we're going to do a race based essay. And you're going to talk about what kind of racial issues that you've grown up with. I would love to write that essay. I would opt to write that essay and have that considered for my Dartmouth application. Shout out to Dartmouth. Let's go big green. Um, but I would want that because I know my racial background did affect my upbringing, but in a way that was very different than my black friends. I, I I can somewhat agree. Right. Uh, only a little bit, maybe like 10%. I'll take 10. <laughs> 10, 10 is pretty good. Uh, the issue is Will Smith's kids are still going to be able to write an essay about something they perceive. They will be able to write an essay that somebody else cannot. Fair. But, but so. I'm sure that's nepotism, right? So. I don't think Harvard should take into consideration that if you're the child of uh, someone worth half a billion dollars and you once had a cop pull you over, and they're like, oh, wow, you know, we got we to take this into consideration because it's a racial component. No, I, but they're probably just going to do it because they have money and they want money and that's capitalism, baby. And I am, uh, hey, but YOLO. YOLO. I think the answer is fairly simple, and it actually does play into some of the ideas of Marx. Uh, Class-based oppression. Mm -hmm. If the idea is typically that the black community is less likely to have wealth, therefore, and that's the argument made by the left. They say, it's not an issue of race, it's an issue of poverty. Crime is not because of the black community, it's because of poverty. And you see that across the board, yeah, and then it gets sure. attributed to, the fact, to, to their race. I agree with that. So then, based on my experience, if you have an, an area that is typically it is overwhelmingly minority population, but does have white people who are poor living there as well, you then go to that neighborhood and say, we're going to give either uh, reparations or use affirmative action to lift you out of poverty based on race. What ends up happening is you get this neighborhood. Well, yeah, I know that they did like a small study of that in California, and I thought it was a bad idea. Where well, they did like a UBI, I think everybody should have access to it. Like, sure, okay. Of mixed race group, lower income, predominantly say black, but with maybe a small percentage of white people live there. And now you've just elevated all of the black population based only on their race and completely ignored the poor people living around them, well, which results in racism, so gang violence. Now you have people saying these people, like they're going to say these people. And if you went and said by class, we will give you admission. There's no, there's no real argument for that. There's no legal argument for it. Harvard can spend the money as they want to spend, mm -hmm. and they can require tuition as they want to require tuition. Then you'll end up with a neighborhood of a mixed race background, but predominantly, if, if the idea among the left is that black people are typically uh, are more likely to be impoverished because of historical racism, if you did it by class, you would be arguing to disproportionately benefit these black communities mm -hmm. while not leaving behind any poor people of any other racial background. Totally fair. So we shouldn't be having race be the predicate for for. I hundred percent your point. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was going to say, I mean, with regards to all of this, I mean, again, we, I think one of the issues that I see massively in education, not just in California, is that there is this Marxian influence and not just um, what does that mean? What does it mean? But that there's a Marxian influence. Like, what does that mean? Like, what what are you saying when you say that? Like, what's what's the specific issue that you're having or what the specific fear that you're having in this case is the affirmative action, the Marxian influence? Like what? I just want to know more than just like, yeah, we're having a Marxian influence because it's just so vague. It's just such a fucking vague thing to say. You know, like I mentioned earlier, Antonio Gramsci was mentioned in this uh, one ethnic studies. Who cares? Studies what does it matter? So what is it? How does it manifest? What is the manifestation of the problem that worries you? You just keep saying the word Marx. It is a fucking conservative virtue signal. It's the same thing as when people call you transphobic for not thinking that trans women should play fucking in sports. Like it is a virtue signal. You would like say something more. Holy shit. Was um, there was a little reference to Karl Marx. Um, in addition to a variety of others, um, Paulo Freire, and who was a Brazilian Marxist. And I think the, the concerns I have is that I am seeing a growing number of Stop some teachers Marxists. who are indeed working towards political goals, politicizing kids okay. um, into a political ideology. Um, what ideology? I think, Tell you me. Know, just Be from specific. stories I've heard. What's from, the bad part of it? Um, parents. Um, my, my, what story? My son, my daughter, my children are um, experiencing, you know, all these political discussions in class. And like, so, you know, we, we always have. We always have. We've always talked about political discussions in class. It's fucking, it's, it's cool. We talked about Hitler as a political discussion. Like, what are you talking about? These are all things that we've talked about in school, of course. Like, what what, what, what are you talking about? You're so vague. What political discussion are you so fucking offended by? I, I don't understand it. 
And in California, right now, we have the state seal of civic engagement program. It is this whole push to, to really get kids active and civically engaged, but there is a component of activism. Who cares? Why is that bad? Unless they're telling you that they can't be fucking engaged in conservative activism. Who gives a shit? Who cares if there's a push to get yet? Yeah, we should get people more active. Conservatives too. If you're a conservative kid, go fucking go, go walk around and I don't know, put beat tees on the fucking lawns of black people. You racist bitch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but if you're fucking like, go get more kids into activism. They should be more politically involved. It's part of their fucking future. There's nothing wrong with this. Like, there's nothing wrong with getting kids into activism. That's not like it's oh so scary. Why? Because your kid's gonna learn that they can fucking vote. Like, what's so scary about that? into this and then oh at the God. same time we have parents Marxism. that don't know how to go to school board meetings or feel like their their speech is being chilled um by by different things going on and so what i see it just like seems what like thing? you know the, the kids you're so vague it makes me think that like you're you're just saying some dumb shit like that's what's going on like you have some dumb perspective that you know is dumb and you don't want to say it be more specific oh we're getting kids to we're getting more kids into activism oh shit that's such a fucking bummer dude what what Kids are being taught almost in some schools, some, um, to be activists, whereas on the okay. back burner, we have the, the actual academic achievement, merit, um, a quality education, a well-rounded education has changed. You know, in California, they just passed, passed um, the new math framework, equitable math um, kind of content. And so what we're seeing is even the core subjects are transforming. Right now, um, the next generation science standards are shifting a little bit. Um, I, I heard one... What does it matter if something shifts as long as it's not bad? What is bad about the shift? ...report from Southern California where I was told that that science was, was shifting and some of the high school science topics were being diminished. And in its... That's literally evolution. Like, we, we move forward as a society and we change the way we teach things based on a level of effectiveness. What is the problem with those things? Place, the students were being encouraged to um, a debate in class, in science class, where, whereas their actual academic rigor was diminished down to almost a middle school level, but activism was heightened in order I to- just, I don't know what the fuck you're saying. You're, I feel like you're just talking. They were taught, they had a debate in science class. What kind of science class? Be, I, this is so fucking vague. For students to uh, okay. argue um, how to solve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these are just some things. Is it a political science class? Oh, they're learning science in political science class. Things that I think, you know, again, and you talked about money. There's a lot of money in education. There's a lot of big organizations funding different things. And yeah, their say is really okay. making a big influence, I think, from from what I've seen. So, um, you know, okay. I think I think kids are missing out. They really need, they, they deserve a quality so education. They deserve to, to be able to graduate high school learning to read. They should know how to read. Right. Yeah, um, probably, they probably know how. They pro I'm, I'm, they're, I'm sure that they're learning to read. I, that's probably something they learned in fucking kindergarten or whatever. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. She's so vague. I don't, I just, there's nothing to trust from her. Either she's an idiot, doesn't know how to, like, to, to, uh, present her perspective, or she's just a dishonest fucking moron. Like, I don't know. Time. So okay. if you guys, if you want to give me final Well, thoughts. I was going to say, I think you, you bring up like a really good point, right? But in the end, it's like that idea of like, well, even if your kid is the smartest in the world, they, who cares if they're not active and who cares if they're a bad person, right? But it, I would just go to that idea of like, I think that there's a fundamental part of education that needs to be addressed. And I do think that actual academic ability is very frequently not prioritized. And just like you said, for us to, take part in activism for us to push our children to activism right <clears throat> we need to make sure they have the fundamental skills first to make sure that they can think critically for themselves because if we push them into activism too soon we're just going to push them into the activism that we think is important and that's not my job as an educator i want my students Thank to you go for into that. activism i want my i want my students to go into activism they think is important and i want their skills to kind of benefit that and i do think that in the long run that is going to benefit kind of us in general and speaking to that affirmative action idea i 100 see kind of that idea and it's so funny i think it's a perfect segue it's like it's the same issue in education right that yeah. idea of like oh gosh you're just bringing up a certain group of people while leaving another behind and that's yeah. an issue right and it's so funny to have that cross comparison the only thing i would say is that inherently there's always going to be a benefit from having diversity in the classroom and in the workplace and that's a personal opinion that i don't currently have the statistics to I, back up I and you could disagree with that no, right? i don't think you even believe that I, okay so uh, here i mean i think that diversity overall can be a very good thing in a classroom or be a very good thing in anything like yeah i don't i mean like i worked with a lot of black and hispanic people like i i don't know like i could send white people i mean i saw a benefit to it you get to experience different people and learn how to deal with different people it's a life it's a life skill like generally speaking for the most part for a good amount of the white people I've ever worked with, they were more similar to me. And the black and Hispanic people I work with were very different. Were not very, but they were different from me. And so, like, it was a, an adjustment when I first started working with some black, black and Hispanic people. And then, like, you're like, oh, like, because you learn, like, slight cultural differences. Like, even if it's not, like, fucking, like, African culture, just, like, way that maybe they grow up, the way that they interpret particular information or a particular behavior that you engage in. Like, they might, like, it might be seen as disrespectful. Uh, to do a particular thing that like maybe in your culture is not and then it teaches you that as you move forward and you talk to more people in more diverse areas that like oh there's something i should be generally more um 
generally more sensitive to. Like, it's not that big of a fucking deal. Like, I, I, I could see a, a benefit of, of the diversity in there. It's just a good life still. I don't think you should force it necessarily, but there's a benefit to it. Hear me out. Hear me out. <clears throat> this is a good question, right? Oh, yeah, of course Desmond is being too charitable to Tim Pool. Desmond's a very nice person. Um, and, like, Desmond's not going to push back, especially on the first time that they're really together. I will say, fundamentally, I do think that a diverse workspace does create a m environment for productivity that is may not be the productivity of like the greatest output but you hear me out you, you, you don't think so no nope. you don't think so no nope. okay so would you hire a, an overt clan member in clan robes to come into your office you know what I, so what the f dude you're you're insane you're just an insane person oh you believe in diversity would you fucking would you invite a kkk member into your house into your fucking no you moron i just what are you talking about i wouldn't hire a fucking black panther member either like i don't know what you want me to tell you this isn't that's not diversity it's racist that's just racist. That's not the same thing. We're nobody's talking about diversity of racism. We're just talking about like a fucking black and a white person. Like it's not that big of a deal. So you know what I'm speaking for? You know what I'm speaking for? Actually, hundred percent. Your diversity. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not even my diversity, right? But like, hear me out. What? Just like reasonable diversity. This guy's he's an idiot. Oh gosh, right. And I have to say this. I have to say this. Oh, and don't be mad at me because this is me doing affirmative action. Sure. I make sure I have at least two to three students. I have at least a client list of like thirty to forty, right? I make sure I have at least three or four students that are Trump families. Like a thousand percent, I make sure of it. Because it'd be okay. weird. But, but, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm not no, but I'm just saying, like, I, I, diversity I, I, to me, having a diverse client list, having diverse friends is important. How many, but, how many clan members? No, unfortunately, not. This is my point. I would. I know what you I, mean. I would, I would. This isn't a good point. Your point is like, oh, so you wouldn't have fucking KKK not clan members that want to kill black people in your classroom? No. So though you're not really diverse, huh? Uh, incredible. I want one of these people. Right. I, I wouldn't have one of these people. Right. Like, uh, I would certainly What's, have a conversation like with them. Like, mean, like, holistic diversity. That, that, I thousand percent So, when right. people say diversity, they don't actually mean it. Yeah. What they mean it. They do mean it. They just obviously mean that only a fucking moron would think that they wanted a, a fucking KKK member or a Nazi member as part of the class. Like, you're just being an idiot. Like, this is a stupid point. He thinks it's a gotcha, but it makes him sound so stupid. Holy oh, okay, like the diversity that you find beneficial, like selective diversity. So it's it, right. diversity basically. Uh, Non-racist diversity, guys, is a good diversity. No Italians. No, <laughs> it means the people I think are worth having around. Okay, I got so you. So yeah. when everyone says we believe in diversity, like they call Black Panther diverse. Yeah. I'm like the cast was 90% black. Got you. I got you. And so you hear all these people talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. Right. Yeah, but it's a good point of the Trump right. thing. They'll right. fire a Trump supporter in two seconds. Right. They, they they talk about diversity and then they say, you know, they end up hiring disproportionate people of uh, different backgrounds I and races. You're so you're right, actually. Nobody, nobody, that... nobody wants a truly diverse. Like, no, I certainly don't. You don't. No, you I mean, we all. Yeah, no, I think Desmond does. You're just your this point is so dumb. Like, I don't even know what to fucking say. Don't want Nazis and, around. No, that was like a good no moment, it's right? Fucking Nazi. Using diversity in its actual dictionary definition, you are correct, right? It's I, personal perspective. I want a personal perspective. Think? Just like you said in your other podcast, where that idea of like, well, where do you intervene? Well, it's a, it's a moral idea, right? Do you intervene on circumcising kids or do you intervene? Um, I'm actually very smart. You don't really want true diversity. <laughs> intervene on circumc circumcising females. You want to intervene where yeah, you think. Oh. Oh yeah, it's like when you go to it's like if you go to an Applebee's and they're like, "What do you want to drink?" And I'm like, "You can give me anything." It's like, "Oh, so you would be okay with motor oil, huh? You fucking moron! You want to drink a motor fucking oil, idiot?" Like, no, I, I we we know that like I generally want to drink something that I can fucking swallow without dying. In the same way where it's like, "Oh, do you like diversity?" But yeah, it's like, "Oh, so you like fucking KKK members?" It's like, "Holy shit! How did we get here? Like, how do how did we do this? This is incredible! It's like fucking impressive how fucking more like moronic you are." Like Jesus Christ, holy fuck, Jesus Christ! Think it's a moral framework. It's a moral framework. So right. I think promoting a moral framework of diversity is important. However, everyone's moral framework is going to be different, and that's kind of up for individual. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Final yeah. thoughts. Well, we keep going. I mean, I with regards to DEI, idiot. which in our area is called Jedi Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Uh, okay, um, not only am I, <laughs> not am I only uh, noticing the educational aspect, but then there's environmental, social governance scores and uh, corporate equality index. I feel like there is this pressure. Not I feel. I see it. There is a there is a pressure for collective conformity of one mode of thought. Um, which is the acceptable mode of thought, and those who are not of that, this. What mode of thought is that? What are you talking about? I, I just like. What does that mean? You can't have KKK members. Is that not a? What do you mean? Shift from I to we are going to be on the outskirts. I mean, we see right. that on social media too. So, at any rate, I think um, it's important that we have She's that so individual vague. individuality. Oh. That's freedom. Right on. We're we're way <laughs> over, but uh, thank you both for <laughs> for hanging out. I there, appreciate talking to everyone. Is there anything you wanted to mention? Nice shout out before we wrap up. I wanted to mention and make sure you don't go over next time because holy fuck, this is dragged. Social media or something? I don't know. Desmond Fambrini on all handles and see people with different perspectives can talk to each other without yelling. <laughs> There's a little bit of yelling, but it was mostly like... It was mostly fun yelling. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm mainly on Twitter, Kelly, S-K-E. Thank you, everybody, for, yeah. for hanging out for this episode of the Culture War Podcast.